So welcome everyone. Thank you for um, uh, your contributions yesterday, if you were here yesterday, and thank you for your contributions today, if you're going to be here today. Um, I just want to just make a couple of general announcements first. I'm just going to remind you about the fire, which the people here from yesterday will already know about. So there are two fire alarms. The first one is a woman's voice um, saying they're investigating the fire. If you hear that, then that just means that you need to be alert. And then there's another one that's a man's voice that says um, something more concerning than that. And if that happens, then there's the fire exit that side and that side, and then you can get down and out that way. Um, if you are a speaker today, please make sure that you go and see the very nice AV team over there with a big long black table. At least I've been told to say a minimum of 30 minutes before your talk, please, to make sure you are properly mic'd up. Um, there's loads of mics and all sorts of cool things. It's all worked very smoothly, um, but we need to make sure you're in there in good time. Um, and uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the unconference. So that's why I'm a little late to the stage, because I was just faffing around. Well, also because I got lost on the way here, if I'm completely honest with you, but that's, you know, that's a separate thing. So unbeknownst to us, there actually is a, is a, a thing in between this room and the unconference, which is a bit of a shame. We didn't know this until this morning. So we've just been trying to sort that out. So what that means, unfortunately, is we're going to have to go down and across and up, um, which is a bit confusing. Um, so Pavel will be helping. So Pavel, can you just show yourself to people who've not seen you? Here he is. This is the unconference man. He has some unconference helpers as well. Do you want to say something? Hey. So. We have sessions for unconference throughout the day, so that's quite cool. If you don't know what unconference is, it's a side room where people can just chat about stuff and people suggested topics they want to chat about. The timetable for that is where the coffee is, so have a wee look. Uh, if you're attending, put a green sticker so the speakers know that it's it's lovely. I just made the massive trek down and up and up and down and took photos. So on the Slack, on the unconference channel, there's like a photo story of how do you get to the room. So walk around with your laptop. I tried a video, but it was so much traffic. Um, yeah, so see you there. We'll be shuttling throughout the day. Very excited. Yeah, so we're, we're, as far as possible, we're gonna, we'll have a delegation kind of to walk people across. I mean, I personally, well, I got lost on the way here, so, and I was here yesterday, so I think that shows that I probably need that service too. So the first one is at 10 a.m., uh, and it's about prediction intervals for modeling. Um, so I will certainly be going to that, and I'm guessing some of the unconference helpers will be. So if you're interested in prediction intervals for modeling, there's quite a few green stickers on it already, then we're just gonna congregate very quietly at the back because the conference will still be going on, and we'll uh, head over there then. And I'll try as far as I can to talk about what's going on in the unconference and have a delegation go across, but obviously there is, you know, there's a fair amount, so we might miss one or two sessions, so do look out for the timetable. The timetable is always also on the Slack, so if you go on the Slack and then go on the general channel, you can see the timetable. Right, okay. So we're actually gonna start a little bit early, I think, which I don't know what, um, how appropriate that is, but we may as well, then we've got built a bit of time in um, for things to go wrong later. So I'm gonna kick straight off with the next talk. Um, so we have uh, Marcus Fabiese, who's gonna talk about one of my most favorite things NHSR has ever done, uh, which is NHSR Plot the Dots. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Marcus Fabietti. I'm from Nottingham University. Hospitals Trust. Uh, today I'm going to talk about an update to the NHS Plot the Dots uh, package. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with SPC charts. Could you please raise your hands? Okay, everyone knows. <laughs> uh, so basically this is a, a very uh, introductory slide. Uh, so what do we use SPC charts for? Basically to understand variations in processes and highlight areas that have something going on. Uh, they're basically indicators that tells us if there's something uh, in the variance of, of those of those charts. Uh, there are two different types. One is common cause, that everything is behaving in a predicted manner, and the other one is special cause, that means that there's something going on in, in those parts, and that it's not a, uh, within, within factors of the original process design. So, Again, please raise your hand, those who use NHSR Plot the Dots. I imagine there's a few of you. Okay. Uh, it's a package developed by the NHSR community that allows us to make those uh, SPC charts. I recommend everyone to, to see it. Uh, it was developed by, by uh, NHS England program that allows you, you to make XMR, XMR charts, so basically uh, statistical control charts with a moving average, uh, and has a GitHub repo, so you can uh, download and make comments and participate. 
and how to install is very quite easy. If you have the remotes package, uh, you can install the latest version from GitHub. Otherwise, you can just pull from the uh, crown package. And here's a bit of an example code using the NHS data sets. Uh, it's very simple. We just fil filter the data set, and then we create an SPC chart, uh, and we can assign uh, the improvement direction, whether we're interested if the metric goes up or down, and it generates this type of charts with GGP, GGP plot. Uh, now what I wanted to talk to you today is that we made an improvement on it uh, based on Plotly, so we wanted to add something interactive to it. Uh, basically the structure of the function is exactly the same, it takes the same parameters, but now you're allowed to call the Plotly function. Uh, what this does is generate a Plotly image. Uh, what are the benefits? Uh, it's interactive, so it gives us information about the different points. We can move, we can move it around. We can scale it. We can, we can take a zoom, zoom out, reset axis, and download it as, as an image. The benefit of this is, like for example, if we have a very long time series, uh, we can inspect the areas that we're more interested about, and definitely just gives us more interactability, which people tend to like. Uh, the limitation is that it was my first time uh, interacting with this package as a developer, uh, so it does need uh, a bit of improvement of the hover tips. There's a, a issue in the GitHub for those who, uh, who want to help us improving that. And uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about the importance of the active community. Uh, so my first interaction with the package was actually using it uh, to develop on some SPC charts. And then I thought, well, you know, G we're using GGP plot. Well, how about we move it to Plotly? So I went to my line manager and said, look, this could really benefit. And it's used all across the NHS. So how about it? And he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. I carve out some time of your day to work on this. And so my next step was to go to the Slack channel. Uh, there is a specific... Uh, one for NHS plot the dots for those who are in Slack. Uh, I said, hey, I have this idea. Has it been done? Can it be done? Are, is people interested in this? And I got really good support and said, yeah, go with it. Uh, and so made, uh, I forked the branch, made, made, made my changes, and I made a pull request. And as I did, I got feedback on how to improve the code I have done. And then that code was peer reviewed and tested before merging. So in all this, we have efforts of five to six people along all those steps that contributed in making this possible, so it, and it wouldn't have been, uh, been able to be done without all of them. So that's the importance of this, like something that maybe sprung from one person with the help of all, all the others, we can disseminate it through the NHS and make huge progress. Uh, thank you so much, that's my email if anyone wants to contact me. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if there's any oh, there might be some questions. Yes, there are some questions, and we've got time for those. No, there are actually nope. no questions. So, yep. massive thanks for your, nope. uh, your Thank contribution. You. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> right, um, next we've got Keiko. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Alberto Letos Corpo, and I'm from the uh, Southeast Performance uh, Analysis team. And this morning, I want to share with you our experience as a team in upskilling 80% of, uh, of us, of, of the team itself, in our and uh, in sharing reproducible code on GitHub. So a um, little bit of background. Um, there is a well-recognized need uh, to upskill NHS analysts in open script based and share reproducible code. And this is a, a, a important and a, at the same time is a problem because uh, we know that without a clear organizational direction and without resources, uh, teams can struggle to bring about changes. And also, uh, yeah, the, the budget for training has been stretched for uh, NHS e analytical training. However, there are many technical and non-technical uh, needs that uh, uh, the analyst needs to train on. And, and we know that the learning curve to transition from a more known code as, for example, Excel, to using R can be, uh, can, can be difficult and daunting. So um, in our team, we use this uh, well-established behavioral change model uh, suggested by uh, Michi, I think is the pronunciation, um, in order to upskill the team. Um, this, mod this, uh, mm, 
This model is called, known as COMB, uh, where C stands for capability, O for opportunity, and for demotivation. And these two, three, three things together uh, in the long term will go to uh, change the behavior of, of the team. So looking in detail what these three different things mean, meant for our team, starting with capabilities. Um, within the team, uh, open resources have been promoted. Uh, our line managers guided the work so that uh, as soon as an analyst learned a new skill, they were able to apply it immediately. So they have the reward in C that what they learned was useful. Um, there were early adopters that shared their code. So uh, we had a base where to start learning from. Um, there were some mentors within the team. Uh, we had some surgeries to, and <clears throat> in this protected time, we uh, had some coach and uh, we have help with uh, solving problems. And also within our team meetings, we run some informal seminar um, uh, about, about R and, and GitHub. Um, in terms of opportunities, uh, our senior uh, leadership uh, strongly prioritize uh, the uh, evolution to R and GitHub. Um, the more experienced user helped to uh, develop some uh, protected time and some milestones so that the people who were learning R had some structural, structured way to learn. Um, very important, our senior leads negotiated with our stakeholder longer times, longer timelines uh, for deliverable made with R. And uh, in the team, we had a very good nurtured, uh, we nurtured very well a try and an error culture. Um, capability and opportunity together, uh, they help to uh, keep up the motivations. And uh, we also, in terms of motivation, uh, R has been promoted within a team as, a, as an opportunity. A fun opportunity, and it wasn't a mandate. Um, we, during our informal seminars within a team meeting, there was a lot of stress how good the data visualization uh, was using R, and uh, um, we also have been shown evidences of how R can, re can reduce time in, uh, particularly in routine tasks, but in general <clears throat> in, in tasks. Um, and then, uh, as I said, there were, uh, we had mentors and senior leaders that uh, promoted and reinforced this uh, uh, followership. And this theory, all these things together helped in a little more than one year to change the behavior of uh, the team. And, uh, and now the team is using R and uh, sharing code on GitHub. So if you want to look a little bit more in detail about the results. Um, so yeah, um, in uh, uh, the uh, Southeast Performance Analysis team, uh, managed to upskill up more than 30% of the team in using, uh, from no experience, in using R for core work. And 69% uh, uh, of the team uh, is, now at, uh, uh, using, is now using R at the beginner or intermediate level. In addition to that, there is 13% of the team that uh, started with a, a level between beginner and intermediate, and now is at an advanced level. Um, in terms of uh, business as usual, um, you can see at the bottom left, in September 22, there were five reports, routine reports created in R. One year later, there is six times that number, there are 30 reports, uh, routine reports that are created using R. An example um, is this one. Uh, this is a slide um, created, uh, a slide from a package created with R using uh, of Officer or Office R package, I'm not sure the pronunciation, uh, with the, which um, allows us to create uh, the uh, placeholder and then fill them out and uh, placed appropriately. And uh, we just <laughs> have a presentation about NHSR uh, plot the dots, uh, which is the package that we use to uh, create the uh, face at SPC charts. Um, as you can see in the notes, we also, uh, further work has been done and now uh, the script allows us to uh, rebaseline the SPC charts when there is a shift, so we can change the average and the control limits. And of course, as you can see on the left, uh, all the codes are shared in GitHub. This is our uh, page. Finally, I want to share you uh, some feedback from the team, so I will not read through all of them. I just want to highlight a couple that resonate more with my experience uh, in learning R. Um, one very important thing uh, is the uh, acceptance and the understanding from both senior leaders and uh, stakeholders uh, that we were learning are, and uh, uh, <clears throat> the understanding that the mistakes are not only 
probable, but are also useful at this stage because you have to learn, <coughs> and as, we, as I said before, <coughs> sorry, uh, trial and error. Um, and also that the understanding that uh, while you are learning, things take longer time to be, uh, to be, um, to be done. Uh, and the second very important thing is that we created a protected environment, um, a chat in Teams where all the R users in the team uh, basically can uh, raise any kind of question at all, all level of, of skills. And uh, that was very useful, first of all, because uh, you receive uh, help and, uh, uh, from people that are, have more experience, but also at the same time, it's is helpful to see that people that are on your same path of learning as you are have the same problems, so you feel less stupid, basically, and, and you feel more, um, um, you feel more mm, mm, able to do questions, even if you can think that they are silly. So yeah, this is uh, our experience. If you have any question, there are my contacts. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, yep, there are a couple of questions. Uh, where are we? So, have you got your teams to regularly publish their code publicly to ensure that people from the wider NHS and beyond can get a benefit of your great work too? Yes, yeah, so as I said, we have a, a GitHub page and uh, that's of course is, is open to the uh, on NHS E and uh, is, a, I think, a subpage on uh, Southeast, but yeah, it's, it's published and uh, yeah. Uh, a comment just saying that uh, how they love the framing of the sort of capability, motivation, and opportunity, uh, very similar to the governmental uh, analysis functions, uh, capability tools culture framing for RAP. So worth having a look at if you haven't done already. Um, is the performance analysis team sharing code methods with other, other teams? So has another team reused some of your code and vice versa or co-developed code? Uh, so, as I said, uh, our code is on GitHub, uh, and I think that there have been um, cases when we directly uh, share the codes with other teams and, and vice versa. We, we <laughs> stole, uh, get inspired from the, co from the codes of other teams, so yeah. So, so they're super interested to see how you use Combi and use it within UK HSA to frame our work around data science and uh, quality assurance. What is the main challenge to make this sustainable? So I think that, uh, so first of all, I'm, my experience is from one of the people that learned her, so I, I wasn't in the uh, organiz organizing the changing, I, um, I was part of the change. Um, I think that the, um, personally, the most difficult part is sometimes in particular where uh, deadlines are very uh, quick. It's easier to just rely on what you know well, because you know that, yeah, you know exactly what I have to do, and I know it will be a little messy, but I know that how to reach the, the result exactly. While if I have to start to R, is a much more uh, difficult process mentally. So this is my uh, personal difficulty, but uh, yeah, other people I know that they have uh, less problem with that. And I guess the, another difficulty is that, um, at least 30% of the team comes from at least 10 years when they only used SQL and Excel. So, yeah, as I said, inertia, I think, is the, the most uh, difficult thing. No, fabulous. And lots of people wanting to say they, they want a link to your GitHub, so I'm sure that will be... Okay, yeah, of course, they're time. most... Um, I think welcome. that's it for the questions. So just thank you very again, much. Thank you very much. And now I have the absolute amazing pleasure to introduce uh, me uh, and myself, so, and Alex. So there's definitely not been enough presentation so far with prizes. <laughs> so out there, this is up there for you guys. It is, I'll put it right there, you can see it. Okay, this is up for grab. So uh, at the end of the presentation, I want a bit of feedback. I want some emails. Um, so rather than come up with some hoi folloi sort of uh, JSON, or what was it you use? React. Uh, React super thing. I came up with a little bit more of a lo-fi technique to collect email addresses. So I'm going to come around and distribute a few of these. If you would kindly make them and add your email address on them, and we will, um, you can throw them at Alex at the end. That'd be awesome. So thank you. 
Thanks, Simon. Uh, so I'm Alex Porter. I work alongside Simon. I'm an analyst in NHS England. And we want to talk today a bit about how we've kind of built a bit of an R user community in NHS England and how we want to kind of make it take off, hence the plain analogy. Uh, I want to start with a question, though. Who here is part of an internal R user network? Do you have them already? Has anybody got one? There's a few hands going up. Keep your hand up if you'd like to have an internal group of friends that do our stuff that can help you out. Yeah, great. I thought that'd be the attitude. Hopefully that's kind of where we want to get to. Um, we set this up because our training needs request came in and said, actually, we've got loads of people that are really interested in developing their R skills. They'd done the basic training, but they were struggling with that momentum to get beyond it and make it happen and make R move further within NHS England. We've got 2,000 people. They surely are, all can't be using Excel every day. How do we build up their skills? And we want to move on all that kind of uh, gold acre policy stuff. But we also get lots of feedback that people were struggling with all the uh, internal barriers, like how do we install it? How do we get it working? How does it work with all our data warehouse? Um, why, when I run a Quarto document, does it always crash at the same point? Are we getting the same messages? And uh, how do we kind of do all the corporate style stuff? So we had lots of things and questions about getting things moving better. We also noticed that as Simon and I, probably devotees, wanted to learn R, we didn't see many other NHS England colleagues coming through and learning from these communities. So we wanted to bridge people and bring a stepping stone for people to help them do that development. So over the last around 12 months, we've been running this community. Uh, we set up a steering group at first, which is really the, the core group of nerds and experts that really want to keep things going and really want to change things. We are technically accountable to a training and development leadership team in NHS England. We have kind of some accountability and we share what we're doing with that group. And we've kind of tried to move things along. We set up a GitHub area so we can share some of our code, share some of our examples and our training. We built a user community. So we went where the users were. Some were on Futures, some using Yammer, some using Slack. So we tried to set up points of contact through all of them. And we found about 350 people, which is really positive about getting them using our stuff. Uh, the most important thing we've had is what Simon's been leading is the coffee and code post-training follow-up thing, things to keep the momentum going internally. I would recommend you really kind of follow that model if you can do. Um, we sorted loads of IT stuff out, and I think Louise is here somewhere, really kind of on the ball saying, look, now we're a community of analysts, and we're a voice, and we're collective, and we're shouting at IT together. We've got better results in terms of, oh, great, well, you can tell us exactly what package you need. And oh, do you need two versions? Oh, yeah, for going back and forth. They sorted that out because we could talk collectively as a group. Um, and then we moved on to doing things like talking about our national infrastructure, deciding we really want Shiny, so we're making a business case for that, and then we just hacked our own together anyway. So we've got our own little secret stuff that we try and do as a community, using all of our skills together. So the things we did this, and this is where it kind of comes together, we really talk to the senior management better by working as a group. It really kind of brings our analysts together, kind of a bit of a union. Uh, we can talk to national conferences, uh, regional conferences, and all sorts of groups by presenting our work. Really good examples of our stuff. Uh, we got people there by basically inviting everybody we knew, anybody that ever attended a conference, complete IG breach, and then you know, we just stole every contact list we could. Suggest you do the same, get people in there, and just stick it in people's diaries to say, come along, we're doing a catch up. If it's in the diaries, people see it. If you have to join in an option, optional stuff, people don't do it. And then as a committee, we divided and conquered it all in terms of how we do this. So loads of thanks, but people took on responsibilities. We couldn't have done this, any one of us individually, but by picking up bits of this agenda, as a few interested people across our organization, we really started to move things forward. We used our skills individually, and it's all kind of given us a better community and a better way forward. But most importantly, and thanks to Simon for setting up our coffee and code club. Is it me now? It is. So, uh, coffee and code sessions. I'm not seeing lots of folding, by the way. So I want to see more folding with, with emails on there. Somebody's got to hit Alex in a minute. So, coffee and coding sessions, uh, very, very informal. Obviously, they're run by me, so that's probably uh, taken us red. And very, very organic. So, you know, it's very much a sort of two-way process. You know, we want to hear what people are interested in, what they want to do. Um, you know, and, and hopefully a bit of a showcase around what people have done. Um, some, you know, either really, really simple things or a little bit more complicated. I mean, we only run for an hour every fortnight, so it's not a massive amount of time. Um, but we do try to have sort of like mini 30 minute bite sized sessions on, on sort of simple ish things where we've done things like uh, 
how to best practice for using sort of like GT tables, uh, how to how to create a quick heat map. So you know we've shared some code around sort of some heat map, and if you want to color all your LSOs, LSOAs in different colors, how to do that. Uh, so things like that. Uh, we've done like mini functions of the week. Um, recently did the, the fabulous BPAR package, which plays a, a lovely fanfare when your code is finished or, or something like that. So when you've got that really long piece of code that's just running in the background and you're doing something else, it will uh, do a fantastic fanfare when, you, when you've when you completed. And just try to create a safe space where people can just come in and ask questions of, of, of people. Um, because yes, you know, we can always go to, 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 to Stack Overflow and all those other places, but sometimes you just want to ask somebody who's in the NHS and it's, you know, quite often we've got very NHSE style data and, and questions, you know, we're not working out the quarterly sales for Region 4 or whatever, you know, we've, we've got a real RTT type question, so you know, quite often those Stack Overflows, you've really got to unpick them. So, you know, it's a really great opportunity to sort of get to, to speak to your peers and ask questions. How do we do this? Do we do this? So, uh, so yes, we've been slowly sort of uh, building this up within NHS England and also seeing a few non-NHS England people sneak in, which is absolutely awesome. Um, without a doubt, at the start, we, we really had to focus on NHS England specific issues um, around sort of our connections to our databases and all that kind of really, really boring stuff. But I think we've kind of got beyond that now. And, you know, we're not having quite so many discussions about those specific NHS E things. So now I guess our offer is that we would like to offer our, our coffee and code and open it out wider. So basically invite all of you guys and beyond um, just so that, you know, we have a, it's just like a fortnightly meeting. I think it's on a Friday at 11 till 12. I have to work out. So it wouldn't be this Friday. Yeah, we'll, no. Week on Friday. Week on Friday will be the next one. Um, and it's just a case of seeing what everybody else is up to. If you've got a sort of very, very quick tips, people sort of share code and you say, ah, you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like that. Um, and just really, really good places to sort of show really, really quick and dirty demonstrations, good practice, and just generally code in practice. Um, very much this is us being sort of keeping a voice around our sort of um, NHS England specific stuff. So, you know, we've, we've got a little bit around the shiny. But I think things like the, you know, the FDP and all of that is, is probably sort of quite generic. And also, I think it's quite a good, uh, an area where if people are highlighting, there are sort of very, very specific training needs that people want. Hopefully by opening out to the wider community then, then we can then go and lobby, um, you know, Zoe and Chris and say, oi, we want some training on such and such. And there's this many people who will, uh, who want to do it. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, then twist their arms. So hopefully then join up on those sort of training requirements and, you know, if it's only one or two people from each trust or each provider or whatever that wants to do these things, and then hopefully that will give us enough of a, enough of a voice to, to put something together. So definitely there is something about creating your in, internal networks and whether that's sort of based at your sort of team level or something wider is really, really important. But also, um, you know, do you consider, you know, coming and joining us at a sort of a, a bigger and wider event and come and join our Coffee and Code? So how to contact us? We would love to collect some email addresses. So if anybody has a plane ready, they can now fire them at, um, uh, at Alex. Anybody hits him in the eye gets the heroes <laughs> as well. Anybody can get vaguely near the stage gets the heroes. Is that, any, is that it too? No more planes than that. No more chocolate sound. Oh, here we go, here we go. <laughs> oh, no, no. Rubbish. So who's, that one's the, clo oh, oh, the closest. Oh, oh. Ooh. <coughs> Here we go. Oh, a oh, look. So, anyway, we need to collect the. Oh, good grief. Ow. Right, anyway. Um, no. <laughs> it worked so much better in my head. So, where? Bloody hell. Right, um, no, don't swear. Right, any questions to us? Where's that gone? Oh, and uh, this is the lovely, beautiful QR code which was generated, which hopefully, look, oh, they're, they're, it's working now, uh, which hopefully should link to our Teams uh, thingy. Um, but otherwise, just, yeah, whoa, look at that one. 
Uh, oh, who was that? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go around with these and I think. Um, right, anyway, uh, questions for Simon and Alex? There are no questions for Simon and Alex. So let me uh, be really, really slick and go and get my piece of paper. So, first of all, round of applause for Simon and Alex. Woo! Good job, Simon. <laughs> There's another one over there. And now, uh, who have we got? We've got Will. Aha. So, hard act to follow. I don't have any interactivity, so apologies about that. Um, so, hi. Yeah, so my name is Will Manners. I work in the NHSE Northeast and Yorkshire Analytics team. Um, so, my talk today is just how we've developed our inequalities reporting in R. Uh, so, Myself, I've, so I've led on inequalities analysis within our regional team for about three years. And around this time when I started the role, our regional director came to us with a kind of standard request of, well, normal request of developing a dashboard that looks at inequalities for key metrics. Uh, so at this point, most of our team, the main software we really used was Excel, a bit of SQL and Tableau. Um, so it was um, Excel that we developed the dashboard in. Uh, I was a bit worried about making that confession at an NHSR conference, but so thank you for <laughs> your lots of encouragement. Um, so yes, so what we did, used Excel um, and looked at a selection of key metrics. Uh, the one on the screen was activity recovery, but we did have some other sections. And for these, we had the data at a region and ICS level. We can just anonymize them on the screen and looked at variation between both most and least deprived national quintiles and also white British and ethnic minority groups. Um, so there should be a bit of color coding on the dashboard. That was based on tests for statistical significance. And the arrows are also showing change over time. However, there were a number of issues with this dashboard. Uh, the first was data processing. So we were bringing in metrics from a wide variety of sources, which then required a lot of further data manipulation and calculations. Uh, so this meant that the process of updating took a considerable amount of time, lots of careful QA required due to manual input um, and pasting. And yeah, so just a bit of a pain to maintain. Uh, secondly, statistical, um, so the approach of just comparing the most and least deprived national quintiles for each geography meant that we were effectively excluding about 60% of the data for any inequalities analysis by deprivation. Uh, so there are much more statistically appropriate ways of doing this, which I'll get onto in a bit. And the final one, and probably most obvious from the slide that I previously shared, was visual. Um, so while she could make an argument that the dashboard provider or the summary table provide a useful overview, didn't have any of the functionality of an interactive dashboard, so no option for being able to explore the data further. And also, it really didn't speak for itself. So if you wanted to tell a story with the data, you kind of need to paste it into a PowerPoint report, so kind of some snipping. Um, also, then do maybe do some additional analysis and also spend quite a bit of time writing the narrative as well. Um, so for all these reasons, I think the dashboard underwent the same life journey of most NHS dashboards. It had a bit of initial fanfare and then slowly died a death. So, so yeah, so that kind of happened. And uh, then two years, about two years down the line, our Deputy Director of Public Health, who was now leading on inequalities analysis, asked us to develop a new product uh, which looked at whether inequalities were widening or narrowing for key metrics and also to do a bit of benchmarking against England. Uh, so during this time, and I think this follows on quite nicely from Simon's talk, we as a team had done quite a lot of work upskilling in R. Um, so Simon had delivered two uh, tra day training sessions for us as a team, which were really helpful. Uh, Katie, who's going to be presenting later, did some fab work developing bits of model code so people can paste them into their reports and have charts that are very easy to produce. And then Alistair, who I'll shame as, name as my glamorous assistant in the back somewhere, did a lot of work upskilling as well, so did a lot of the technical side. Um, so all of this meant we were in a position to develop the product in R um, as a HTML output via R Markdown. And this really came with a whole set of massive benefits, really. Um, so first one was around data processing. Um, so we have a couple of .r files in the background to the report, which do the processing and the functions. 
and data get pulled at the start of the markdown strips. And so these are kind of very much largely automated. We just have a few input files and a handful of variables which you need to declare, but then you can basically just set the report running. So now, yeah, process notes are much shorter, and I think this reflects the fact that updating it is much quicker and less painful and also reduced risk of human error as well. Secondly, with statistical, um, as I mentioned before, we, before we just compared the most and least deprived quintiles, but what we move towards doing is using the slope index of inequality, which is on the left-hand side, where you basically plot all the quintiles, deciles, do a weighted regression line, and then get a value, look at the two endpoints of the line, and that allows you to kind of gives you a value that looks at variation across all deciles or quintiles. Uh, so this is a much better method, and we were able to use the PHE indicator methods library and the PHE or slope index function within this as well. And so wrote the code as a loop, which then meant you can very quickly calculate SII values for a range of metrics, geographies, and time periods. I really dread to think how long this would have taken us using the Excel version of the function, which uh, OHID also make available. And then finally, uh, visual. Um, so we developed the chart. So the report was kind of all the charts are interactive using prop Plotly. Uh, so these are presented via tab sets, allowing the user to explore the data themselves. At the same time, I, we really like this kind of the markdown structure. I think it combines kind of a lot of the best bits of both the report in terms of the narrative and the structure, and also a dashboard in terms of the interactivity. So it actually gave us something that much to a much greater extent spoke for itself. You can send it out and people can draw the key messages from it. Um, so as you can see, we can add in key messages along with the data, as well as signposting to additional tools and analysis. So I will just oops, see if this works. Try and share the final product. Let me see if this works. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this is what the report itself looks like. Uh, first thing to note is we've kind of, as a team, developed the, um, some CSS code to give all our reports a standard format. So that gives us the blue header at the top, um, as long with the footer at the bottom, which kind of contains messages about how the data should be used. Also links to our futures page and email address. And so that was Steve Graham from our team who did all the real work developing that. Um, so at the top of the report, just some notes about what's in there, metrics included, um, how we visualize the data, and then each of the sections have a standard structure. So for this one, for cancer screening, a bit of narrative at the start, saying why it's included, data source, notes when interpreting. And then we have four charts. So first one displays a time series, this case looking at breast cancer screening uptake over time for England and our four ICBs, England being the black dotted line. Then a chart in the same format, but looking at the slope index of inequality values. So this really kind of met the brief in terms of looking at whether inequalities are narrowing or widening. And we can see one of our ICBs at the top has seen a big kind of noticeable widening of the gap between most and least deprived in recent months. Also visualize that data by deprivation in a slightly different format. So we've got our four ICBs there. Um, in separate charts, and the orange line is for least deprived, blue line most deprived, so people can kind of, that's a slightly different visual representation, found that's useful for people where the slope index, explaining that can be a bit technical, this is a bit easier to kind of see and interpret as well. And then finally, what we did, uh, we used the most recent screening uptake and slope index values to do a quadrant chart. Um, so use the England values to create four quadrants, top left being those um, with high screening uptake and narrower inequalities than England, bottom right, low screening uptake and wider. So it kind of highlights two, I guess you'd say, good performing ICBs within our region and one less so in that bottom right quadrant. Um, so yeah, feedback on this, both from our regional team who kind of used the report for stock takes with national has been really, really positive and also really good feedback from ICBs as well who have started using the report um, to kind of inform their own board reporting as well. Um, so I don't have a nice slide having my name and email address, but any questions, yeah, let me know and or find me after. Thanks. Hello. Sister got yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have questions? I've come up here with you. So, would you or your team considering uh, linking with Project MSMD 
this, and which is Midlands based, uh, based, but working on similar questions. So basically, would you work with some other teams potentially? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've also got a, we set up a regional national health inequalities matrix group where we kind of share this type of work. So I think if they get in touch after that would be a good forum as well if they're not already. A couple of comments to say, lovely to see the PHE indicator methods being used. Oh, so. good. Congratulations that on that. Made someone happy. Uh, would you consider switching the report to Quarto from Markdown in the future? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, probably. I think we developed the template initially in Markdown, which is why we've kind of stuck there for now. But I think that's on our team's to-do list. As I say, we've all been in the process of upskilling. So I think. Excellent. So yeah, that's something we can definitely look at. Uh, is your code shared on GitHub? It's not currently, <gasps> I know. <laughs> Sure. Like I mentioned, we're on a journey, and <laughs> GitHub is probably the next stop along there. We do, so via that matrix group that I mentioned, we do have been sharing the codes and the analysis on there, so there is that forum, but we do realize that, yeah, GitHub is a natural home for it as well. Uh, have you got a link to the report that we can use, please, and are there plans to have this for all regions? Uh, so that, again, that would probably be through that matrix group in terms, there is some data in there that's a bit sensitive, so we do put it on future NHS, so I could probably give people access to that. And then, yeah, it'll be GitHub, the matrix group, for getting the code out there. Uh, is there a possibility to report the data using wider ethnicity grouping in the future? Yes, I think that's definitely, we're aware at the moment it just looks at uh, inequalities by deprivation. I mean, with deprivation, you can do the slope index, so you've got a scale. Um, with ethnicity, obviously, you don't have that same scale, so it needs a bit more thought in terms of how we do that, but also, and yeah, I just team, keen to link in with other teams who found effective ways of presenting. Uh, somebody asked, yeah, asked asking, can you link the code to the dashboard? So yeah, we'll slap yours and do that with Kenny already. Uh, really cool to see the live report created in Markdown. Was there any argument in the team between choosing R versus Power BI since the previous was, pipeline was in Excel? If so, how did you convince them to push forward with R? Yeah, so I guess that kind of came from that two-year journey previously, like I mentioned, in terms of choosing to upskill in R. So I think we recognized for things, so for things like the slope index, which I don't think there's a function in Power BI that would allow you to do that. So I think R is kind of fantastic in terms of giving you that statistical processing in the background and then doing a really nice report on the outside. So I think that kind of made our decision. Cool. Do you think there's any further questions apart from we stand over here? Oh, yeah. We should get a selfie with a slot behind us. Oh, we might. Yeah. You're not a wave. Yeah. My goodness me, that's <laughs> crazy. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Thank you. And now we'd like, you've got all your bits, I'd like to introduce David to the stage. Morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, as I uh, said, I'm Dave. I'm an uh, analytical program manager within the Office uh, of Health Improvement and Disparities within the Department of Health and Social Care, so part of what was formerly PHE that's moved into DHSC. Uh, and along with Marika this morning, we're going to talk you through our reflections on developing a, a dashboard-style website in the gov.uk style um, and using Quarto to do so. Um, so kind of first reflection, I'm going to talk through the, the background, Marika's going to talk through some of the, the technical stuff, but first reflection really is back to the first talk yesterday, Brian from the RSS, kind of the, the couple of things that he mentioned, dealing with a broad question, can we have a website? I guess we're even broader than that. We were, can we have something? Which we quickly turned into, can we have a website? And also at a similar time, colleagues in our team saying, have you heard about this new thing, this Quarto? Um, what, what uses can we have for this and, and how can we get the, get the best out of it? So yeah, those two things were, were swirling around. The, the broad question really was, um, can we have something that looks uh, at the surveillance of trends of the, the health of the nation um, in a way that is um, accessible to the general public, kind of getting the key messages across what the, what the key trends in the health of the nation are, and having seen uh, gov.uk style dashboards for COVID-19 and climate change and how they presented data effectively to, to a general public type of audience, we thought, let's see if we can take a similar sort of approach and develop a website that does that in the gov.uk style. We also, at the same sort of time, determined that we have all of this data already. Um, I guess by a show of hands, who's aware of the, the fingertips tool that was developed by PHE? So lots of people, everyone pretty much, so that's good to see. Um, so yeah, we knew we had 
all of this pretty much in fingertips, but we wanted to, to kind of uh, summarize it, to uh, revisualize it in a way that's more appealing to a more uh, non-technical kind of audience, non-analytical audience. Um, so we know we've got all the APIs set up in fingertips that we could use to feed the data, and that's where Quarto comes in. We can kind of combine the two and generate something that doesn't have a huge database sat behind it. We've already done that with fingertips, but we can display it um, using a, a Quarto output. So it's currently a, a work in progress, really. We've got an internal version that uh, allows us to, to view 12 topics on a summary page. So we try to keep it a small number, but within the, the realms of public health, once you start thinking about what topics we want to include are, everyone wants to chip in with their own topics. So we've kind of settled on, on 12. Uh, and then within each of those uh, topics, the user can drill through to a, a more detailed page, which whilst fingertips has loads and loads of indicators for each topic, we've kind of restricted to, to a smaller number on, on that details page for, for each of the topics that we, that we have on it. Uh, we also thought it's a, it's a route in, if we develop this, this product, we can link users through to the relevant parts of fingertips. So it kind of drops them in, in a bit more of a, a, a way that they understand the data that they're looking at rather than the, the front page of fingertips, which we guess can be a bit overwhelming for users viewing that for the first time. Um, so we can link directly to the right bits of fingertips, the metadata in fingertips for the indicators that they're, they're looking at, for example. Um, and I guess this is also driven by a request we've had from the chief medical officer to say, let's make fingertips more, more user, user accessible. So it could even become the new front page for fingertips for a general audience. So that's one route we can potentially take this down. We developed it, as I said, at national level, but we've also kind of done it consistently for regions. So you can quickly change to one of the, the former government office regions to view the same visualizations. Um, and as I say, we've, we've uh, done an internal version now for feedback uh, internally. We want to do an external version. But as we're doing trends, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, we're waiting for population denominators for a lot of our, our trends. We're kind of working to the, the timescales of the data being available for, for when we're going to release this to a more broader audience. So I've got a couple of slides just showing you what it kind of looks like in a working version at the moment. So this is just kind of the, the top, top level, the summary. Um, so we've got these 12 topics. As I say, two of them are life expectancy because it's impossible to ever have one topic of life expectancy when you're visualizing one indicator. So we've got males and females there. Some work around working out the scales for the, for the trend lines and how we actually visualize that. That's ongoing. But basically, each of them presents the trend data in a visual, the data points for the first and last time point. And pretty much any bit of each of those summary cards is clickable through for the user to get through to a details page on that particular topic. Um, this is one example I've, I've brought through, which is on musculoskeletal health. So all of the content here is driven by fingertips. We've not really written anything that's, that's not in fingertips. So the idea is that, that that's the way forward, that this can kind of be routinely generated without adding extra burden onto our teams to kind of say every, every month or every quarter, we have to write some commentary or anything like that for it. And then below that, as uh, we dropped off the bottom of the screen, you'll, you'll be able to see a data download button, the links to fingertips, and then a series of other charts in the same way for, for the selected indicators for that topic that are listed on the, uh, on the uh, contents bar on the, the left-hand side. So that's kind of where we've, where we've got to and what it looks like at present. Um, and I think, Marika, now you're going to talk through some of the uh, techniques that we've used on how we've done that. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we use Quarto to create the dashboard. Um, so starting off, we knew we needed a tool for creating a dashboard that would allow us to automate the production of health indicator pages for many regions and many topic areas per region. Um, so we were deciding between R Markdown and Quarto. So with R Markdown being the departmental default, um, so Quarto is the next generation version of R Markdown. So that's the main reason we've chosen it. We wanted it to be, the, to be a bigger chance of it being supported in the future. So Quarto allows for different languages, such as R and Python, we used R. Um, it also has additional features, such as building websites, which we were initially interested in. Um, so we wanted to produce many pages of content that had a similar look and feel. So it was immediately clear that we needed a template. Coincidentally, another team just started working on creating a Quarto template in our department. So we linked up closely with that team. We made use of their template. 
but we also sometimes needed things ahead of them being made in the template. So we developed our styling that then was added in the template. We actually had somebody working on our team who was in the template team and our team. So that was very handy. Um, so it was quite a symbiotic relationship between us and that team. So um, we could apply the template to our project by adding this www folder, which links to the GitHub pages. Um, so on the next slide, I'll go into a bit of detail about the template. And I'll just click through these. Oh, should be more things. Okay. So, um, so on the yeah, right. on the far right, you can see that um, the 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 content of the template. So there are some CSS, CSS sheets taken directly from gov.uk for the styling. We also, had, we also added some of our own CSS sheets for additional styling, for example, for styling the headers. And to create the header and footer, which you saw in the previous slide, um, we were able to change the default quarter um, Pandoc template. And to use the template, not all of our team had to have an understanding of the template. We just had to call it in to the Quarto document in the, um, in the YAML at the top of the Quarto page. So the project structure. So this was a fairly big project for us. Um, personally, I was, only used, I was mostly used to just working on single R scripts. So um, it was clear for us that, it, um, that we needed a clear project structure, not only because it would become unmanageable, but also because um, we're passing the project on to a business as usual team once we've created them, once we've created it, so they can run this project um, on a monthly basis. So we used the gov government analysis function guidance to help structure our code. So we used the duck book. So by using that guidance, um, we created modular code so um, we create, so that's creating building blocks that create bigger building blocks that then structure our code. So these building blocks began as just our code, which we made into functions. The functions then were used to create um, page content chunks, like the one you see over there on obesity. So that has several elements. So it's got a chart, it's got some text, and it's got a fingertips link. So those page content chunks were then used to create the big page structure. So you can see some of those chunks put together over here, along with the header, and there's a footer that you can't see, and there is some extra text there. So um, there were several iterations of the structure. At first, we were hoping to use the quarter website features, but because of the publishing restrictions, we weren't able to do that, so we had to have a big restructure. Um, we also started with a quarto page for every possible number of indicators per topic area. Um, but we were able to introduce conditional rendering, which meant we didn't have to do that. And I'll go into this next. So for conditional rendering. So the problem we had is that we had a quarto page for every possible number of indicators per topic area. For example, in obesity, we might have four, four indicators or so. Um, so we had a quarto page for topics with two indicators, another page for three, four, five, and six. So um, if there were more, if there were indicators with, if there were topics with more indicators, we'd need to add new quarto pages. So this wasn't as dynamic as we wanted. Um, it, there was also a lot of maintenance um, that this needed. So if we found an error in one page, we then have to go to all of those pages to change that error. So we explored a lot of different options. And then later, we're able to come up with a solution um, that allowed conditional rendering of the quarto code chunks. So we created an object, which we called conditional render, which would be set to either true or false. Um, we used that to dynamically control the eval execution option, which is an option in a quarto chunk. And that controls whether a quarto chunk is run or not. So the quarto chunks will be, um, will be run for each indicator in a list. And as soon as it gets to the end of the list, the conditional render, the object that we initially created, will change to false, and then it won't run any more chunks. So we could, um, so we could have fewer pages to generate our content. So using, using the conditional render, we only needed two quarto files for the details pages. 
whereas without this, we would have potentially needed a page per topic. So this made it a lot more easier to maintain. And also, if we added or took away indicators, we didn't then have redundant code or needed to add more code. So, um, so another solution that was helpful to producing many um, content pages for the dashboard, while, whilst reducing the number of quarto pages needed, was making use of the YAML parameters. So we have 10 geographical areas that we're working with and 11 topic areas for which um, to create the summary and details pages. So that's 10 summary pages and 110 detail pages in total for the indicators that we have and it might change. So using the YAML parameters, um, when rendering the pages, we were able to loop through different regions using the same quarto document for different regions. So using a combi combination of um, conditional rendering and adding the parameters um, in the YAML, we were able to produce 120 pages of content for our dashboard using just four quarto files. Um, so to summarize the learnings that we took is um, working with Quarto is very similar to R Markdown. So if you work with R Mark Markdown, it shouldn't be hard for you to transition into Quarto. But if you haven't worked with R Markdown, which I hadn't worked with much at all before going into this team, um, it shouldn't hinder you being able to pick it up. Um, so that was totally fine for me. So looking into the future, we would, we would be keen to explore the Qu Quarto functionality, other Quarto functionality, such as website building, if we get, can get past the publishing restrictions, and other things like maybe packaging our code. So thank you for listening, everyone. And we also don't have our email addresses at the end of the slide, but you can find us at the end, if you fancy. Awesome, thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> There are questions. Okay. There's no running away yet. There are <laughs> questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, starting off with a bit of a techie question, but how will you host the public dashboard for GitHub pages? Well, the code we plan to make available by, by GitHub, I think that the public publication, we, we're kind of working through options within uh, both gov.uk and also uh, the kind of hosting of fingertips, so whether we, we can uh, jump on, on with what's already there. So a couple of options that we haven't kind of got to the conclusion of yet. Uh, so Ms. Rins, can we steal this? I'm sure they don't mean steal. I mean, I'm <laughs> sure they mean share best practice. We don't use the word steal. Can we share best practice and uh, do health trends in the Midlands or Birmingham's, et cetera, from your code? So um, we'll have, um, when this is actually live, we'll have West Midlands and East Midlands as the, the former government regions. Um, Plan, plan is to make all the all the code live. I think the templates may be already available, uh, potentially. Um, I, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. <laughs> quick, quick, quick shake of head from the audience there. Help me out with that one. <laughs> uh, is the data that you're using already in the public domain, um, and are there any data sharing considerations? It's it's all on fingertips. So everything that goes onto this is already available on fingertips. Yeah. Do you have any chart styles or color schemes to match the website theme? So I think that's from the gov.uk yeah, so GDS. We use, yeah, we use the GDS guidance um, to make it more accessible as well. My goodness me. Right, uh, where are we? Do you use the gov.uk style sheets? Come, uh, uh, sorry, I'll come back to that one in a minute. Uh, we're looking to host our, I know that someone's answering all the questions. Nice to see use of features to use website with less code. Um, were there any IT issues with installing using Quarto when, when starting the project? Um, I think the biggest thing that we found is Quarto pages are contained. So once you run code in one Quarto page, the next Quarto page doesn't reference that. It's its own environment. So it's not an IT issue because Quarto is actually made to be like that. Mm -hmm. But um, we then found a function called include, which allowed us to pull in other Quarto pages. So that was quite a big issue that we um, had initially. But all the IT issues we had, I don't think they were due to Quarto. Sorry, uh, just reading, reading this question again. So do the gov.uk style sheets come directly come from the alphagov GitHub repository directly? Uh, was there any inspiration from the GovDown package, an archive package applying gov.uk style to R Markdown? Um, so it was actually the other team that worked on creating Those the template. They are, some of them are here, so they might be able to answer in the, uh, cool. online. 
no further questions, you are excused. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> And I would like to invite Parissa to the stage. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Parissa and today I'm going to be talking to you about reproducible workflows with Python. So what I mean by that is essentially ensuring that your data and code for a project is assembled in such a way that someone else can rerun your analysis and reproduce your results. So I'll first of all introduce myself. I'm a data scientist and trainer at Jumping Rivers, which is a data science consultancy. And before I started working there, just over a year ago, I did a PhD in particle physics. Um, I like programming in Python, and apart from that, I also like going on long runs. Don't know why, just enjoy it. And also doing all things yarn craft and this is a cross stitch of the Python logo that I made at the latest PyCon UK conference. So sometimes these things do get to overlap. <laughs> um, so what you might notice in here is a distinct lack of anything to do with healthcare or medicine or R. So I, as I said, I did my PhD in particle physics, but actually particle physics and healthcare have more of an overlap than you might think. For example, the detectors that we use in particle physics, the technology that's used in those also has applications in medical imaging. So to begin with, I'm going to just talk you through a project that I did early on in my PhD and talk to you about some of the things that went wrong in that project. As a bit of background, this is an overhead shot of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN in Geneva. It's essentially a big long tunnel, big circular tunnel underground, and particles whiz around this tunnel in opposite directions. You can't really see, I don't think, but at points along the tunnel, there are detectors. And out of these detectors, we bring these particles that are whizzing around into a collision. So the particles um, collide in the center, at really high energies, and then loads of stuff um, shoots off, new particles are created, they shoot off in all directions, and we measure their tracks in the detector. So this is the, another overlap of particle physics and maybe like healthcare or just data analysis um, in general is that we have a lot of data. So why are particle physicists doing this. Essentially, they're trying to figure out something about the fundamental nature of the universe. And we measure something about that in this experiment. On the other hand, we have a theoretical model of how we think the universe works. And we run a computer simulation of our experiment, um, assuming this model and we get some results. So we can then compare our simulation results to the results from an actual experiment and see how well our model describes the true nature of the universe. So in particle physics, there is a kind of regarded model as like our best model that describes the universe and that's called the standard model. However, there are some discrepancies between that and what we see in experiments. So physicists are trying to always come up with new models and can kind of try and explain these discrepancies. And this is what one of my early on PhD projects was looking at. We had a new model. We did all of that modeling. There was a lot of maths in that, and we used Mathematica. We then um, ran a simulation of an experiment using that model, and that was all done in C++. And then we had to analyze our results. And we did a lot of the final analysis in Python. However, a lot of things, we didn't do everything correctly. We had a lot of bad practices and we did a lot of things very badly in that analysis. So we did have some struggles. One of the struggles we had was, so I was working with two other collaborators and often we were asking each other, okay, where can I find this file? We were working on separate parts of the project kind of in isolation and we all had our own project structure of files. So when someone else shows you their work, it's kind of hard to see where everything is. 
Additionally, we were really bad at managing dependencies. We didn't have a kind of centralized repository where we would have like a file that would have all our dependencies in. Um, it was more like, oh, which version of this package are you using? Okay, I'll just make sure I'm using the same one, which is really terrible, I know. Additionally, I did have that problem sometimes where I would change something in the code and a plot would suddenly look different and I didn't actually think that that should change. Um, so I had to kind of look back through the code, figure out why does this version, what's changed in this version from yesterday, and why does this plot now look different? I was getting unexpected um, results from my code. So we were doing lots of like really complicated particle physics. So why, why couldn't we do this? Why was this done so badly? And I think part of it was that some of the things we didn't really know the best practice and also Establishing a reproducible workflow is a lot of effort and a lot of time, and it's, it's not easy. And we were under quite a lot of time pressure to get our paper out, get results. Um, we actually, yes, yeah, so we published a paper and then a follow-up paper. And it was, yeah, it was quite, the way we like, yeah, it was, we didn't have the time to kind of spend making sure that our code was good quality in establishing that reproducible workflow. So sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming to kind of start a new project to kind of think, okay, how can I make this reproducible? So sometimes it helps to kind of think of levels of reproducibility because having a partially reproducible project is better than no reproducibility at all. So these are kind of some of the questions that you can think about. Can I rerun this analysis on my computer next week? Can I rerun this analysis on a different computer? Could my colleague rerun this analysis if I gave it to them? And then probably the highest level would be, can someone who I've never met and will never meet rerun this analysis in two years' time? So it's been a lot longer than two years since I did this work. Um, but if I went back now and tried to rerun that project, I would not be able to. So let's actually try and go back. And then I would do also do a lot of things different if I tried to do that again, if I did that project again now. So let's go back and let's try and make that project reproducible. Probably the most important thing in having a well-structured project is your file organization. And also it might be kind of a, an easy win um, to kind of get you going. So this is all of the files that were actually in a project folder on my laptop when I did my PhD. And this is absolutely horrendous. I'm quite embarrassed to show you this, actually. Um, I wouldn't try and let, make anyone try and figure out what's going on there. Um, but when you're starting a project, sometimes you, you've got a lot of freedom. And it can be hard to think, OK, how can I go from scratch to um, creating a project stru structure. So what can help with that is this tool called Cookie Cutter, and it's a command line tool that will initialize a project structure for you. And a project structure that's useful for Python data science projects is, yeah, Cookie Cutter Data Science. So after you can pip install Cookie Cutter as a package from PyPI, and then you can just run Cookie Cutter and then this URL to this template, in your terminal, and it will create this file structure for you. So you can see at the top there, I've got a data folder, so all my data is going to go in here. Then I've got a separate folder for my models, notebooks, and then I've also got a source folder for all my Python modules. That's where all the source code for the project is going to live. And so, yeah, in there, I'd have scripts that clean the data, build features, train and predict the model, and also visualize my results at the end. So having a structure like this um, kind of created for you makes it easy to kind of get going of the project. And additionally, if you're showing this to someone else who's familiar with this template, they'll immediately know where everything is and they can get started really easily with your project. Okay, so that's kind of the first thing, we could, how we could have made that project better. As I said, we didn't really do any managing of dependencies. 
And managing dependencies in a project is really important um, to kind of keep track of all the packages that you are using. Additionally, you're usually not just working on one project in isolation. You'll be working on multiple projects. And in Python, um, so sometimes these projects might also depend on different versions of the same package. And in Python, to make sure that these projects can kind of coexist happily together, we need to make sure that they are in isolated environments. So I did actually use um, Conda, and I did have some virtual environments for projects in my PhD. But mostly, it was kind of separating out installations of Python so I could have Python 2 um, on my laptop as well, because some physics tools still use Python 2 for some reason. Um, but ideally, you might want to have a different virtual environment for every project that you're working on, so you can keep track of the dependencies specifically for that project. So package managers can help us with this. They provide support for creating virtual environments, and they can automate fetching, installing, and handling of the dependencies for a project. So I already mentioned Conda. Another popular package manager for Python is pip. And a newer package manager is Poetry. And I quite like Poetry for if you're developing a project that you might eventually want to turn into a package and then publish. Poetry makes that process really easy. But also, it has a lot of commands that just make managing dependencies a lot easier. So I mean, this is my opinion, but I would say Poetry is probably my favorite one out of these that I've used. So if you're starting a new project, you simply need to run Poetry New, and then the name of your project in the terminal, and Poetry will create a project structure for you, kind of a bit like Cookie Cutter. So it will create this package structure for you. And in there, you can see that there's this Higgs project file. That will be where your source code is. So I've just called my project Higgs project. Um, there's a test folder, so I'll come on to tests a bit more in a minute. And the file in here that's going to help us with managing dependencies is the PyProject Tomol file. So in the PyProject Tomol file, um, there'll be a, it doesn't quite look like that, but there's like a, a bit in there that lists all the dependencies of your project. So it'll probably start off with something with just a Python dependency. If I'm working on a project and I want to start using a package in it, so for example, if I want to start using the pandas package, which is a popular data science analysis package in Python, I simply need to run poetry add, and then the name of the package, so pandas, in the terminal. And poetry will install pandas and also add pandas to my pry project Tomo file. So this will then build up a list of all the dependencies that I'm using in my project. I can then share my project and this, including this PyProject Tomo file with anyone else who wants to get run my analysis. And they simply need to run poetry shell and poetry install. And that will create a virtual environment, install all the dependencies, and then they can run that project, that analysis pipeline, um, really easily, just out of the box. So now we've got a good package structure. We, yeah, we've got a good file structure. We are managing our dependencies. I mentioned that Poetry creates this test folder when it initializes the package. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is tests. So tests ensure that your code is working as you, as you would expect. And in Python, there is a package called, well, there's a library called unit test, which is part of the standard library in Python. And another popular testing package is PyTest. So I've used actually PyTest um, the most. So what is a test? You can imagine you've got some source code, um, for example, this function weather forecast. And this has a default argument, rain. I might write a simple test, um, which I've got at the bottom here, which just checks, OK, when I call my weather forecast function, is rain in that string? So this is just a simple check that this function is behaving as I expect. And where this test would live would be in the test folder. And in that test folder, you'll have a lot of Python scripts that all begin with test underscore something. 
and in there you'd have all these testing functions. So I've written my tests, now how do I run it? Um, I simply run PyTest in the root directory of my project, and that will, PyTest will automatically know, it will actually recursively search through all the folders in your project and look for anything that begins with test underscore, and it will run all the tests that are in that, in that file. Um, so here you can see my test passed, and I've got a green dot next to my test. Um, so that's great. I can be confident that my code is doing what I want. If I then went back and changed something about that function, if I change the default argument, and now rerun PyTest, I'll get an error message, and I've caught the fact that, okay, something that I might not have meant to change is actually changed in this function, and I kind of, I've caught that. Um, so, yeah. Now, with, now we've introduced tests, we can be sure that, and I was, will say that in the project that we had before, there was no tests at all. So even having some tests. Also PyTest, you can like check the coverage of your code. So it will kind of check how much of your code is tested, which is also a useful feature. Um, but yeah, so just having any tests can kind of improve your confidence um, in your code. Okay, so now we've got robust code. The final thing I'm going to talk about is version control. I'm not really going to go into much detail on this, but when I was working on this PhD project, a lot of the final analysis that we did and the final plots that we produced were all done in Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter Notebooks and Git famously do not mix well. And a reason for this is that when you save a Jupyter Notebook, so when you run a Jupyter Notebook, it's kind of interactive, and when you save it, there's a lot of metadata that's also saved. So you have saved in there all the uh, number of times, like the order that you execute the cells in the notebook, and also kind of metadata, the output is also saved. This is a particularly horrible output that was from a plotly graph. So this is what you would get if you did change something in a Jupyter notebook and then did a diff. And this is absolutely horrible to look at. This doesn't tell me anything. So what can help with maintaining Git-friendly Jupyter notebooks is a platform called MBDev. It actually has a whole bunch of tools that are useful for developing with notebooks. Um, but if you're even just wanting to just do your exploratory data analysis in a notebook, um, you can use some of the features from MBDev. And a particular one that I want to talk about is Git hooks. So a Git hook is essentially a script that will run when you do an action in Git. So for example, before you make a commit. NBDev has a useful Git hook called NBDev clean which will get rid of all that unnecessary metadata in the notebook, and then when you run git diff, you actually get a diff um, in the source code of the cells in your notebook. So you get a much nicer diff, which is actually telling you what you want to know, which is actually how has the code changed, not how has all this metadata changed. So that's a really nice tool that I wish I'd known about earlier um, to use in that project. Okay, so I had mentioned earlier that I had these struggles, and now, hopefully, we've kind of fixed some of the things that were wrong in that project. Um, with Cookie Cutter, we're no longer asking, where can I find this file? Because we're familiar with the Cookie Cutter file structure, we know where everything is. With Poetry, we can make sure that we're all now using the same versions of every package, and we're not gonna update something and everything will break. With PyTest, we can be sure that our code is behaving as we expect. And then finally, with Git and MBDev, we can actually get a useful diff for our notebooks and we can kind of use version control on our notebooks um, and work collaboratively on notebooks together. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> cool. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, there are some questions. Uh, where are we? So, yep, Sam just saying, 
totally agrees with all the, the PhD and, and the um, academic stuff. And yeah, a lot of the good practice seems obvious when you know it, but um, it's not often known about, so and certainly not prioritized. There is a Gov cookie cutter variant of, care, uh, of cookie cutter. So just wondering if you were aware of that. Claire's pretending that her code for her MSc in Stata is beautiful. We can't believe you. Um, were you aware that there's an R library called, what's it called? Ravelry, which is all an API to retrieve knit and crochet passions, uh, patterns for yarn data and author information and shop locations. So. Yeah, so I, I have, I've not used it, but I have wanted to try it because I saw that it was included in Tidy Tuesday. Um, so yeah, that's one that I did want to try. Def definitely <laughs> need some more of that. Um, there's some guidance on Python virtual environments uh, within Sam's uh, use of virtual environments within the RAP team. What were the deciding factors for choosing poetry over the other myriad of options? Um, I think with, yeah, I'm not sure, yeah, I don't think it's working anymore. Um, with poetry, I think it was more the fact that, so if you're using pip, you would have to run like pip install all the packages, and then you have to run pip freeze to create like the requirements file, and that's kind of like two steps to that process, and you're not sort of updating that file every time you install a new dependency. So with poetry, those two things are kind of like linked together and you're just easily being able to keep track of all the dependencies all the time. You don't have to worry about, okay, I need to run like pit freeze now and do that. Um, okay. I think that was the main reason. Also poetry has some other commands as well, like poetry, I think it's, something like poetry build and poetry publish that will build your package and then publish it to PyPI if you've like configured that, um, which makes it easy to kind of, yeah, publish packages as well. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's like way better than the others, um, but there are some features that it has that maybe others don't, and others probably have features that poetry doesn't have, so I guess it depends on the use case as well. Yeah, of course, of course, there's no doubt. Um, another comment that PyTest is great, but also to give a shout out to DocTests. Have you heard of DocTests? No. I know some uh, links of that. Uh, you can run Python and Quarto to avoid the issues, of, uh, the GitHub issues. Have you explored those? Yeah, so that is, I have used Python um, and Quarto together, but yeah, I've not, I have, yeah, so I guess, yeah, with the Quarto document, you could, that's got better version control um, in Git. And you can turn your Jupyter notebook as well. You can render your Jupyter notebook um, with Quarto, but yeah. Uh, someone's commented, often run into problem issues when testing in that when, when run, they don't correctly pick up dependencies or global state of the code under test, usually something to do with the nesting of folders in the test directory. Do you have any tips? So I would say, I think Py, uh, from, I don't know, from my experience, um, as long as your test is prefixed with test underscore, PyTest should pick that out. And I think you can have nested, like you would usually have like a unit test direct folder and uh, integration test folder. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I've not experienced that problem, so I don't really have an answer for that. Have you looked into the CI, CD, to automatically run tests prior to pushing to the repo? Yeah, so we actually use um, pre-commit. Um, so that's kind of one of the Git hooks that I mentioned. So with pre-commit, you can configure to run like PyTest and also like linting checks every time you make a commit. Um, so you're yeah, keeping your GitHub repo clean with that. No further questions. Anything you'd like to say in your defense before we let you go? In my defense. <laughs> 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 no, no further questions, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for this session now. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Next up, we've got Chris Roebuck, who is going to be embracing reproducible analytical pipelines. Absolutely, give them a hug. Hi there, everyone. It's fantastic to be here at this event. Re really pleased to be here. My name's Chris Roback, and I'm the, sorry, that's a slightly big and scary picture of me behind. 
I'm the Joint Chief Statistician at NHS England, and I'm really passionate about reproducible analytical pipelines. I'll just say a bit about my journey towards them first before then going on to the meat of the presentation. So I um, did um, statistics at university, must be about um, just over 20 years ago now. And at the time I used um, S+, plus, which I believe is a um, dim and di distant precursor to R. Then I joined the Department of Health and um, it was a bit of a shock to me when I first started because ev nearly everything was done in Microsoft Excel with a bit done in Access as well. I was discussing with a, a colleague about um, uh, the, the, the benefits and the good bits around Access, but it was quite different from what I'd done at university. And then I kind of got into managing analysis, still with teams largely um, doing Excel and Access, moved on um, to have teams doing more SQL, but my um, kind of personal um, journey towards coding and rap kind of had two, two halves to it. One was around the um, team of people who came in, and I was, I was in NHS Digital before moving to NHS England, got some fantastic colleagues um, joining who had um, great skills in coding and also a fantastic vision around using that code to automate things much better and linking into that some of the work going on elsewhere around RAP and I'll say a bit more about that in due course and in parallel with that I, um, I, I did um, another master's course in health data science and I actually got my hands dirty coding in Python in doing that and the various um, uh, packages within Python so that gave me a real personal insight and passion around it which was really really good and I'm nowhere near as expert of any as any of you in this in this hall but actually getting the opportunity to do some of it myself and get my hands dirty was really valuable and something I really enjoyed and helped me understand the benefits. So um, today's presentation I'm going to it's going to be of two broad chunks. The first chunk will be around the work we did in NHS Digital moving into NHS England around rolling out reproducible analytical pipelines, building a commu real community around, around them and um, moving so a lot of our statistical publications are now generated in this way. And then the second part will be even more focused on the community as um, legacy organisations, NHSX, NHSE, um, NHSD, came together under the umbrella of uh, NHS England, and we also reached out to other parts of the health and care family as well to build a really strong community. And off the back of that community, I'm delighted to say that today we've published a, a playbook around reproducible analytical pipelines in health. Johnny will have put it on the Slack. So those of you who are on the Slack, I'd encourage you to look at the link there go into it, take a look at it. But this is a combination of a few months worth of work and I'll come to it in a, a bit and say a bit more about it, but also um, cover that as a key part in my presentation. So um, when a colleague um, sent me this picture, it took me a while to understand what was going on and let alone what the visual metaphor is. But it's essentially two galaxies colliding. So we have a, a galaxy of traditional analysis and then a galaxy of computer, computer science and data engineering. And that's the beauty of how, how work's coming together now under coding language, under reproducible analytical pipelines. It's bringing together all of these skills, getting multidisciplinary teams together, bouncing ideas off each other ultimately for the benefit of health and care in producing better pipelines, more efficient pipelines that free up um, analysts' capacity, having, having worked with engineers to build these, then to explore what's going on in the data. There's a single version of the truth out there, so the debate isn't around what the numbers are showing. There's that single version of the truth. The debate is around what to do with those numbers and how to react, and also digging deeper into what the underlying causes are. 
So say a bit more about what are reproducible analytical pipelines. Um, some of you have been very well versed in this already, but just kind of a, as a recap as much as anything else and to pull out all the aspects that are important to us. So as the name says on the tin, making reusable components is central to this um, and, and having robust testing around that so that they can then be shared between um, colleagues both within the organization and through publishing code across to the wider community so things can be reused. There's a greater level of efficiency in terms of not building everything from scratch and also code can be refined, commented on with the community with the aim of getting a single version of the truth for generating a, a given metric and that that is mass, uh, a massive undertaking with so many different organizations doing different things but this this certainly provides a step towards that and really establishing that community and um, nested within that transparency as well really really important so people can actually understand the workings understand the methodology moving away from black boxes or proprietary solutions so that when people see a metric that might be showing their organization and how that compares with their peers or what's going on within a region or nationally people can actually get under the skin of that and work out what's going on how it's generated etc and that that ability to reuse others work stand on the shoulders of giants and and I, I, I've immensely benefited from that. Our teams have, and I hope we've also enabled others to reuse some of what we've done. And it's all, it's all predicated on open source tools, Python, R, SQL, absolutely central to this. So everything is open and transparent and um, all the benefits from that openness and transparency, which I just mentioned, ensue. And um, before I move on, it's important to say underpinning of all of this is the community. So in my mind, the technology, although immensely important and certainly having wrestled with lots of technology installations and next big things and next rollouts and ensuring that um, the, co the coding can work within those, I don't want to understate the importance, but even more central in my mind is, is the community. It's a whole way of working across communities, sharing work, supporting each other, peer reviewing things, and that is the real heart of it. And I'll say a bit more about that. So moving across um, slightly so, and then, then the benefits. And the key thing around the benefits, I think I'll be preaching to the converted in this group, but being able to sell the benefits to people, at, colleagues at all levels, within the organization is really important from the, the board. And I was really lucky in the predecessor organization that Ben Goldacre was on our board and he is a passionate advocate of RAP. So it was quite, um, I've been to previous board meetings and presented a high level overview of our statistics, but actually going along to our board meetings and having detailed discussions around RAP was quite, um, quite exciting and quite a, quite a change. So, um, but the, the, I think the benefits um, we're able to sell to the organization around higher quality outputs and around increased efficiency, enabling us to free up analysts capacity for other types of new analysis or investigating what's going on with really good sales pitches and getting senior colleagues on, on board. I think the, the, um, the standardization and portability I think that was really a really good selling point to all the different teams who came from very different places so we had um, some folks like this community who are passionate around open source and are in python other colleagues who hadn't used that those kind of languages before and had done things differently or in um, more um, um, other other ways or more involved in kind of managing teams, doing stuff. So getting, finding the unique sales pitch for everyone was really important. And I think the standardization and portability was a really good one. 
because that enabled people to work across topic areas much more easily, enabling them to develop their careers and a real, a real sales pitch in terms of ensuring colleagues annotated their code well and made code clear so they, they, they didn't have a job for life in the person that runs product X or product Y. Others could pick it up and they could move on to, to product Z. And then the ease of understanding, particularly when code is, is well commented. And as I'll come to on a subsequent slide, we're not looking and we weren't setting any expectations of perfection in terms of code and the key, the key was starting somewhere, but adding, adding comments to add that ease of understanding, maintenance and update. And all of these things collectively added to add to more value around reproducible and store pipelines and, and um, improving the, 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 status, the status quo and move, moving things along. So um, the approach we took and we had a great core team of um, data scientists led in the latter part by Sam Hollings who's going to present later. The approach we took was very much around trying to get everything to a baseline level rather than focusing on getting a few, getting perfection for a few things. Although where we did have enthusiasts, we wanted to support that. But our main focus was on, was on breadth and getting everyone passionate and up to speed. So in doing that, Sam and the team presented kind of three layers of layers of wrap or, or three standards of wrap. The baseline wrap, which was um, you know, using open source language, version control using Git and peer review, and then publishing code in the open, linking to the code repository. And the first two of those people embraced massively from the word go. There was some nervousness and reluctance around publishing code. I, I didn't fully understand all the root causes. But I think people saw it as potentially their homework, potentially being marked, that their code wasn't quite finessed enough for a for wider audience. And we looked to, to, to overcome that by having uh, and a kind of a, a approval process to, to de-risk it so people didn't have any nervousness around inadvertently publishing something they, 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 they shouldn't, which, is, which isn't, isn't going to be the case in most instances, but an approval process to in, ensure that that aspect was de-risked and people didn't feel that risk, along with kind of trying to set some healthy competition around, among teams to see who could be first to publish their code and set, trying at every opportunity to set expectations that we're not looking for perfection, that any, any, any published, published code is, is beneficial and it opens it up to a much wider audience who, to comment on that. So we've now got to about 20 um, publications that have their associated code published and linked to them, 20, 20 series and, and many more that are on the way or almost there. And then for Silver Wrap, we've added further criteria around automation, around testing, around dependency management, and some of these features. I'm sure there've been talks around, or there'll be talks around in due course. And a number of teams have done a bit of a pick and mix in, in taking some of the aspects from baseline and then wanting to go further on Silver in certain areas, particularly around testing, which is really important. And then finally, we have a gold uh, wrap which adds various other um, other features to it so I took a, took a few clicks of the button to unveil gold but hopefully it's worth the wait in terms of packaging and um, dependency uh, management further for, further ro ro rolled out and continuous integrate integration and and deployment, so that's that's kind of the the icing on the on the cake. So moving on, so so this work um, we've had some really positive examples from this, and a, a, an, another key feature in in getting teams on board is to share the real success stories. So we approached it very much by um, getting the teams who produced the reports to um, be in the driving seat 
and then have a core team of experts in SAMS data science team going in and providing support to upskill them, but very much owned by the teams who produce the publications. And that ownership is an, is an essential feature because you need them fully on board, passionate about it, and then wanting um, fully able and enthusiastic to take the lead on it when the central team has moved off and supported other, other teams. And as part of that, um, Sam established a community of practice to um, enable uh, people from across our organisation. And it's now branched out more widely to the NHS more broadly and other organisations, um, support each other, ask questions. And that I can't overstate the importance of that community aspect to it. And we've got um, um, lots of publications at various stages of RAP and, and stories around something that previously took two weeks, now being compressed to 40 minutes is one case, but lots of stories like that, which are, are clear sales pitches, both for the business, busy analyst and for the organisation as a whole. And another nice feature is linking the open code to the publications, where the publications get a lot of interest, such as one around smoking, drinking and drugs that was picked up by the BBC. Three clicks from the BBC report on it through to the open code, which was really, really nice to see as well. And then we've got our data engineering teams. And, and, so, and sometimes I find colleagues in data engineering, they use terminology other than RAP and they've been working to high standards of aspects of this for a while. And um, they're, they're doing a lot of stuff as well, collaborating with Ben Goldacre in his new role and looking to publish um, um, more reproducible code there as well. So they're on board. And then the NHS England, our, our community, which is uh, a fantastic community and me coming from the legacy um, NHSD side of the organisation, haven't worked through this community for as long as some others in the room. But again, a really um, th thriving community and um, using, using R and supporting each other around that. So we've now got vibrant community on Python and a vibrant community on R, which is absolutely fantastic. So um, the key other point to make around RAP is there's been some um, great work in our organisations to champion it, but it isn't unique to our organisations or to the NHS. It's um, really um, a cross-government initiative and the national statistician is very passionate about it. Other government departments, government analyst analysis functions also done a lot of work. There's a vibrant community which we're linked into there and they've, produ they've produced a lot of um, documents and um, products to support your, um, users in implementing it. So I'd encourage you all to peruse those various sites, look at the documents and outputs that have been produced and look at what will work for you on those. A few, few, few documents appearing. And there was, um, it's, it's made its way into um, the Houses of Parliament as well with a parliamentary question around it, which is, which is nice. But, but a, a large community across government, the, um, the, the Gold Acre Review and subsequent work following on from that, again, very heavily referencing it. So it's great having all these um, handles to support, point to these support networks and which is really helpful in making the case to others around its importance. So um, it hasn't all been plain sailing. There has been um, challenge along the way, some, some um, resistance, some lack of enthusiasm, and um, the very variety of techniques and tactics to overcome that. A big part is, in, at least initially, with something finding the enthusiasts getting them going on the work, and then being able to demonstrate the rider benefit. So these things such as reports taking 40 minutes that used to take two weeks is, is something that is unarguable and can be demonstrated to much wider audience. I think some colleagues were um, nervous around 
um, like, like all of you, having a very packed kind of day-to-day -day job, lots of different requests coming in, nervous around the initial investment of time and training and potentially um, doing, slowing things down in the very short term to speed things up in the longer term. So really championing this and giving people the space to do it, including supporting them in deprioritizing some bits of day-to-day -day work while they got trained up for ultimately being able to do to do more. So that was another aspect. And then I think showing um, existing benefits and also starting small in certain areas. So not overwhelming people with stuff, but actually, actually um, even starting with, um, Sam always talks about kind of flow charts of the current code or, or the current process and, st and starting with that. So very much um, supporting people moving along the journey at their own, their own pace. So um, to finish off, I'll say a bit around the health wrap playbook. Hopefully, can, have, have people had a chance to see that on Slack? Can I have a show of hands? Has anyone seen the link on Slack and able to access it? Great, so a smattering of hands. So I'd, I'd encourage you all to look at that at your own time. Release today. It, it isn't intended to um, displace or supersede all the other guidance that's out there from across government, from other sources. It's intending to complement that with a specific health flavour and, um, and support from what we've learned in rolling out um, RAP across our organisations. And it was generated from across um, health bodies, so um, the various legacy organisations coming together, Sarah Culkin's team in NHS um, X, um, some folks from NHSE, from Legacy NHSD all coming together along with Office for National Statistics, Department for Health and Social Care and UK Health Security Agency all contributed to it and um, signposts a lot of other documents, sets out some, some health unique features and how to work with them such as the sensitivity of some data sources and how to ensure that that isn't a, isn't a barrier because there's massive benefits around RAP, but stuff is done in a, a very secure way and there's no inadvertent problems created. Um, talks about promoting the open um, sharing of code, but also some permitted exceptions around that. It gives links and testimonies to who else is doing it. So again, really looking to build the community and sets out the levels of RAP maturity that I, I mentioned, mentioned briefly earlier. So I'd really encourage colleagues to have a, have a look at that. Um, here's one screenshot fr from it. And the other important to, point to make is we've launched it in alpha. And the reason we've launched it in alpha is to get it out early, but also to get colleagues feedback so we can look to improve it further and ensure it's relevant to a wider audience. In order to get something out relatively quickly, we had a, a relatively small pool of colleagues from the central organisations building it. They're keen for it to be as applicable as possible, so keen to get a wider set of colleagues feedback on it from, you, from yourselves and others. So please do look at it and, and submit that, that feedback. So um, I'm going to wrap up now to pardon the pun, but no presentation or meeting around wrap is complete without it. Um, we, we and the central team we're keen to support you, but also be supported from other colleagues in the community because it really is around sharing knowledge. So if um, um, anyone's got any particular challenges in implementing it, either culturally, um, technically or otherwise, then please um, give the central community a, a shout and there'll be somewhere, someone somewhere who's had similar challenges and, and overcome them. We're, we're building a community of rap champions and we'd love some of you to be part of, be part of that. And then within our organisation, we, we picked a specific strategy around trying to go broad and shallow initially. Um, but I think the key, the key thing is to pick a strategy and run with it and then change course as you, as you go and get the momentum. And I appreciate you all, all probably at different stages in, in journeys around rolling out 
wrap. So there was plenty, plenty of examples and plenty of opportunities as well. So I'll finish now and greatly welcome any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Chris. We've had a lot of questions on the Slack for you, um, but I think we do have time for a couple of them. So firstly, have you encountered any reticence to publishing in the open around sensitivity of the base fields used in the data sets? As in, we don't want people to know that we even collect this or hold this information. I, th I think there, there is some nervousness around any interaction between the code and the actual data which we've looked to overcome with the sign-off process to ensure that no nothing sensitive inadvertently gets released. I'm certainly not aware within our legacy organisation that we hold any data so sensitive that we don't even want anyone to know that we hold those data. I think we're, we, we look to be transparent around all of the data we collect, so it's more around um, a slight nervousness that um, data will inadvertently seep out with the code which our, our sign-off process gives that kind of layer of reassurance and also the RAP playbook as well talks about um, processes to in ensure that the, there's no risk around that. Next question. Is there a list of projects in the RAP levels that have breached? The UK, UK HSA teams are trying to compile something along these lines so that uh, teams can identify and support each other. Yeah, sure. So we and Sam and his team collect um, information from all teams. So for all our for all our statistical publications and some of our other work, we've collated which bits of which rap level they're at. So we can we can both share good practice. Um, set up that mutual support and try to chivy along some of the teams that aren't um, uh, um, so far ahead. Is, is, that, um, is that available to a broader audience, Sam, at all? So, so, so I, don't, I don't think there's any reason why we wouldn't publish it, but it's currently within NHS England to try to drive things along. Do you have any idea what's happening internationally in regards to other countries, uh, other governments, for example, developing RAP? I, I don't, I've, 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 been, I've been so focused on all the energy and enthusiasm within the UK, I haven't really um, looked in any great depth at what's going on internationally, but I've, I've, I, I gather there is um, enthusiasm in other countries that, as, as well, because um, the open source code and the direction towards that is the is the same. So I, I, I gather there's enthusiasm in other countries as well. Great, thank you very much. Can I ask you to have a look on the Slack for the many other questions that are going on there, and direct you all to go over to the Slack channel to join in on the discussion that's happening there. Um, and then next up, we have Claire Welsh. Who's going? Thanks, Chris. Claire's going to be talking to us about her experiences using RAP within the National Disease Registration Service. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, <clears throat> we're nearly there. We're nearly at lunch, so I won't keep you too long. And didn't really want to follow Chris Roebuck, but here we go. So, my name is Claire, and I'm part of the National Disease Registration Service. Um, <clears throat> and we've had a lot of talks today and yesterday about the uplift into RAP processes of things like making reports or your dashboards and whatnot. But I wanted to give you an example of something that we've done locally, which is a little bit different, a little bit different use case for RAP, but I think it's been really worthwhile. And my point with doing this is to give those of you who might be on an earlier stage of your RAP journey some confidence to just give stuff a try. So I would hope that at least some of you might know who the National Disease Registration Service or NDRS are, but if not, we're the body that collates and collects England's gold standard cancer data. So every person that's uh, diagnosed with cancer in England, their data is sent to us. We link that with their investigations, their, their other diagnoses, loads of information about their outcomes, for example. 
and with that, we produce England's national statistics around cancer and also contribute to international data exchanges and do a lot of research as well and support a lot of research in academia. And we also hold the congenital anomalies and rare diseases registries within the NDRS as well, but I'll talk less about that today than the cancer side. So in terms of my background, which is relevant to mention here, I'm no expert. I mean, I don't know that anyone who stood up here today has said, yes, I'm an expert, I deserve to be here. I don't either. So my background is more in veterinary medicine, epidemiology, medical statistics kind of thing in an academic sense, which means, like a lot of you, I was self-taught in R and smattering of Python and other things, but when we're self-taught, we don't necessarily know what we don't know. And our knowledge can be quite patchy, and that's a bit scary when you're entering into different uh, spheres. When I joined NDRS, um, I had not worked with SQL at all or databases. I had done minimal Java stuff and almost no dev work whatsoever. And I joined a year ago at the moment. So NDRS, we've got about 70, 50 or 70 analysts full-time analysts who have got a massive range of skills, okay? Everybody codes in something, but most people don't code in R. Um, there's a whole range of skills, and we've got some people who came from PHE when we were in Public Health England, which you'll know was disbanded during the pandemic. So we then moved into NHS Digital, and then laterally NHS Digital has been kind of Pac-Man eaten by NHS England. So we're now in the NHS England family. And that's relevant to mention, because that means we've gone through two institutional organizational changes in recent times, which is um, challenging, shall we say, in terms of when you're trying to upskill people with uh, software things. So I want to say to you that when you're starting out in your rap journey, the virtues that you have to adopt are to be selfish and to be lazy. I'm very much both of these, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So within the cancer side of things in NDRS, our data is held on the cancer analysis system, which is an Oracle SQL database. And when I joined, the way that analysts would gain access to that database was to open a tunnel on your computer first and then run an R script, okay? This R script was copied and pasted between people. Everybody had multiple copies of it all over the place. It was just sit in a folder with your, uh, with your Java driver and you'd run it and voila, you have access to the database. And I'm not here to judge anybody's legacy systems. We're all a nice smattering of legacy systems stuck together with glue and blue tack. So this system was working. Everybody was using it on a day-to-day -day basis. And there was a lot of pushback in terms of people saying, well, it's not broken, don't fix it, don't change it. But as you'll all know, I'm definitely preaching to the converted in this room, there's lots of good reasons to change this process. So it wasn't version controlled in any way. Um, nobody would put their hand up to having authored it or like they weren't sure, it was quite old. Um, and so nobody was taking ownership of it, which is relevant in that if we're going through yet more transitions, as we no doubt will at some point, there's no future proofing of a, of a script like this that's just passed around the team. The way it was used as well also encouraged people to hard code secrets into their scripts, which is a big rap no-no, and we want to avoid that wherever we can. But the benefits that upskilling could bring in this sphere were massive. So to change this process, we could get more flexibility and transparency into our workflows by putting all of our ETL and analysis and our output scripts all together, which would make very nice file structures compared to the mess that sometimes occurs at the moment. There was some performance benefits for bulk extractions we could realize if we did this, but really key to this was the one person, our colleague called, Keng, called Kong, sorry, uh, who put his hand up to say, I might have authored some of that maybe, that original R script, he was, he was about to leave. So that little bit of institutional memory that he had with him was gonna leave us. And so there was a, a, you know, a time critical issue here. So being an R coder, uh, obviously a package seems like the obvious go-to solution. I'd never built a package, never done anything like that really. And some of you will be like me in the audience, it feels quite scary, it's quite different to doing statistical analysis, it's quite different to doing all of your usual scripts work. But Kong, who was the guy who said he'd written some of that original R script, he'd done a lot more dev work than I had. He'd never written a package, but he was a much more comfortable person in that sphere. So what we did was carve out some time, dedicated time, to do this uplift process, okay? Um, and all we did was follow some of the really, really excellent tutorials and blogs that are online that can take you step by step through building a package, okay? So in a quite a short space of time, we got to the point where we had a working, minimally working, um, prototype. To, that got started using in the team. And again, being selfish is a really good idea. So I wanted to do this work. Personally, I wanted to do this work. The reason being was that, as you all know, it's really hard to carve out that 
dedicated learning time for stuff that isn't immediately applicable to the project you're doing right now. We're all doing too many things at once. And so if you can earmark a set of time, then cram as much learning into that time as you possibly can. So for me, I wanted to learn package building. I wanted to get started with unit testing, uh, conditions handling, get better at Git. I hadn't really used Git when I started with NDRS. And so I wanted to, to do that and to learn from a much better coder, Fong's a much more efficient coder than me. So peer coding could you know, give me some, some skills in that area as well. And although this last one's a bit tongue in cheek, because I do really like the day job, it is good fun. Um, when you get to a Friday and you've been working hard on the projects that, you're, that you've got to be churning out and got to be churning out, it's really, really refreshing and energizing to look away, play with a new toy. And rap for a lot of us does feel like a whole set of new toys that you find as you're talking with people in the room, for instance. And to be lazy about it, I did not want to have to come back to this work and repeat any of this learning later. So. For this earmarked time, I also wanted to pack in, like I said, peer coding, using GitHub properly. I don't think I yet use GitHub properly, but I still use it. Writing other functions. What I would suggest if you're going to do this and carve out this time is to document what you've learned while you're learning it. The reason for that is the Claire today is very different from the Claire last week. She's an idiot. She doesn't remember what any of the words mean that somebody was talking about. And so if you're documenting as you're going, you're much more likely to be able to pick that and up and, and run with it as soon as, you've, um, as soon as you've learned it. And keep notes for CPD, just I always forget to do that. It's really helpful to do. So obviously there's row bumps in the way of doing something like this. The changing infrastructure from going PHE, NHSD to NHSE is a bit of a roadblock and we've got a lot of legacy systems, a lot of legacy combinations of software and hardware that made this package quite difficult to retrofit around everybody's specific scenarios. There was a lot of quite challenging debugging happening as well. Um, but in terms of the debugging work, I tried to take that on myself. And a bit like this gorgeous, shiny, beetly thing, some of those bugs were absolutely worth their weight in gold because having to understand the processes underlying what each part of the, the script and the code was doing meant that my understanding of what was happening just came on in leaps and bounds. So however painful it was, doing the debugging work myself was really beneficial. I'd suggest that that if you're going to be working with any packages that you're not familiar with, just get involved with answering people's questions and getting into the code and debugging it, and it will really help you. So then Kong left, which was sad. He's definitely a loss to our team. Um, he didn't leave because of this. He left for other reasons um, to take up a different position. So <clears throat> in the end, that was positive because that forced me into position of being the person who was going to maintain this package and keep it going and develop it and all the rest of it, which was slightly uncomfortable to start with. But I am happy to report that since then, uh, I've had time to read Hadley Wickham's really, really good R Packages book, the second edition one. It's, it's so easily, uh, it's so readable essentially if you're a beginner. So I'd really suggest that because the package, although we're never gonna host our package on CRAN because it's, it is too locally specific, it does now pass all the formal tests that it would need to be to go into CRAN, which just means that it's all very neat and tidy. It's documented nicely and all that kind of thing. It's hosted on our organizational GitHub, which didn't exist when I started back in the day. Um, we've added to it with additional database connection functions, for example, and thanks to Tom, wherever he is, um, I engaged in a little bit of thievery, as we all did, and Tom's NHSR themes package, I have taken and modified it to be an NDRS uh, color schemes package for GG plotting as well. So that's been really useful. And this annoying, distracting little thing along the bottom was mostly just because um, these are my first quarter slides and I could. <laughs> but um, this is just a chart to show that this whole time, how much I thought I knew about what I was doing, it did increase relatively slowly. And then when I took over the package and had to help other people use it, I felt like I knew nothing to I felt like I was doing pretty well to I felt like I knew nothing. And that seesawing is, is really common. It is not something to be feared. But the pink line is showing you that throughout this process, thanks to talking to people like you, my enthusiasm for doing this work always slightly outpaced my knowledge, which meant that I was always motivated to go and find out more. And that's a really happy place to be in, essentially. So just to wrap up then, so thanks very much to Kong Chen, who now works with Genomics England. He's a really good coder. He's still very helpful. Um, he was the one, like I say, that, that wrote that initial, thinks he wrote some of that initial R script and really gave me the confidence to start up doing package work. Zara Ahmed is one of our NDRS analysts who uh, put the added connection functions into the, the package. And then thanks to Zoe and Sam who are here somewhere for all the very stupid questions they've had from me. 
The NHSE RAP group's been great. Um, I really suggest everybody gets involved. And thank you so much to my NDRS colleagues, some of whom are here today, for being really welcoming, and uh, especially the RAP group, who are letting me use them as a guinea pig for an awful lot of things. That's all I wrote. Thanks. Thank you so much, Claire. <laughs> one, one really quick question for you, if you can squeeze in an answer mm -hmm. in 30 seconds. Have you any tips on how, um, in, the, in the context of structural and organisational changes, how have you managed to keep learning art and rap going? Very selfish and I'm very lazy. <coughs> um, there's people in every team, I think, that given, given their heads, given a bit of reins, they will want to upskill themselves. Not to move on to another position necessarily, but to use that new toy to try out that new package. And I think in terms of our teams and the teams that I run, earmarking an amount of time every single week that is set in stone that people can use to play with something that might never come to fruition in, in one of your active projects. But having that headspace to play, to talk to people, to go to Coffee and Code um, is really, really helpful. And so in terms of the organizational change, we've gone through a lot. We've got staff who are within Public Health England and they've been Analysts doing similar types of work for a very long time. Changing the minds and hearts there can be quite tricky. But if you come to it with the enthusiasm, of, oh, look at this cool thing I can do. I can make pots and quarter. You know, generally speaking, that's a bit infectious. And I think bolstering that's really helpful. Fantastic. Thanks again, Thank Claire. You. Next up, Joseph Wilson. Joseph Wilson, who's going to be talking to us about using GitHub Actions to release the potential of RAP. Okay, um, so hi there, I'm Joe. Um, I am a data scientist at uh, NHS England, and I am part of the um, RAP squads, um, uh, as uh, Chris has been um, talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, GitHub Actions and how we've used that to... Um, uh, release our website, the RAP Community of Practice, and how we've automated that. Excellent, it's working. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So, essentially, um, the, the flow of this uh, presentation will go through the sort of the why, the what, the how, the what, the how, and the yay, um, as it works. Um, so, um, why, why should you be paying attention and not uh, having a pre-lunch snooze during this presentation? Um, so you might be looking for inspiration for a project, so hopefully I might be able to spark something in you, um, even if it's not to get up actions. Um, you might want to start using automation in your project um, and, and embedding that in, into your project. Um, I'm going to get a little bit technical going on um, in this presentation and um, hopefully you can learn something interesting about Git and GitHub Actions, um, and also maybe learn from and be amused by my mistakes as I blunder through this. So, uh, the RAP community practice. Um, uh, so this, this it ends up with our website, um, which is nice and is, is online, and I'll share a link in the chat later. Um, but essentially, what we do is we first of all uh, develop it on a private repository. Nice out of sight, somewhere nice and safe. This is just so we can be nice and secure um, and, and we can, you know, we can make our spending mistakes and stuff like that without showing it to the world. Um, then what we do is when we're all ready and we've got a load of like new pages ready to be released is we copy over our changes to a public repository which is available for everyone to, uh, to view. Um, and then we use a package called mkdocs which is Think is a bit like Quarto um, to basically uh, uh, build and deploy our websites. So what's the problem statement? The existing process we had was very manual and that's not the wrap way. Um, so we're the wrap squads and we preach that say gold wrap uh, you should have continuous integration to comp continuous deployment in your uh, in your projects and if we're doing a manual process that doesn't look very good for us. Um, so you can see here that it's sort of in the middle, there's this big block here uh, that is all manual stuff where we're like pulling down the code, copy and pasting it across and pushing it up. We also had an existing action in place developed by uh, someone who was in the team before me. Um, and, and that was an existing action that would use the MK doc stuff to build our website. So what's the solution? I mean, you probably can guess. It is uh, GitHub Actions. 
Um, so GitHub Actions, as a bit of background, it allows you to run automated workflows on your Git, uh, GitHub repository. Um, so it's useful for this continuous integration, continuous deployment. You can run custom code within an action, or there's like a marketplace of pre-used, uh, so, uh, pre-developed actions. Um, so one I use is the checkout action, um, and another one is like the Python uh, action, which sets up a Python environment. There's loads of equivalents out there. So you might have heard of Jenkins or GitLab CI. Um, so there, there are other stuff out there. You don't have to use this in your own project. So what's the proposed solution? I'm sorry, there's, there's this big Git flow diagram. I'll share the slides. You can have a look at this in uh, detail later. But essentially, um, what I want to do is create three new actions. So the first action was to push changes from our private repository to public. I'm going to say private and public a lot today. Um, then we'll have an action that would uh, create a pull request and manually sort of check, and we, so, we, so we can manually check everyone was okay before we like committed. Um, and then finally, once we had released everything, we would, it would automatically create a release note for us. So just automating a little um, admin task for us. Um, I built this all with like test repositories that were like effectively forked of each other. So they had like very similar Git histories. Um, and I developed this all very, very locally and sort of manually prototyped it out before moving into uh, in, in like an action file and um, solved quite a lot of the problems there, but also had to solve a lot of problems with the GitHub action um, uh, itself. So how does it work? This is going to be the bit of the technical bit. Um, don't worry that if you can't read the code there, again, I'm sort of demonstrating kind of what it looks like. Um, but essentially, you can set these actions up to like run on a trigger. So we, uh, it looked for either a manual trigger, so we can click a button and say run this. But most often, it looks for a published release on our private repository. So we do a release there, and it would manually trigger this. It would use a Ubuntu VM to, to run this. Um, just Ubuntu is, is, is nice to sort of um, write code on. It's nice and simple. And it will check if we're in the right repository. Um, so we check when the private repository. That's because um, we didn't want to run again in the public one when we do the release there, because it will just keep releasing to itself and go on forever and ever. Not ideal. Um, what we do is we would check out the repository, and we use this checkout action that I talked about earlier. Um, this this action has like a couple of like inputs you can pass to it. So I pass to it. A, a token. So you know when you set up Git, you have to like have a token on your system, a personal access token, so you can you can talk to GitHub. Um, so I had to I had to create a custom token for this with extended privileges. Git is very good. Uh, GitHub is very good. It creates a token for you, but it's very narrowly scoped. And I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And also I had to make sure to fetch the fetch the complete history. So something you might not um, be fully aware of Git and Git repositories is you'll have this um, remote, um, remote repository. So we, it'll be the URL from, from like GitHub or something like that. And it's usually called origin. And it's, that's called alias. You can actually add multiple of those. So you can have quite a lot. Um, I think that's from the days when like you didn't have GitHub and stuff like that. So you would basically share between your coworkers' computers. So you would have an alias for Tom's uh, repository and Derek's uh, repository, and you can sort of share like that. Um, uh, but now we've got GitHub, it's, it's way better. Um, so I'll add the public repository as additional remotes. Then I'll do some stuff with some GitHub CLI, really nice command line interface for GitHub. Um, and it basically just reads some stuff. It would, it would set some stuff up like the release branch name. And then it would create the release branch and it'll push up to both. So this is why it's called push. It'll just push up to both. I'm going to commit a little bit. Oh, I should know. This wrong slide. OK. Um, so, uh, so the biggest learning points from this. So I had to go and like work out how it worked with GitHub Actions and, and work out how things were working. So as I mentioned earlier, is, is something about the fetch depth. So I had to set the fetch depth to get the whole history of the repository. By default, the Actions checkout defaults to one, which means it gets the most recent commits. Um, and this is great. It's lightweight. It gets the only information you need to add on additional commits. So it's great if you're like building off that. 
However, we're doing a merge. We're, we're, we're releasing and merging into a different repository. We need to get the whole history because we need to know the past and how that fits together. Um, I also talked a bit about um, uh, action tokens, uh, access tokens. So yeah, Git is, uh, GitHub Actions is really good. It does it with default stuff it sets up for you. So nice, it's, it's quite nice, but it's not very nice when you want to do something slightly different like accessing another repository. So I had to work out and sort of dig through the documentation about how I could get it to use that access token um, and how I can get it to sort of hold on to that access token. It took a while, but I eventually got there. And you can have a look and see how, how it works in the, in the code. Um, and then I had to work out this thing about, okay, how can I add another remote? How can I push to multiple repositories? Um, and how can I, and, and yeah, how I can add them and work with that. Oh yeah, so there's other, some other actions that I had. So this is the create release uh, pull request. So if you want to have a look at the codes, this is really interesting to look at because um, you can um, look at how GitHub CLI works and how you can like automatically populate a pull request. Um, you got the create release, um, which is a great example of like how you can manu like the granularity of how actions can be triggered. So this is triggered when a merge request is closed, but is also merged. So it's very granular. Um, and also page de build deployment. So this is a great example of uh, how you can use MK Docs to deploy websites. Um, and also it's a great example of how you can like set up a Python environment or I think there are some really good examples of how you can set up an R environment and run R code in GitHub Actions. Um, so for example, if you wanted to run tests on your repository. So we adopted it, it worked perfectly, the end. Thank you very much, um, unfortunately not. It was not the end. Um, I didn't fully understand the problem space. Um, the, the solution works. It works for a different situation, a different problem. So it might work for you, but just doesn't work for us. So what was the new problem statement? The commit histories were completely different. So I had been, remember earlier when I talked about the, the testing repositories had, were effectively like kind of forks of each other. Ours weren't. Because of the way we had been manually deploying it before, we had been getting rid of the commit history. And Git is smart, but it's dumb smart. And it, it, we can look at the repositories and go, oh right, these are the differences, the lines changed here. Git cares about how things have changed, not how things are. So because we've been scrubbing the, way, the, the information of how things have changed, it couldn't reconcile that. Um, so, so we had to come at it again. We had some options, but none of them would really work particularly well. Um, so we decided to like sort of take a slight step back and re-engineer the process. So what did we change? We just changed one action, which was the push one that I talked about earlier, and we changed it to copy. So we basically um, replicated the manual process in GitHub Actions, which is quite, what quite a lot of the stuff you would automate do. You just do what you do manually, but just code it. Um, um, I feel that like this solution is, is, is less elegant, but it works, so I'm not complaining. Um, and it, it's more secure, so any mistakes in the Git history are erased when we're, because we're just taking the latest cut, and that means we've got a fetch depth of one. So, uh, what, how does this action work? We've got like, quite a lot of similarity, so same triggers and conditions that trigger it. Um, however, we, instead of adding both repositories and remotes, we check out both repositories in their own folder. So like you would do with, with two different repositories on your own system, we check them out into their own folders. And we put one in the private and one in the public. We do the same stuff as like reading the GitHub, uh, using the GitHub CLI to create a release branch and, and read it and read the release name. Um, and then we do some stuff with, you know, saving the release branch and sending that to the public, uh, the private repository, um, just so we've got like a record in case stuff goes wrong, we can, we know where the release is and we can resume it. But the important thing we do here is in private, we delete the Git history. So we no longer got Git repository, we just got a load of, of new stuff or new documentation that we want to move. But it hasn't got a history with, attached with it. And then in the other one, we keep the Git folder and we delete everything else. 
Um, we could just copy everything over and just paste it on top, but if we wanted to remove stuff in a release, that wouldn't happen. So we delete everything to remove everything and just put the latest version over the top of it. Um, and then it's copied over, it's done, and then we create a release branch and then commit it and push it up. And it appears on our public repository. Did it work? It works. So on Monday, um, I got it to work. So we re released version um, 1.5.0 of the website on Monday. And apart from a out-of-date token um, that I accidentally used, it worked perfectly. So I, I gave it a, a updated token, and it, it, it works lovely. Um, and it was so nice to have it work because it just made the process so much faster and less fiddly. Um, it wasn't a chore, it was just a, like a quick little admin task. I should write a release note, which I quite enjoy actually. So what's next? Um, the way I've written it, it's, it's written for the uh, rap community practice. I need to rewrite it so it's a bit more drag and drop into your, like, your own repository. Um, and, and easier to reuse and make it like a nice package. However, you can go to this like QR code. I promise it's not going to rickroll you. Um, and uh, it, it should take you there. It's, I've written some documentation there where it goes into more detail about how this works so you can learn about how the, the action works and how it functions. Um, and, but you can just copy and paste it and just change the URLs and make sure um, it's, it's set up correctly and it should work for you. And also you can nick the other reactions I've got there, like feel free to steal them. Um, I want to do like explore other things like incorporating checks and like linting um, and tests into a process. So like when you make a pull request, run tests and run lints to make sure the pull request is a good state. Um, convert it to work on GitLab. So we have a internal GitLab um, uh, instance, um, which is, is nice and secure. Um, but when we want to publish code in the open, and after we've gone through like the check-in process to make sure it's all happy to be released, um, automating that process and sort of pushing it out to GitHub where we can display it for everyone to have a look at um, uh, would be good to automate as well and be really, really useful for our analytical teams. And also, what's next? Your ideas. What, what do you think you can do with GitHub Actions and what do you think you can do with uh, with, with the stuff I talked about today. Um, if you're thinking, oh, that's nice, um, but uh, I think it's very interesting, but I have no idea where to get started. Uh, hopefully, me and my colleague Harriet are going to be running a workshop sometime soon, um, maybe in November, on GitHub Actions, where we're going to take you through writing some actions in, in GitHub and, and get you going with that so it can help build your confidence. So look out for that. Uh, hopefully that's coming soon. Um, yeah. Um, to wrap up, uh, yeah, is uh, you got, I'll, I'll share these slides, uh, so don't worry. Um, but you've got a link there to the wrap release process documentation and the GitHub Actions documentation is worth having looked through as well. There's loads of stuff that I haven't even touched. Um, and uh, yeah, check out the wrap community of practice because it's great and we keep um, shouting about it. Um, and I think people are hopefully listening. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. One really quick question for you. Lots of questions racking up on, on the Slack channel for you to go and have a look at, please. But one really quick question that lots of people want to know the answer to is how do you make your Git flow diagrams? Um, so I make them on um, Draw.io. Um, and it's just a really nice online tool, um, and it's got Git flow diagram as like a setting, so you can like pull those in. Um, it's very nice. Um, I guess I'm using it. Okay. Fantastic. Once again, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Charlie Pinder with two letters to strike fear into your hearts. The QA of analytical projects. Thanks very much, lovely to be here. Thank you for being so welcoming uh, to non-NHS people. There's a few UKHSA people here today, so uh, thanks for having us along. Um, I was also really pleased yesterday to hear that Brian quoted Johanna Hutchinson, who used to be in uh, one of our directors in UKHSA, 
about the importance of um, sharing good practice. So that's what my talk is about. And lots of the things that I'm going to talk about, I'm also pleased to say that um, some of the previous speakers have mentioned, but hopefully what my talk will do, and I'll share the slides afterwards in Slack, will uh, bring some uh, QA considerations together in one easily digestible uh, set of slides. Um, and following the trend, I wrote my slides in quarto, which uh, very helpfully gives you a nice table of contents. Um, I did find it quite difficult to put enough cat gifts in, but I think there's going to be a talk later that's going to service all your cat gift needs, so I've restrained myself to emojis today. Um, and so let's have some warm-up quotes. Just think about why do we even need quality assurance in the first place? So this is um, Richard Feynman, who uh, was a theoretical American physicist, um, and he's really emphasising the fact that no matter how brilliant you are, um, it's really easy to make mistakes. And data science, data analytics, it's difficult, it's easy to make mistakes. And so what we need to do is set up QA in a way that protects people from uh, making those mistakes and catching them as early as possible. The other really interesting thing about Richard Feynman uh, is that he was instrumental in investigating the, the space shuttle Challenger disaster in the 1980s. Um, and it's really worth looking on YouTube to see he did a live experiment to demonstrate to NASA that some of their assumptions around the risks of um, components failing weren't quite correct. Um, so that's worth a look. Uh, and also Margaret Hamilton, um, another uh, space scientist. So she wrote lots of the code about uh, for the Apollo moon landing. Um, and she really emphasized that failure is an essential part of the learning process. And I think it was Chris yesterday who talked about we need to be able to um, encourage people to experiment, which also um, means giving them the psychological safety that they can experiment, they can make mistakes, and these are not going to be disastrous because we'll put processes in place so they don't impact the final quality of um, all the good work that we do. So uh, what exactly is quality assurance? So essentially, it's a set of activities that we carry out to ensure our, our work is fit for purpose. So does it answer the question? Does it help the person that asked the question in the first place um, to understand uh, what the answer is against um, certain standards? So reproducibility, um, we've heard lots about that. It's very exciting. So that's kind of um, one of the first steps. Um, we also need things to be auditable. So I think it was you and yesterday who was talking about that they published a whole repo of their decisions and, um, and assumptions around their work. So that's really interesting. So you know uh, who made what decisions when. It helps you understand the whole process. So for example, deciding what method to use um, is a really important part of um, showing your working out so that you can actually end up with good assured work. Um, and quality assurance is all about effective risk management. Um, and, it's, and to re-emphasize, it's not just about checking your outputs or reviewing your code. It's um, about having a credible end-to-end -end approach all the way from start to finish to make sure that your work is fit for purpose. And make sure that when you are displaying your outputs to anyone, then you, then you communicate the remaining uncertainty and risk. Um, and the duck book's already been mentioned. Out of interest, how many people had already heard of the duck book before the speaker this morning? Hands up. OK, a few of you. So it's really worth looking at as a really practical, hands-on guidance to thinking about how you um, QA code. Um, and, it, and it draws on the principles of the Aqua book. Has anyone heard of the Aqua book before? A few people. So. Um, this is the, the key government guidance around quality assurance. It's quite a high level, it's quite a large document, um, and it is being updated, so um, you don't necessarily go have to read it all. Uh, the, the duck book's the more practical end of it, but it was essentially set up because uh, in, in the early 2012, I think, um, the government ran a, um, a train franchise competition, which subsequently had to be cancelled and reran because it was found that the quality assurance processes uh, within that competition were insufficient and, and actually uh, it, it was so, the, pol the quality of the guidance that had been issued was so poor that they had to rerun it, so it cost an awful lot of money, uh, which kick-started an interest in, uh, in appropriate guidance. Uh, and so some brief words about the UKHSA. Um, if you don't know who we are, we are the Health Security Agency. Um, and we prepare for, prevent, and respond to health threats. 
Um, I've put a link to our strategic plan, but essentially it's preparing, so we're, we're ready for future health security hazards and monitoring constantly. Um, we're ready to respond and, and save lives and reduce harm as much as possible. And we also um, build the UK's health security capacity through um, developing data and research. And so obviously embedded in all of those, we need to think about um, data science quality assurance. Um, and then a few key QA challenges around um, analytics, QA and health. As lots of speakers have mentioned, we have to work at pace. So we, we work with lots of incident responses, for example, the MPOX outbreak. So you're working with lots of data from different sources, varying data quality. Um, and we really emphasize a key part of QA is proportionality. So the amount of QA that you do needs to be proportional to the risk, but also to the resources you've got on hand. So it may be the case that you don't do all of the quality checks that you wish you had time for, but as long as you're transparent about that, and perhaps when you have more time, you go back and, and do those checks, then that's, that's totally fine in, in the context of um, rapid responses. Um, and we also have this tension between the, there's, there's, not, there's no one size fits all QA because it is proportional. Um, and the, the experts are very much the people working on the analysis. So it's hard to standardize that, but there's still a bit of a need for that. And again, I'd encourage you to go and look at the duck book for some really helpful principles um, and checklists there. Um, and I guess similarly to all of you, we have to work with diverse platforms, lots of different coding standards, lots of different languages, lots of different skills. So bringing that all together in one is always a bit of a challenge. Um, and I think we've heard a, a few uh, similar things about health data challenges. So I guess the key things for us are about ownership and responsibilities, data quality issues, all the different systems we have to interact with, even accessing the data in the first place. Um, and we recently published um, a data strategy to try and deal with some of those issues. So um, I've got the link in the slides for that as well. So what does my team actually do? So this is our mission. We work collaboratively with data scientists and modelers and beyond to embed QA best practices. So we don't do the QI ourselves. We are not the experts. We help other people to solve their problems. Um, and some of the principles, we always try and make iterative improvements to our, to our outputs. We try and work as transparently as possible. I think it's fair to say that we are behind the NHS in terms of open sourcing our work, but we try and work in a source as much as possible. So we publish everything that we do in Confluence. Um, we do lots of collaboration. Uh, we think about Pokeyoke, which is a really interesting um, quality principle from Japanese car manufacturing in the 80s, uh, when they discovered like the really the worst time to discover a quality issue with your car is after you've delivered it to the customer. And really much the very best time to find it is right at the beginning when the little widget got manufactured wrong. So it's the idea that you try and stop um, as much as possible or, or prevent or fix or at least flag up mistakes as early as possible in every process. Uh, and we also do dog fooding. So I think Pavel mentioned that yesterday. So uh, we eat our own dog food. We, check, we use the uh, practices and processes and tools that we encourage data scientists to use just to make sure that they are fit for purpose. And I was also pleased earlier that someone uh, mentioned the combi behavior model, uh, model of behavior change. So that's something that we also use. Uh, so we assume that QA behavior is more likely to happen by improving capability, opportunity, and tools. Uh, sorry, including tools and motivation. So we talk a lot about QA culture. So very briefly about cookie cutters. I think Parisa talked about cookie cutters earlier as well. So essentially it stamps out a pre-baked a pre project setup from project templates. So you've got a common project structure, including a place to put your QA work in or log your QA work. And it makes it much easier to do collaboration and for people to figure out what's going on in your code. Um, and there's also QA features, including pre-commit that was also mentioned earlier, um, MB stripper and uh, peer review templates. So we encourage people to do peer review of their code. Uh, so it eases QA and collaboration and not only other people will thank you, but future you will thank you. When you go back to code that you haven't looked at for some time, you'll be very pleased with yourself that you uh, did it in a standardized way so you can remember how to redo it. And our UKHSA version is actually installable with one click as a GitHub template. So we recognize that not everyone's happy working on the command line. So we did a version that's installable with one click. Uh, I'm just going to speed through these. So uh, we talk about culture 
uh, change, which is, is quite difficult and slow, but we try and talk about QA and enthuse people about it a lot. So uh, hackathons here. Um, again, think about QA at the start. It will solve a lot of your problems. Um, we talk about it at different levels and, and right end to end across the quality stakeholders, but all the way from data creation to outputs and stats production. A couple of future things we're thinking about. So we're always doing iterative improvement to our resources. So we have a draft analytics QA framework that we're currently um, working with people to make sure it's fit for use, uh, improving our cookie cutter, thinking about how we can automate QA as much as possible to relieve that burden on busy people, and thinking about how we QA generative AIs. Uh, thank you for listening. There's some resources. I'll put the slides in the Slack chat. Happy to answer questions there as well. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Charlie Binder. You've already answered my question, which was going to be uh, about the link for the slides. Um, there are a couple of questions now popping up on the, on the Slack channel. First of all, as part of the QA process, is it useful to have a set of QA forms for analysts to complete for different tasks? Yeah, yes, that, so that's something that we've been working with our stats production colleagues, um, and it's something that's available. There are some um, examples from other government departments available um, on, the, on the government gateway. Um, I think the issue is, is that a lot of them are in Excel and, and a little bit clunky to fill in, so that's one of the things that we're looking at um, for our future work, is how do we integrate um, those, those uh, checks and recording those logs is very important to do that, but how do we fit that in with people's workflows to make it much more likely that it will actually happen? Fantastic. As somebody's asked, asked, it would be interesting to see the LLM QA work. Is there somewhere where that art's available to look at? Uh, that's very much early days, so we're trying to, as, as a lot of other people are also trying to work this puzzle out, so very happy to link you up with um, the uh, the various networks that we know that are talking about it. Do you know of any other organizations that have a dedicated QA team, or are you unique? Uh, well, as part of our responsibilities as an arm's length body from DHSE, we, we report to their, their modeling oversight committee. So they have, uh, but they, they have a slightly different structure in that the analytical leaders are embedded in their teams. So uh, I don't actually off the top of my head. If you know of one, please let me know. I'll be delighted to chat to them. Is the draft QA analytics framework going to be specifically for UK HSA, or is it going to be more widely available? Uh, so it is specifically for UK HSA. So it's to take the, the principles of the ACRA book and all of the other um, quality checks that happen across the agency and bring them together in a hopefully easy to use format. Um, I would love it if we could publish it at some point in the future. So once it's approved, I will be uh, attempting to get that happening. But I'm happy to share a draft if, um, I, yeah, just ping me in Slack. Fantastic. So thank you again, Dr. Charlie Pender. Give her a round of applause. Next up, I don't think Chris needs any introduction, does he? Thanks. Sorry, it's me again. <coughs> um, just again, with had a talk drop out, so we've just got a couple of uh, little things that we want to do. So I'm going to do them in order so I don't mess it up. So Charlie and Dan, do you want to just come up? So I just said Charlie and Dan, sorry. Mary and Dan. Um, Mary, do you want to just talk about the um, the GitHub thing first? Uh, oh, you've got a mic. Oh, excellent. I didn't realize you could have a mic. Uh, and then we'll do the other thing. The GitHub thing that you just said. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary. I'm Manuel. I'm joined with by Dan Schofield. Um, we're from the NHS Python community. We're really, really happy to be joint hosting the event today. We wanted to say that all the links for all the presentations and the GitHub repos will be available after the event on the NHS PyCon GitHub. So it will be the central place to find everything. Excellent, thank you. So I think Dan, in that time, has made a big white rectangle. Is that good? Brilliant. Yeah. Hopefully you can all hear me as well. Yeah, okay, a... uh, Mary, do you want to give a bit of background on the NHS Python community just very quickly before we carry on? Yes, sorry, I'm also Mike, so I have not As you can see, this is very impromptu. So, um, so the NHS Python community is a community of practice that champions Python and open code. I consider it the sister community to the NHS R community. And we're up here today because we have a really, really exciting 
new sort of research that we want to do, and this is going to be a very short interactive sort of session. So I'm going to hand it off to Dan to just talk a little bit about what we want to do. Thank you, Mary. Um, you may have seen not just one QR code in front of you, but six on a piece of paper. So everyone on your tables, a little bit of action here, see if you can find it. What we are announcing is, as part of the community, we're going to run a hackathon. And actually, it's going to be focused on large language models. So Charlie very kindly introduced us some of the challenges of large language models and QA. And that's going to be one of the things we're thinking about. But actually, I'm not announcing the hackathon. I'm announcing a survey for ideas for the hackathon from the community. So behind that link is a survey that we'd like you to fill in. Um, there's a few minutes now, maybe, that you could do it within. I don't know. Who knows? Um, and if you go through there, you'll find that we're just taking things, a few personal details, email, et cetera. And there's a few questions about how you can give ideas that might be useful for the hackathon. Um, there's also, if you want to feel, hear more about the hackathon itself, there's an opportunity to do that within it as well. So yeah, it's just a really short announcement. We'd love to get knowledge from the room, ideas, problems, challenges, and you can put it through that survey, which I designed, so any complaints should come directly to me. Uh, thanks. Um, oh, it's on, sorry, it's on. Um, Just yeah, switch back. Good. Oh, I'll just leave, I'll just leave um, it up. I did queue a couple of people up to do something in this time, but actually, we've, we've had enough time, so that's fine. So apologies for all the people that have hassled them, right? Because you, 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 I can now stand you down. Right. Um, so I'm now going to hand you back the chair. I am now late for my own on conference session because I was doing this. So if anybody wants to follow me to the next on conference session, which is all about um, NHSR and NHS PyCom and e branding and NHS Plus and all the stuff I was saying yesterday, then please do follow me. Um, otherwise, I shall hand you back to your chair. Thanks, Chris. So next up, we've got Katie Thornton, who's Hi. bringing to you developing a re reproducible regular report, exploring delayed discharges in mental health. Yeah, I guess I'm just bringing you the longest title of any talk here. Um, so I. Uh, so, hi, I'm Katie, and I'm in the North Eastern Yorkshire Analytics team in NHS England. Um, and today, yeah, I'm coming to talk to you about developing reproducible regular reports in our delayed discharges in mental health, which is a really long title, and the most important part of that is reproducible. Um, the point is making reports that are reproducible. So... For a little bit of context, um, Will mentioned earlier this morning that our team has gone on a little bit of a journey over the past couple of years. So two years ago, as a team, R was just a letter in the alphabet. Nobody used R in our team at all. And then sort of over, the, over well, up to the last, to up to a year ago, there was a handful of us that went on a fabulous training course run by the NHSR community. Um, Zoe organized it and it was great. And we brought it back to the team and said, this is something we really want to do um, on, a, on a larger scale. So we got some stakeholder buy-ins and when we got the stakeholders on board and they loved the reporting, we then got the senior leadership team on board and we were able to upskill the whole team. And now two years on, R has become the default sort of software that we use for all of our reporting. So this report that I developed, um, the scoping for it was around about a year ago, so where we just got a few people using R and we were planning on bringing on board the whole team. Um, so the report was around mental health. Mental health is one of the topic areas that I support and there was a big um, amount of drive around a 100-day discharge challenge. Um, so what that is, is trying to stop patients that are clinically ready for discharge um, being stuck in hospitals when they should be getting moved on into more suitable environments. And the whole point of the report was to look at the reasons driving these delays for discharge. Um, so is it due to a lack of suitable facilities? Is it funding? Is it patient choice? Um, what are the reasons driving it? Where are these blockages occurring? And can we free up some space for the patients um, and relieve some of the pressures on sort of urgent care and on sort of out of area placements, that type of thing? So the, the thing around the report was we have 11 um, mental health providers. So the stakeholders really wanted to see all the 11 providers um, that we cover as a region, also regional breakdown, 
They wanted to look at how it had changed over time. They also wanted to look at the sort of recent snapshots and they wanted it to be refreshed on a regular basis. So from all that, um, because I was sort of really engaging with R at the time and we were really moving towards um, using R, um, that was what we wanted to look at. So we decided to produce the report in R, which would allow us to have a report that was quick and easy to refresh. We could sort of do it once and share it, which is sort of the real message of this talk, do it once and share it. Um, and, you know, we had other benefits. Um, the visualizations are really nice. Instead of having a PowerPoint presentation that's going to be 50 odd slides long because we're showing a chart for every single provider, we can have a nice HTML format that um, sort of is a lot more condensed and a lot more accessible. And we really did get a lot of um, positive feedback from the stakeholders, really great engagement. Everybody really loves these types of reports. And now it's something that we do as a team on a really regular basis. Most of our new reports that we're refreshing on a regular basis, we're doing in sort of the R environment. So what I really wanted to share with you all today is some of the sort of simple features, or relatively simple compared to some of the things that have been shared, um, that we have in our model code that we're sort of chopping out and we're throwing into most of our reports. Um, and one of those is Plotly drop-down charts. Um, so because we have a lot of providers, as I said, we've got 11 for mental health. If we're looking at sort of acute providers, we've got 23. Um, something that we're using a lot is these drop-down charts. Uh, I know there's quite a few people with R that are very GG plot. We're very plotly, we like the interactive features. Um, and these drop-down charts are great um, because they enable us to get sort of essentially 13 charts in one space. We're getting the interactivity of a dashboard, but we can package it all up and email it out to our stakeholders and they've got it in their inbox right in front of their face, which they all seem to love. Um, so yeah, so I am sharing the code and I really apologize if anyone can't see this because I've been sat at the back and I realize that the code is very small. Um, but the way that we've done this is uh, to create a function. Um, there's two steps. The top step you do once, and then the bottom step you do for every single chart that you want to do. Um, but the top step, you create a function that sort of scrapes the values from, the ta uh, from whatever table it is you're wanting to plot in the chart, um, and then it formats into the buttons of a dropdown. Um, this is a piece of code that I'll be honest, I pinched from Stack Overflow. In fact, I think Alistair pinched it from Stack Overflow. Um, but it is a really, really simple way of doing these drop-down charts, which otherwise can be really cumbersome. Um, there is another way of doing it, and it is really long and really very code-heavy. And this is really easy, and you can do it over and over again in every single report that you use. And you can give it to someone with very limited R knowledge and say, stick this in your report, and you'll get a nice drop-down box. Um, the bottom part is just a standard sort of plotly chart, and you add in the transform section where you then link that to the drop-down that you've created. And again, you add it in the bottom. I don't know if anyone can see, um, but you add the, um, the layout and you get the up -down, update menus. So you get your, your menus box. And that is something that, yeah, we're using on a really regular basis and has, has landed really well. Um, another aspect of the delayed discharges report that's landed really well is our DT tables. Um, there's lots and lots of different types of R tables out there, um, probably more than I'm aware of, and they all have very different benefits. The reason we like this one um, is because we're able to do a lot of the NHS branding. So we've got the, the really nice blue color. It's also very easy um, to do sort of rag rating and flagging. Um, so that's, that's another aspect of it. And in terms of the code, I don't know if anyone can see this, um, but again, it's very, very simple to adopt. Um, so we've got three steps in this one, but the top step is really just a case of taking your table, um, table names, uh, your column names from your table and calling them header names, creating a header style. So in this case, we've got the NHS blue background, we've got the white font and we've got a nice font size. And then the step two is building a container, um, which is sort of a, a different way of thinking, or it's certainly a different way to how I would normally think. 
but then we're putting that header um, into the container and then eventually uh, in step three where we build a DT table, we then put that table into the container and we get that nice NHS branding in a really neat table that everybody really seems to, to appreciate. Um, and it's quite simple and it's easy to just sort of replicate and share with colleagues, particularly people that haven't got huge technical skills. Uh, so that's that one. And the last thing that I really wanted to talk about is sharing of code. So I've developed a code bank and we're sharing it sort of inter internally as a team. And we're pulling out chunks of code for all the different types of report. This mental health report has formed the basis of lots of other reports that we do. Um, people sort of strip bits out and build them into their own reports. But the other thing is we work as part of a region um, so we are one of seven regions in NHS England and it's something that I know Simon bangs on about quite a lot but we should be able to do all these things once and share them across all the regions. We're all working on the same topic areas, you know, we're all looking at the same types of things, we're looking at waiting lists, we're looking at activity, um, we're looking at sort of UAC, ambulance waiting times, all that type of thing. So why are we not sharing our code more? Why are we not creating code that we can distribute between ourselves and connect more. It's a big time investment developing a new report in R. It's a lot more labor intensive, sort of getting off the bat um, to do something in R than it is to do it in sort of Excel or PowerPoint. We all know it's quicker, but investing that time in developing sort of something really interactive and engaging in R, and then if we can share it, and we can cut down the analytical time and do things once and get sort of seven reports back for the one we send out, then it's going to be really beneficial. Um, so yeah, in terms of sharing it more widely, it is really simple. It's those two sections of code. It's declare a region, and then it is filter on that region that you have declared. Um, so it's definitely something that, yeah, we should be doing a lot more of. Um, to preempt any questions, the code snippets I've shared aren't actually on GitHub, but I will put them on there um, in case anyone hasn't been able to see them today. Um, but yeah, I guess that's everything from me. Any questions? Thank you so much, Katie. We have a couple of questions for you very quickly. Um, first of all, all, have you had come across any accessibility issues with using Plotly and DT outputs and how have you addressed them? Um, so we do think quite a bit about accessibility in our team. I know the report that um, Will shared earlier, we have um, developed our own sort of template for NHS, uh, for our region um, based on sort of the NHS website. So we do have sort of the light grey background, we've got acceptable fonts uh, and we tr do try and have a good font size. In terms of Plotly itself, I think it's more accessible than other sort of plotting, um, like ggplot and things, because of you've got the hover over um, functionality of it. So, you know, people that are not great at reading charts, they can hover over and they can get the data from there, they see the numbers. But also you've got sort of zooming features and things like that that make it a little bit more user-friendly. Um, I guess in terms of engagement, it's more about making sure that stakeholders know how to use the additional features of your Plotly chart. Um, so we do spend a lot of time, you know, communicating with our stakeholders and explaining how everything works, um, because then they can sort of take it and run with it. Great. Also, you mentioned that uh, your whole team have now gone over to R. We have, yeah. What were they using before? So it was a lot of Excel, it was PowerPoint, it was SQL, uh, so we did have some SQL knowledge in there. And we also had some Tableau as well, um, which we still do use those things. Um, we tend to use Excel and PowerPoint for fast turnarounds. We're a regional team, so we do work on big projects, but we also have, we want this data and we want it yesterday. Um, so yeah, yeah, we do still use those tools and um, Tableau is great if you've got a dashboard that someone's gonna be accessing on a daily basis. But something like my mental health report, they're accessing it once a month. There's no point me hosting a dashboard every day of the week when the data's getting updated once a month. Did, did you find that difference in backgrounds was a challenge for when it came to uh, developing training for the team? It is a challenge, um, but I think the big benefit was upskilling the team as a whole. So everyone has been able to rely on one another. We've set up um, chats in the team. We've basically got our own little network 
So we have a group chat, we have our own little drop-in session, we go to um, Simon and Alex's drop-in session, pretty much as a whole team, and everyone supports one another. It, it helps with team bonding as well, especially when now we're mostly remote. Great, cool. Fantastic, thank you again, Katie Thornton. Next up, do we have Chen Kim? Presenting on the topic of enhancing analytics by moving from Excel to Python. Hi, my name is Chen Kim. Today I'm coming here to introduce my personal story that I moved uh, from Excel to Python. Yeah, it's a past experience until up to this uh, June. So yeah, I'm currently working as a junior data scientist at NHS at the new NHS England, I'm based in London. Before I started my career at NHS, yeah, I thought I knew Excel. Throughout my school days and then industry experience, uh, still I couldn't really uh, think about, yeah, re recall that I had if I had uh, specific difficulties on the Excel things, uh, even though I didn't actually have a class for Excel or I didn't have any teacher who's going to be teaching me about the Excel things. But surprisingly, when I joined my team, uh, and then when I see the Power Pivot model uh, that deployed by my senior uh, data analyst in my team, I was a bit struggling. I mean, that was a clearly a uh, big struggle understanding how it works, and then, yeah, that moment I clearly remember. It became uh, getting better and better, and then now I'm understanding more about that part because I learned about the domain knowledge, and then also I learned more about the Excel side. I worked on the three main projects. Uh, in my first year, and then here I like to illustrate that how my skill sets has been spread out yeah, across the each project. Uh, the project A and B is using the Python code, while the project C was required to program in R. Uh, but I spent uh, about 50% uh, using Excel to pre-processing or some time discussion, yeah, making a table for raising up my issues and making a thing in Excel. So because uh, it's uh, taking 50% of my working hours, I was thinking, okay, it's the real time uh, to confess uh, I had underestimated the power of the Excel and its usefulness. At the same time, I was coming across, what if or how about if I could uh, program uh, that to be optimized in Python, which is a preferred language uh, of me. My Excel use was uh, nearly zero during my master's study in data science. That's uh, because I should mention the reason is because I was likely use uh, the robust academic data set, and then the data set, the other data, the other types of data set I was interested in were not just fit in Excel. So I didn't really use the, I didn't really have to visit the Excel for that job. It was okay for the CSFI to directly load into my script and then I had no problem. So that might be just because my personal story that I didn't really have a chance to familiar myself to use data processing in Excel. While the NHS that I am given access to are the tabular format that having a rows for the observations and then columns for the features and then yeah, that simply fit into the spreadsheet. I put three ways of working in a team. Uh, Top-down assignment is usually given to me with the justifications and the project requirements with the uh, due date. And then the bottom-up, yeah, the tasks are normally the things that I like to carry on for the long-term uh, development uh, of the product or something that I like to raise up yeah, from my side. Something like, uh, for example, if I can say there was already a Python code ready for me when I joined my team, uh, and my team's expectation to me was uh, running the code and then maintaining that code. So that could be something the top down, 
which is no changes is required and then there is not much thing to touch about that part. That was the top down part. And then button up could be something like uh, refactoring or the unit testing. Maybe I could go for it uh, for myself uh, just to prepare how about the other extensions that I might think of uh, later proposed or a specific niche when it comes to me. Uh, types of work like moving from uh, Excel to Python uh, or thinking about optimization of the codes, yeah, that type of works are definitely slotted into the bottom of progress. And then definitely the collaborative approach is required in my team because I'm not just working for myself. I just like to put these uh, ways of working uh, first before I start moving from Excel things to Python because sometimes I found even the same skill set require different uh, adjustment depends on the circumstance and the requirements of the ways of working. For example, I use the GitHub for archiving my coursework, uh, the reports, or just to log my study journaling uh, for myself. In that case, I do always just use commit for myself. But if I like to push that skill set back to my team, then definitely it requires something more house rules, like naming conventions, how I'm going to run the relative path uh, rather than the absolute path, for example. Those types of, uh, of the additional work are going to be considered, depends on what ways of working uh, you are going to use. So, until making something the multivariant uh, regression model for getting an intuitive model, uh, here is just an example that how I use the Excel in the pre-processing part because I, I said, yeah, for the progress of uh, moving from Excel to Python, I started from uh, the Excel for every job, everything's ways of working at first, and then try to see if I can move that part to the programming way or if at least uh, if there is any reasonable reason that has to be remain in Excel. That's how I approach the way uh, from Excel to Python. So let's suppose if I plot the, uh, something, the simple line graph between the two columns. So when I am having something, the variant uh, predictor X, and then when I'm having the target Y, then if I see that plot, uh, there is a clear uh, linear shape as a part that is showing that the variance is uh, dependent. Uh, so in that case, I'm going to reduce uh, the correlation between the predictor and the target. So I like to transform the shape over the data shape uh, to be in this type of a distribution. So in this, in this case of uh, pre-processing data, I'd like to use the binning. In that case, uh, for example, like, if I'm choosing the, um, if I can borrow the example of the complex birth, let's say, uh, my target going to be something uh, predict whether it's a complex birth or not, versus if I say predictor could be the mom's maternal age, let's say, then if the data set has that characteristics of a linear relationship between predictor and target, then my data is going to show that unnecessary uh, correlate, like the more age is mom, uh, the likely the complex birth they're going to return, for example. I don't want to do that for my analysis. That's why I'm going to bin it. How do that uh, in Excel? I'm going to use the real lookup yeah, to find the index and then group them to the match, or I'm only using the index to match uh, in a VBA, yeah, in the Excel program to group them. Like mom's age from the 15 to the 56 that are going to be slotted in the corresponding the group, ordinary group, for example. Uh, I'm going to do that in Python. If I do that, then one hot encoding for the target, uh, the Boolean masking, whether, whether it's going to be uh, the complex birth or not, Boolean masking for hot in, one hot encoding and then maybe I could use the lambda function or maybe a simple for loop uh, to make a group for binning, yeah, if I can easily come across. So by doing that process uh, done in Excel, 
similarly worked uh, as a programming way. I, at that point uh, of the completion of my Excel jobs, I just realized, that, okay, was it really the Excel holding my time? Wasn't it because I needed some more clarification about the data or wasn't it because I needed more time to think about how to deal with this factor for this engineering? So that was something that I come across at that time. Because all of the things like uh, anonymization or the aggregation encoding the the things are required as some specific knowledge, uh, better understanding about my data set. Even the anonymization, for example, if I just say, okay, I'm going to do anonymize the patient's ID or the encrypt something uh, the, so that we cannot identify the which patient is. But if you think about it, the maternity ward, then the patients who are going to transport to the another uh, hospital and they're likely to register something, another episode with another ID, then are you going to identify them as a two different people? Then the complex birth require, when it requires the parity information, like a, a history of the uh, mom's uh, previous uh, history, like a C-section, does mom had a transfer from the um, before event or not, that type of things are going to be a unique idea uh, and then going to be considered whether I'm going to anonymize or not. So all sorts of the info of information is required to think how I'm going to analyze rather than just put them uh, to transform the data in Excel or not. So I'm not going to touch uh, the advanced analytics world in Excel due to the time constraint here. But please note there is a power pivot model that can accept uh, more exploding data uh, than the million size of uh, uh, data. As you know, the one access spreadsheet is having a limitation of having a million row of the data size. But if you are using the power pivot, then Excel can also handle the million, more than a million size of a data set to combine uh, multiple series of a data spreadsheet. It worked. So I didn't know there is a way like that before I start my job at NHS, for example. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, the, point, the, point here, uh, the point here I want to make is it is really the fundamental thing yeah, to consider what you are wanting to do for the pre-processing or the data analysis. What do you need instead of uh, rather than thinking about the tool or the incapability of the tool. Uh, and then the previous one, yeah, that was something, a few examples that I wanted to introduce, something like a pseudocode or something making a note uh, I did for my first year as a bottom-up, yes, working process. Later first year, yeah, for these bottom-up things uh, got some synergy because I was not the only one try this type of activity. Uh, people are just like to li uh, likely to share their uh, experience about use of uh, Pandas, OpenPy, Excel. They try something, and then uh, even if I share my failure, uh, it just motivates somebody to start. So I like that part, and then, yeah. Experiments uh, are going to expand it, its order to the SQL part, and then the data lake connection in Python. Uh, as it became my second year of working at NHS, and then I'm likely to access more the central data system rather than the local machine based, my own self database. So uh, that experiment is definitely going on for this year. And then uh, I'm also having not only data scientists, but also my fellow data analysts in my team working in the Python works, work stream. So the more I'm having the people, the more I'm receiving the feedback, and also I see the more I'm having the enjoyable people, there is a culture yeah, creating. I like that part as much. And yeah, uh, that's the end of my story. And then, yeah, I'm so proud yeah, to introduce that was my first year uh, working at NHS. And then thank you for listening about my private story. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, Cheyun Kip. If you please head over to the Slack with any, any questions for Cheyun. I need to crack on now because I know that uh, you're all eager to hear from Amadeus Stevenson.
who's a strong contender for the, the longest title award. Great, good um, afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna quickly plug in, I'm gonna jump straight to it. Brilliant. Uh, hands up if you've ever tried to install Python. Hands up if you've ever come across any issues installing Python. Okay, so it's kind of the elephant in the room, and I'm sorry if you're uh, an R person, you're like, oh, Python sounds interesting, I'm gonna have a go later. This is gonna look bad, but there is a way forward. Um, just a quick uh, note about me. So my name's Amadeus. I'm currently the technical lead at um, Outcomes Based Healthcare, or ABH. Um, we provide the National Bridge to Health Segmentation Dataset, person level, um, clinically derived. So these are all the clinicians that I work with at the company. Um, uh, population health data set for NHS England's Population and Person Insight Team, PAPI. So if you're interested, find out more on the Futures PAPI page, um, and we also work at the ICB level. Prior to that, I was in the NHS AI lab um, in the Skunk Works team, so I'm gonna show you some examples of that work. I also spent eight years at Decoded as the CTO wrangling Python and R installations, and I did a, a PhD in, in nanomedicine. Um, I was delayed on my train uh, yesterday so I started playing around with generative AI to capture the vibe of this talk. And I do apologize for the white male bias. That's not me, that is open AI. I just said, show me a picture of an analyst. I'm, I'm afraid, I did try gender neutral analyst and it gave me a princess with a giant beard. And it clearly AI does not know what I'm talking about. So I left it up there, just I wanna flag that it is an issue. I'm disappointed in open AI. Anyway, it is actually someone who looks like Tim Berners-Lee, bizarrely, wrangling a python. Um, so it's hard um, and uh, we need to get back to basics. So what is Python? The joke is no one knows because you can't install it on your computer. So command not found. Um, but once you get past that, um, it's an interpreter. So much like R, Python is just an interpreter. Um, Python and R are scripting languages, unlike compiled languages. So you just write your code and run it through the interpreter. You can run an interpreter on your terminal or command line. This is gonna be a Windows-based presentation. And um, you can do things like say, hello world, and you can import packages. So this is a built-in operating system package, and you can reference um, functions from packages. So that's kind of what Python is. Um, in addition to running it through the interpreter, which I don't think anyone does, you can write Python scripts, save them as .py files, and, and then you can run them. The import name main thing, I always have to Google it, don't worry, it's just a line you have to put if you want to run it as a command line thing. It's a bit confusing. But essentially, you still need the Python executable to process all of your code and output it. So having this Python thing on your machine is really, really important. In addition to writing scripts, you can use notebooks. I think we've heard a few people talk about Jupyter. This is um, a Jupyter Lab example. Um, so if, especially if you're in the cloud, lots of people use notebooks. Here's an example, uh, it's interactive, you can do plotting, that's Jupyter. So I won't cover Jupyter too much because that's its own uh, sort of beast. Now, Python by itself isn't brilliantly useful for much. It's really the package ecosystem, much like with R, that can do so much. Um, in Python, the main package index is called the Python package index, or PyPy, um, and I'm just gonna do a live search. There are 500,000 projects. If I just search NHS, um, there are a couple in here. I'm gonna cherry pick, this is a recent package uh, around NHS numbers, so uh, validating them, QAing them, normalizing them, generating them. There is a handy website that they've created um, where you can kind of read through how to use this package. And this is kind of typical uh, in Python. So I'm just gonna follow these up. So import NHS number. Um, great, so I'm gonna try that. Um, oh, module not found. Okay, this is like Python problem number one, right. N no module called. Okay, well let me go back to their website and let me see, there's a getting, so I always skip the getting started. But let's go back to getting started. Ah, okay, it's telling me to do something called pip, pip install NHS number. PIP stands for Python, uh, no, PIP stands for PIP installs packages. It's a self-referencing thing. Um, it's a separate executable to Python that allows you to install packages from the Python package index and other places as well. So, okay, uh, right, let's just run um, PIP install NHS number. Oh no, PIP is not recognized. It's not on my computer either. So if you do actually find this, you are kind of in trouble and you have to go back to the start, but I'll come on to a better way of doing this. So um, getting hold of PIP, separately can be a bit of a hassle. But let's say you've done that, you um, install the uh, package, um, you always get a message, um, for example, a new release of PIP is available every time I run PIP. I'm obviously not updating enough, um, but that's how you can um, install these packages. Now, tinfoil hat time. I do have a tinfoil hat I wear quite often. Should you be installing random things from the internet? Same applies in R and CRAN, although I know there's a lot more validation there. 
There um, is, I'm afraid, some precedent for worrying about this. This was a July study which um, showed that there is malicious code in, in the Python package index. It's open source, which is fantastic, but that doesn't mean anyone can submit packages. They found 5,000 package files, not packages. There has been stuff in the papers around stuff. Most of the malicious packages in PyPy are stealing Bitcoin wallets on your computer. So I'm not sure if they're that relevant. Um, but I don't think it's wrong for IT departments and organizations to want to control access to PyPy because there is some precedence. I think yesterday we heard Chris talk about risk management and um, sort of remediation. Um, and what I'm going to do now is share some of the most common ways that I've, when I've worked with NHS trusts, they've tried to protect around PyPy and how to uh, resolve those issues. So the first one is uh, something called a man in the middle proxy. It's very common in large organizations that you can't just go to the internet. It gets routed through um, a, a proxy. Now, those proxies are called man in the middle because it's um, surreptitious. It won't just block you. It will get you there, but it will intercept the traffic halfway through. Now, with modern internet, it's SSL or TLS. Secure internet has certification. It's public key encryption. So what some of these uh, products do is they break that certificate, sniff the traffic, and then reconnect to the correct website. And in that process, they break the chain of um, security around certificates. And you see this message. So if you're doing anything in PIP and probably other um, tools as well, certificate verification failed, something odd is going on. There is a workaround, and it's not recommended for everything, because you can basically say, ignore the whole security around TLS by saying trusted host. And you can specify the Python package uh, domains. There are two there. Um, don't do that as a default not thinking thing. You've got to think very carefully. OK, do, is this the correct thing to be doing? Um, the second issue you might have is you might just get a network block completely. So many organizations just block all traffic. They whitelist um, approved websites, and you just can't access it. So what do you do then? Uh, we've got two options. Again, supplies for, for CRAN and other things. Um, if your organization has a proxy, you can ask about it. Get your, you might already have credentials. You can pass um, these credentials in the command line. I don't recommend doing this because your command line has a history. If you're on a shared machine, someone could look at the history, pull out your username and password. So it's not recommended, but it does work. Um, just to note, triple Vs, I put Vs on everything when I'm doing stuff in the terminal just to get as much verbose output as possible. Um, it does help when you're trying to debug. The final um, sort of resolution for um, CRAN or PyPy or any software development is when your organization decides it's going to host its own package index with pre-approved packages. Now, that might seem quite onerous, and it is onerous. It's a lot of resource to manage your own infrastructure of packages. It's very common in other organizations, like banks that I've worked with. Um, it does cause some issues because, oh, you want the latest version of this package. There's a, quite a long lead time to get that officially approved in your organization. But again, the way that you work with PIP um, is you pass in the specific URL to your repository. So there are lots of ways around this, but it's just something to be really aware of, especially in NHS organizations, um, because it can make things difficult. But finally, you can import your package, and you can just execute your code as you'd like. So that's a little bit about PIP. So to summarize, why, what do you need to run Python? You need the Python executable, and you need the Python packages. What could be more simple? You could also replace this with R, R, and R packages. It's the same thing. In reality, what do you really need um, to run Python? Especially with Python, you need specific versions of uh, Python. So Python um, has a big schism between Python 2 and 3. Um, and what we did in the AI lab is we just added these cool little badges to all of our projects on GitHub. So it's specified explicitly this is the version of Python we're using. And the way to do that in Markdown is really easy. There's a website called like Badge Image Shields IO. All you do is you change the numbers in the URL, and it will generate that picture for you. So it's like really easy to do, and it looks nice, and there's like whole loads of badges you can do. Um, great. Well, how do you manage different versions of Python? We heard talk about Conda before and poetry. I'll come back to that. Um, there is another lower-level way of doing this. Uh, it's called PyEnv, um, originally a Unix tool. There's a PyEnv Windows tool. And basically, um, what it allows you to do is to manage like a whole um, bunch of different uh, Python versions. So this can be quite valuable if you're working with different projects with different teams. Um, so that's figuring out which version of Python you've got. Next up, you need the specific versions of the packages. So I think before, we've already heard about our requirements text. So I actually don't know what this looks like in R, but essentially, you can freeze um, the versions that you're using. For example, here, Pandas 1.4.2 bundle it with your project and um, just have other people 
and be able to access and, and replicate your environment. So this is very much around the reproducibility aspect that we've been hearing about um, all morning. Great. Um, are we done? Uh, ah, what if you're working on different projects that have different Python versions and different package versions? Well, this brings us on to environments. Uh, this was covered a bit earlier. I've borrowed the beautiful uh, RAP Community of Practice page on this because um, it's, it's, what is it called? Being lazy and efficient. Um, and there's an obligatory XKCD reference. If you're on a Mac, by the way, I'm sorry, it's even worse. Um, but basically, this is a great guide. It mentions something called Conda and VENV, different ways to manage virtual environments. Virtual env was used in Python 2, so just forget that was in the talk title. Um, but essentially, just to give you a really quick flavor, um, VENV is built into Python, and I'll go to the TLDR, um, create a specific project um, with a specific Python version as well, activate it, install your requirements, and then you're off to the races. You can deactivate and reactivate other environments. So um, VENV is built into Python 3, it's great. Conda is really interesting. Um, it's a separate open source framework. Um, it works with R as well as Python. Um, and essentially, again, it allows you to specify which version of Python you need. Um, you can still work with um, requirements. So there's like a whole thing here on how to do it. Um, and it's great. So Conda is probably the most easy thing to use. But something that's of, often mis sort of understood is there are different Condas. So Conda is the open source package framework. There are two impl implementations. There's mini Conda, the mini version of uh, Conda, which has Conda and Python, some really basic stuff. And then Anaconda is the fancy graphical user interface. You can click on, it comes with JupyterLab and all kinds of stuff. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because Anaconda changed its licensing about two years ago. And um, now, if you work in an organization, um, over 200 individuals, which is many of us, um, then you have to get a commercial license. Um, you can't use it for free. So um, this, I found out when one of the um, organizations I work with got a message from Anaconda saying, we've detected a lot of traffic from your IP address block. Like, are you using it commercially? You need to pay us. And everyone just completely freaked out. It's like, oh, this is meant to be open source and free. The good news is Miniconda is still open and free. Um, so that's what I recommend to everyone. Just use Miniconda. You don't get the nice graphical interface. And the only other thing to watch out is technically the default channel, which is where they get the packages from, is licensed. So you're meant to use Conda Forge. To be honest, I just use pip within Conda, and I don't have to worry about any of that. Um, the great, great, great thing about Miniconda is you do not need admin privileges to install it. So Miniconda, even though it says Anaconda, it also says Miniconda, you can install it just for me. And this is the key to all of these things. If you're working on-prem on your own infrastructure, you don't want to be using admin privileges. Once you've installed it, you get a special prompt, uh, Miniconda prompt, and inside of that, you get um, your environments so explicitly called out, I'm in the base environment, and you carry on as usual. So that's kind of how Conda works. It's a separate tool that you can access and work with. Um, and it works great. Right, finally, that all looks horrible. Who likes the terminal? I don't. Let's use our uh, development uh, environment. I do actually love VS Code. I'm not a Microsoft person, but it's fantastic. Uh, Visual Studio Code um, has built in. It understands VN and Conda. It understands that you have lots of different versions of Python. It understands that, um, oh, look, it looks like you need a new environment. Would you like to do it? It's like Clippy, but for pa package management. It's fantastic. So I really do, and I really do recommend this when you're working uh, on-prem. And it does a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, there's even something around containers. I think yesterday someone mentioned Docker. If you're getting really fancy, you can do dev containers, and it's super self-contained. Um, but there we are. So to summarize, uh, what I currently personally use, Miniconda, Visual Studio Code, I always have a readme with the, the versions I'm using, and I always have requirements.txt for packages. Um, I used to use uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. Say no more. Um, I don't anymore. So what are the takeaways of this talk? Well, you don't just install Python. It's a nightmare. But seriously, um, whatever you're doing in the cloud, on-prem, wherever, know what version of Python you're running for reproducibility with others. Know what versions of packages that you need and are running. Um, I really recommend building up your own documentation from the very first start, getting started. Oh, I've got one example quickly. Um, we added these in with our templates in Skunkworks, but every project we have is, here's what you do to get started. And it just helps you and forces you to make it reproducible. Um, finally, do operate without admin if you have admin, and just plan on doing it on a different machine, um, and just test it. It's like your backup, it's business continuity. Chuck away your machine, get a new one. How quickly can I set up my environment? Thank you very much. I've rushed through that for lunch. Um, but that's it.
We'll leave it there. Thank you, Amadeus. We've got lots of questions for you over on the Slack. Um, first off, how do you manage your virtual environments to make them reusable rather than having to make a new one for every single project? Great question. Um, I typically only work on about four projects at a time, so it's not unmanageable just to... And honestly, in reality, what I do is, because of the time between them, each time I create a new virtual environment, I've often upgraded Python to like a yet a later version. So I just really rely heavily on the requirements.txt, and I think there's a slide I missed on environment.yaml files. Um, these are things that I should be using. Um, so I don't have a systematic way, but it's a really good point. If you're working in a really big organization, what's the standards like virtual environment that everyone should start with? Do you have a, a favorite fax link? A favorite? Fax. Fax. Mm. FAQ. Oh, a favorite, um, a link to that, or, mm -hmm. um, gosh, for this sort of thing. Yeah, or um, do you just, just use Stack Overflow? Or? Stack Overflow, and I've started using ChatGPT a lot as well, actually. It helped me with the slides, because they're in Reveal.js. It was, it was great. Do you think Python's installation heartache will ever be fixed? I don't, but I think um, earlier the talk was if enough people are vocal enough about what we need, um, the infrastructure that's needed, um, it should get easier. I've definitely noticed on some of the central data science environments, Visual Studio Code standard or Azure Data Studio standard, um, some things are getting more standardized. It's just this is what you get in your environment. Um, but uh, that's a tricky one. Is there any way to list the packages used in the Python script on your output page? Yes, you can. So um, there are loads of functions in Python to query what version of Python you're running and what version of packages. I guess pip freeze, if you're using pip, will just spit out all of your packages. Conda has something similar. Could you embed that in your outputs? It's very possible. Um, I haven't looked into it. How many of the installation problems does Windows cause or cure? And likewise, the same question for Linux. Um, Linux. If you're just using Linux and Linux, it's great. It's much, much easier, but most of us uh, are using Windows. Uh, oh, that's such a like, political, oh, I don't know what to say. Um, it's got a lot easier, is what I would say. Um, this, you still have to like work quite hard to get your stuff working, but I don't think it's Windows' fault. Ultimately, we need secure installations without admin. That's the reality. That's government uh, NCSC guidance. We, none of us should have admin accounts when we're working. Um, so we should be able to figure out how to work without administrative access. Why did you stop using WSL? Well, um, I started using Selenium for automating dashboard um, QA. So that's a, it's a tool that can take screenshots and work through the document object model of a, of a dashboard, which is quite deep. But you need to render web pages, and I couldn't do it headless. And because I was running Linux, I couldn't generate a, a graphical interface, and I didn't want to fiddle around with X packages and it just got really horrible, and I thought, you know what? I just need to get it working on Windows and give up on this idea that I'm still a Linux person. So that's, that's what happened. And are there any particularly useful extensions for Python in VS Code that you'd recommend? Yes, that's a really good point. Um, there are uh, quite a few. So Visual Studio Code has its extensions. The linting's really good. Um, PyBlack is like a really good formatter. There is a big ecosystem of uh, extensions out there. Um, but the default it, Visual Studio Code comes with a notebook uh, environment, so it's kind of all got packaged up together now, so it makes life easier. Right, thank you again, Amadeus. Afternoon, everyone. Hi, welcome back. This is the final session of our NHS PyCom and NHSR community conference. Oh, yeah, well, thanks. A little bit of audience participation, that's what we need. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Barman. Uh, I was very privileged to go on one of his um, time series forecasting courses, um, and he's been very kind to share that material with the rest of us. So if any of you are interested in forecasting, there's quite a lot of stuff available, but I'll pass over. Uh, hi, everybody. Really delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Bahman, and I'm a reader in data-driven decision science at Cardiff Business School. Um, and this is a work I have been doing with uh, Professor Rob Heinemann on uh, probabilistic forecast reconciliation. Um, actually, there are different terminologies. I mean, we have a lot of data scientists, statisticians here. We like invent terminologies. And reconciliation is the late, latest terminology in this area. But the other terminologies that we use um, is hierarchical forecasting. So you may hear about this. Or cross-sectional aggregation. 
So these are basically the same thing. Or sometimes we use also term group time series forecasting. So they are all refer actually to the same thing, and I will go through it to explain. Uh, but this reconciliation is the latest term that uh, we use in this area. So another interesting thing that, uh, so this morning I have seen a lot of talks about reproducibility. So it is also good to, um, to see that all my work actually is reproducible. I use R, so my presentation is done in R with R Markdown. The talk is available in my website, the website I created it using R. Um, the paper that I have written with, uh, with Rob, we have written it with Quarto, and the entire workflow is reproducible as well, and it is available on GitHub. So if you're interested, that is available for you to use and replicate as well. So this is the outline of my talk. I will briefly talk about the hierarchical and group time series structure, so if you're not familiar, and then also talk about the, the problem that I, I am, I'm working with in the context of health service and then discuss different hierarchical forecasting approaches that can be used to produce the forecast, uh, and discuss my experiment, and show you some result and um, conclude. This is probably a huge claim, but I believe every forecasting problem that you're dealing with uh, is in the structure of the data. You will find some sort of hierarchical or group structure with the time series, even if you do the forecast for one single time series. If you look at the context of that forecasting test, it is very likely that it is actually a part of a bigger um, hierarchical or group time series structure. So in NHS or basically anywhere, in any industry or organizations, if you look at the forecasting that you produce, you will find the hierarchical uh, or group time series uh, forecasting. So in this, uh, presentation, I'm focusing actually on one problem that I have been working with, with Welsh Ambulance Service Trust and verified incidents in Wales. So this is the map of Wales divided into uh, four zones and then um, into seven health boards. Uh, of course, there are also more hierarchies and this, this is another question that we still don't have an answer for the hierarchies where I have to stop actually the hierarchy. Uh, we still don't know a part of where I have to stop the hierarchy it goes back to maybe the problem that you're solving, uh, but also the signals that you get from the hierarchy when you build it. Uh, so basically I take that sort of map and uh, I translate it into this diagram. So I have the, the number of verified incident uh, in the first level, which is total for wells, disaggregated into zones, and then for each zone, disaggregated into um, the different health words. This is something we call it a hierarchical time series. So, so it's a collection of uh, many time series that are linked together in a hierarchical structure. So what is important here to emphasize is the attributes are naturally disaggregated in a unique um, hierarchical manner. And most of the time, actually, you can link, link these hierarchies to geographical locations. So you have a total in the country, then below that you have regions, below that you may have, uh, for instance, cities and so on. Uh, but there is also another structure called group time series structure, which is slightly different from the hierarchical. Uh, and here, for instance, I have the total incidence uh, disaggregated into priority, which is red, amber, or green, and each uh, priority could be disaggregated into the nature of incident as well, which is, for instance, here I just put an example as fall or uh, health problem. Now, I could now rebuild this uh, structure another way. So I have the total incident disaggregated first into nature of incident, and then each nature of incident into the priority of a call that came in. So what is the difference then with the hierarchy? Here, the attributes uh, do not naturally disaggregate in a unique hierarchical manner, so they are more flexible. And of course, we could have a mixed a hierarchical and group structure, and this is actually the case in our problem. So we first have the hierarchy that you see in the left-hand side, incidents divided in, um, in the hierarchical way. So these basically are nested time series, and then these are crossed with two groups. One group is a priority, and another one is a nature of incidents. And if we consider all these combinations, um, it will give us many time series. This is the initial data set, so this is in a testable format. I don't know whether you have used testable before, but this is very similar to Tibble. The only difference is we have something called index that is embedded with the, um, with the Tibble that makes it unique for 
temporal data or time series data. And as you can see there in the square bracket, we see one D that tells us this is a daily uh, time series. Uh, so we get this data and then of course we have to um, create the entire hierarchy that I showed you. So we need to create the aggregated um, data sets across every single node that we have in the hierarchy. And this gives us the total of 1,530 time series. So remember each node is one time series of the verified incidents. Uh, for instance, the, the, the total one is very easy because it's a total country. We have only one time series for that, but we have different, for instance, for the control, for the health board, we have seven health boards. And then for the combination of a group and a hierarchy, we get a uh, different type. And at the end, we have this uh, 1,530 time series that we need to forecast. Why do we need that? Because uh, typically we require forecasting at different levels in our organization. Uh, so in your work, you may actually require the forecast to inform planning or decision. Um, you may require the forecast at the national level, at the health board level, or the hospital or station level. Maybe you need to forecast uh, the total incidents for different priorities or maybe different priorities for each health board. So these are all different way of uh, producing the forecast and you may need them or not. So basically this is a choice um, that is often dictated by the decision making process that always comes first before producing the forecast. But here the problem that we are dealing with is how to produce uh, a coherent forecast for the large collection of related time series, which is the case of hierarchical and group time series here, and I'll talk about what coherency means here. So there are different ways we can, um, or different approaches we can use for that. The first one is uh, base forecast or independent forecast. Basically here, we assume that every single node that I showed you in the diagram, they are independent, we produce forecasts independently. And actually we can apply any forecasting method that you like for each level. So you can think of this as different teams across an organization producing different forecasting. They may use their own method to produce that forecast. So now the problem actually with this base forecast is the forecast is not coherent. So what coherency means here is, uh, imagine you have just two levels, two simple levels. So you have the total country and below country, you have only two health boards. Now those two health boards, they produce their own forecast, and if you add them up, you get a total, right? But now imagine in the total level, you have also one time series. If you apply a forecasting method to that, you will get another forecast. Basically, these two forecasts wouldn't add up, okay? They would be different. This is what we call incoherency. So the forecasts are not coherent. And this is, again, it could be a problem in organizations if you have different teams in different levels, using different forecasting to produce, and then now you add up the bottom forecast, but it is different from the forecast generated at the top. So there is a conflict there, right? So this is one, the, one issue we have with uh, independent or base forecast. Now, traditionally, to produce this, uh, the forecast for this hierarchy or group time series, we use top-down and bottom-up, but middle-out middle could be an approach as well. So in top-down, we just forecast one time series at the top, and then we have to disaggregate. At the bottom, we just forecast the bottom time series, and then we aggregate them to produce the forecast at the higher levels. So this is just an example in the right-hand side, you see the, some examples of the time series we have here. Now, when it comes to the top-down, well, it, it works well uh, when you have low volume or intermittent time series, sometimes in the presence of many zeros. It could actually work well if you have this sort of time series at the bottom of the hierarchy. And it is one single forecasting model because you have one time series only. Um, and sometimes it could be really good for a higher level of the um, aggregation or at the higher level of the hierarchy. But the issue with this top down is um, we lose lots of information and we cannot capture the dynamic of the, uh, or the events that affect the time series at the bottom. Um, Another problem is how you dis disaggregate the total to get the forecast at the lower level could be also problematic because there are different ways to do it. So what is the best way? Uh, it could be difficult to get it as well. So traditionally, these methods only produce a point forecast. So there is no uncertainty around it. So 
with the bottom up, the good thing is uh, we don't lose information. We are capable of capturing the dynamics of time series um, at the bottom. This is something we couldn't do with the top down. Now, but if you have a large uh, hierarchy, so a lot of time series, it would be difficult um, to actually do bottom up. It's, it's running time would be probably uh, an issue. And sometimes you have a bottom series that are very noisy as well. So again, that could be issue as well. And bottom up also produce only prediction, only point forecast, no prediction interval. Now, we have then the third approach. This is what we talk about reconciliation. So what is reconciliation? Well, in uh, reconciliation, we first generate what we call the base forecast that I told you at the beginning. So for each node in a time series uh, of the hierarchy and group time series, we produce one forecast. And then reconciliation is a post forecasting process, which takes all the base forecasts, combine them together, and then produce a set of revised forecasts at the bottom, and then we actually apply bottom up, and this will produce a forecast for the entire time series in the hierarchy, and these forecasts are coherent. So there are two benefits with reconciliation. First, we can generate coherent forecasts, and second, reconciled forecasts are use the data available across the entire hierarchy. Remember, when we do top-down, we use only the time series at the top. We don't use any other information across the hierarchy. When we do bottom-up, we use only bottom. There is no other information in the hierarchy. But reconciliation uses all this information that we have across the hierarchy. And what I uh, mean by information here is I'm talking about signals, basically. And in hierarchical forecasting or reconciliation, we do aggregation, right? We aggregate time series from the bottom to top to get high level of uh, 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 hierarchies. So when you do aggregation in general, uh, some features of the time series actually will disappear. Some features will show up. Like so it, at different levels, you may have different type of signals. So that's one benefit of reconciliation as well. And in this project, we produce what we call probabilistic forecasts. So uh, this is one example. So the point that you see is the point forecast, but in addition to the point forecast, we produce the probabilistic forecast using uh, resampling, uh, the bootstrapping technique to be exact here. So this is another benefit. So you can get basically the, the full uncertainty of the forecast across that hierarchy as well. In terms of the setup that we use, well, we use the data uh, for, uh, for wells and uh, verified incidents, but you can actually apply this to any data set really that you have with this hierarchical or group structure because uh, you can just adopt the code basically there. So um, the, the, the incidents are divided or disaggregated into control and health board, and then uh, to nature of incident and priority, and we have five years of data for this, and we use one year of data for tests and the rest for training. These are some features of the data. What you can see is in the x-axis, we see the strength of trend, the scale between zero and one. One means uh, the trend is uh, strong, and the uh, uh, y-axis shows the strength of seasonality. This is a weekly seasonality because we have daily data. And again, closer to one means strong seasonality. Um, so you can see most of the time series that we are dealing with, they are actually a low uh, trend and low seasonality and because if you remember when I show you the number of time series we, we have 691 time series at the bottom and most of them they are uh, low volume intermittent and they are very difficult to forecast that's why uh, we don't have uh, trend and seasonality there again I show you this these are a few examples the thing is in general in a hierarchy when you go from top to the bottom um, the bottom becomes noisy and difficult to forecast except if you have bottom series where you have a lot of interesting predictors that could help you to use actually those predictors to build a model that captures the dynamic of the time series. So another thing that we do in terms of evaluation, so we have a time series, we actually forecast for 84 days ahead, but we don't evaluate the accuracy in the 42 days ahead right after the data we have. Instead, we evaluate only on what we call the planning horizon because we believe that the, the way uh, forecast should be produced is useful for the planning horizon, not for the frozen planning horizon. So this is also something that is not I mean, typically done in forecasting, but we believe this is more practical and 
we evaluate the forecast accuracy only in that last 42 days. In terms of the models that we use, again, we didn't want to uh, produce the best forecast really, we just wanted to show how it works. So we use the uh, empirical distribution or naive um, exponential smoothing. We use two Poisson regression models. Uh, the second one uh, using TS count considers autoregressive lags as well, the previous um, incidents. And then we use an ensemble of all these models as well, a simple average of this model basically. We evaluate point forecast accuracy with MACE and MSSE. Oh, basically these are scale independent, so we have to use them because the scale of the time series across the hierarchy are different, so it is important to consider it as well. And then we, we use CRPS to evaluate um, the probability distribution of the forecast we generated and how good they are. Uh, well, in terms of the result, uh, hopefully you can see them, but uh, what we actually observe is uh, in, in, across the hierarchy, uh, we observe that the reconciliation uh, in many cases across the hierarchy produce the most accurate forecast. And in terms of the method that we have, ensemble uh, could pr provide more accurate forecasts. And then here you can see it better across that, um, that those entire actually horizon that you see here, ensemble has the lower uh, error comparing to the rest. So just to conclude, what happens if you ignore hierarchies? Well, you need to know that the forecasts are not consistent, so you don't have coherency, and this might result in lack of coordination and also conflicts. Um, and also, uh, you don't actually use the, all information available across your hierarchy or organization. Uh, however, if you opt for using the hierarchical or group time series or reconciliation, uh, you can generate a coherent forecast because you're using the information across the hierarchy, there is a chance that you can also improve the forecast accuracy across the entire hierarchy. Um, so, and also, uh, you can use it as a tool to improve coordination between dif different teams working in the organization. So cross-sectional hierarchy, or uh, what I discussed here, is just one type of hierarchy. We can also have hierarchies across time. So going from, let's say, half an hour to one hour, to one day, to one week, to one month, and so on. So there is a hierarchy there, we could apply the same thing. So what I have discussed in this presentation is a cross-sectional hierarchy only at the daily level. If I want to consider both temporal and cross-sectional, I can actually mix them as well. So basically I can have one hierarchy that combines the temporal hierarchy, let's say from hourly to weekly or monthly, whatever you are interested in, with the cross-sectional hierarchy that I discuss here. Actually, this area of research is quite new. There are plenty of opportunities for research um, that you can do, and I think some of you, you may see, you may have seen this book because we, we had a webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago, but this book is available for free. We have just published it. This is the, um, the link to the book, and uh, if you are not familiar with forecasting, I think this is actually one of the best books that introduce you to this area. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, we are running a bit tight on time, but I will just ask you the first question in our Slack channel, if that's okay. If you are using five years of data, how have you adjusted for COVID? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer for it, sorry. Uh, we didn't actually have COVID data in this data set initially we published. Uh, but I think there are different ways that you can adjust for COVID and uh, uh, with Rob actually we're writing a paper, we're hoping to publish it by, um, by the end of this year. And again, the paper will be available. There are different ways, but we haven't really considered it here. Okay, thank you very much. Can I invite our next speaker up, please? And please forgive my pronunciation. No, welcome, Roberto, the ASDS. Right, uh, my name is Roberto, and I work as a data manager at the University of Liverpool. And my presentation is a bit wackier, not very serious. And I hope you like cats, because I have some photos of cats. Right, um, so my aim for today is to convince you uh, that fair is not too scary. Because um, you might find it scary a bit, but I used to think that fair was scary when I uh, started with functional programming in the tidyverse. But after 
using it for a few years now. Uh, I haven't gone back to base our functional programming. I don't know if that means I'm lazy or I just like the tidy verse approach of functional programming. Um, so when a regular cat uh, is not enough, when you bring more cats or you get a weak to the cat and then it becomes a lion. Um, so in reality, what FAIR does is it combines the uh, methodologies that you know from FAIR, uh, functional programming, the tidyverse, with the features package. So like how do you resolve features? So it allows you to run uh, multiple tasks simultaneously and without, um, which is the important part, without major changes to your code. And I'll show you that in, in one second. Um, Shout out to Tom Smith, I don't know if Tom is here. Uh, but thanks for an amazing presentation on Per. And if you scan that QR code, you'll go to Tom's slides. I don't know if there's a recording for it, but I'm sure it will eventually be available on, on the YouTube channel. So if you don't know about Per, I invite you to look at that presentation. Today, I'm assuming that you know Per, so we are gonna talk about Per. Uh, so what's going to be uh, the in initial example is Hello Fair. Uh, and sorry, the code it looks a bit dodgy. I don't know what happened in there. But it's my first uh, gorgeous uh, presentation, so apologies. Uh, so that's how you will do things in Fair. And if you want to uh, move your code to Fair, you will simply uh, will change the library. And instead of calling map, then you will call future map. But the syntax uh, is exactly the same. You have uh, your inputs, and then you have a function that you want to apply. However, that doesn't mean that that code is uh, automatically will paralyze it. You have to do a bit of setup, and I will show you what that setup looks like. Uh, and so to paralyze your code, you want to uh, tell R how you want to resolve the features. Um, up there, I'm telling, right, the plan to resolve the features is to do a multi-session. And I'm giving you, I want, I want to use two workers, or like two CPUs in this case. And after adding that line of code, now that little Hello World example, or Hello Fair, uh, it runs in parallel using two workers. That doesn't mean that you need to run this like simple code in parallel, because I think it's very simple. Or oh, you get to um, more complicated um, routines of code or functions that will benefit of running uh, multiple things at once. Uh, other functions that you might be familiar from per in in in, in fair, you just add feature underscore imap uh, feature underscore map to pmap uh, walk, and uh, I put a link to the reference so you can look at all the, the list of functions available to you. Uh, in terms of planning, I was said before, uh, there are four approaches. You could do sequential, which uh, I don't know what's the point, because then if you want to do like sequential, then you might as well stick with uh, per. Uh, but ideally, the one you will use is multi-session, and so that will spawn uh, multiple sessions, or like the number of workers sessions to resolve the features. Uh, on all OSs except Windows, you could do the multi-core, which instead of spawning new sessions, it will just spawn uh, new processes within the same session. And one that uh, I found more interesting is cluster one. And I don't know how many of you have, uh, have access to an HPC cluster, but if, you, if you're one of the lucky ones, then you can benefit of running on multiple computers through the network if you have a very uh, large number of uh, small tasks or like a, a problem that can be breaking down into smaller tasks to solve with. Uh, with the fair. Uh, there's a little test that you could do at home to see uh, what it, uh, how it compares of running with a, in a sequential fashion and when you run uh, with multiple processes or multi-session. Uh, right. I have another example, which is imagine you want to bake some cakes. Uh, so you have your uh, baking function and you have our cakes in this example. But, uh, and this function doesn't do anything, just waits for two seconds. Uh, and so if in the sequential version of it, then you bake one cake at a time. So the, the time that I, it takes to run that or bake all those cakes is about eight seconds. Uh, 
But if you were to spawn a multi-session with four workers, that means now you have four ovens instead of uh, just a one. So you can bake the four cakes at once. So you might say, oh, so that time should be two seconds. But there's a caveat, which is that when you are running parallel, uh, there's always uh, some overhead for like data transfer and like for the main process to gather the results and bring that onto your uh, your objects into R, into your main session. So it's not ideal, it's not a linear thing, but it's a substantial improvement. And I'll show you a real case example or closer to uh, in a bit. So uh, I have uh, I had an image there, which was an orange cat. That's unfortunate. All right. Uh, so some useful tips. Uh, there's a command to find out how many cores you have available to you. Uh, then also you can add progress bar. Who doesn't love it in the progress bar? Uh, and to add a progress bar is as simple as just adding that progress equals true. But they have created a new package called progress R or progressor. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's the right way to pronounce it. But uh, there's no documentation for it, and the, the developers of Fair uh, suggest that you move to the progressor approach of things. My real world example, which I'll go very quickly, it's about using UPRNs, uh, unique property reference numbers. So imagine you want to derive some metrics at that level. Uh, but my case is, well, I, I, I'm based in Liverpool, so I'm interested in messy side, Cheshire messy side. And I looked at the ONS UPRN directory, which uh, there's a link there on the presentation. And there are about four and a half million of UPRNs. Uh, that's for the Northwest, sorry. Uh, but for Cheshire Messi side, there are uh, one million and a half. And UPRNs are like a uh, unique, unique way to identify uh, all properties, so commercial, residents. And what we do in my, uh, my research is trying to understand uh, like, uh, how like your surroundings affect your health. So we want to generate metrics at household level, or imagine you want to compute something on this many number of points, like each of those points, it represents like a property, not necessarily a house, because it could be commercial or a property. And imagine you want to compute something on each of those, how long will it take if you were to do it sequentially? And you don't have to guess, because I will tell you how long will it take if, for example, the computation that you want to run takes one millisecond, so just one millisecond, if we want to run this code. And I, on the repo for these slides, I have the code how I generated the, the, those objects there and which files you need. Uh, but if you were to run this sequentially, uh, it will take uh, 2,600 uh, seconds, I think it's 42 minutes, more or less. But then uh, by parallelizing that code, which if you look, the only thing that I've done is just change the plan from sequential to uh, multi-session and update to the number of workers. Now it runs in 292 seconds. So my point I want to, want to highlight is that with minimal amount of work, just by changing one line of code, then you can uh, scale up your work. Uh, you can't really, I'm gonna skip this, but just, or you can look at it later. But ideally, um, you want to parallelize code that can be broken down into smaller tasks or like uh, a, a big problem that in which the smaller tasks are not dependent on each other, so independent tasks. And I've seen uh, over the last two days that people generate reports. So imagine you have to generate 2,000 different reports with different combinations of variables. You could parallelize it and get all those uh, reports generated much quicker or like run those models with different combinations of inputs much quicker because you will do it simultaneously instead of having to sit and wait to, to look for them to be run one at a time. And I just gonna skip over that, which is some caveats of using fair that run out of time. Ooh, and that's my email if you want to contact me about like anything with fair or UPRNs, which is the research I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have run out of time, so I'll move That's on fine. to our next one. And um, I'm allowed at least one terrible dad joke before we start, aren't we? So uh, proving that the NHSR community and Python community have not forgotten about Dre, here is Dre. What makes it worse is that I'm a doctor as well, so I am Dr. Dre. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Matt Dre. Uh, I work at the UK HSA. 
Uh, my talk is called Bass Slaps. It's about bass R. Sorry, Roberto. And we're going to tell you that um, bass is actually really cool. Um, it's not just about all those packages. Um, so slaps, I'm told, means cool. Um, and the fact that I have to tell you that it means cool makes me really cool. I think that's how that works. Um, so first thing I have to say is polite notice. And because it's polite, you have to pay attention to it. This is not a flame war. I'm going to say why I like base R. You might like Tidyverse, Data Table Collapse, or <coughs> Python, um, or something else. Um, but this is, this is a friendly space. Um, oh, <laughs> what is base R? That's probably a good place to start. Um, I'm hoping that people will take away something from this talk, uh, even if they think they know what base R is, or if they've never heard of it before. Uh, but actually, base R is um, a whole bunch of packages that get attached to your R session when you open R Studio, whatever it may be. Um, but actually, it's not quite that simple. It's a bunch of packages, one of which is called base, which is confusing, as well as some other things like methods and stats and all these other things. But it's not that simple, because actually there's also a bunch of other things that are recognized as base packages which aren't attached when you start up. So what is base R? Dunno, but I like it. Um, so what does it look like? Hopefully most people will have seen some R code in their life, I'm, I'm hoping, fingers crossed. Um, I'm going to show you a sort of very basic analysis using um, base R, which hopefully, again, types of things you might have seen before. So here we have uh, empty cars, the famous um, data frame uh, used in demos. We're just going to take the head of it, first six rows, call that X. Um, then we're going to use this magical square bracket notation, which if you're more familiar with Tidyverse might seem uh, a bit wild. Um, but what we're doing here is basically filtering and saying, give me wherever the column WT is greater than three, and then also return me, select me, the columns HP and CYL, which are horsepower and cylinder, um, and call that Y. And in base R as well, in, in R in general, you can put everything inside some brackets. It will also print out as well as a sign. So there's a little tip for you as well. Uh, we can also do um, a mutation, right? So we can do things like use this dollar notation to say, please create me this HP per cylinder column. It's new. I want it to be one column divided by another and rounded. Great, classic stuff. And then we can also do some other stuff like, in this case, arrange with this order function, again, inside these square brackets. Um, and we can use this negative symbol to mean, please give it to me in descending order. Great, all looks very usual for an analysis. Uh, and we haven't actually attached any packages yet, of course. And then you're thinking, well, pff, great, but like, what about functional programming? Here's some functional programming. We can do s apply. There's a whole family of functions, the apply family of functions. This applies, in this case, the function mean across each of the columns in our Z data frame and returns us a simplified, that's what the S is, simplified uh, vector of those results. Great, again, cool. No packages attached. We've done some very basic analysis. Um, and my conceit here is like, maybe we rush too quickly to kind of install a bunch of packages when maybe we don't need to. Um, but that brings me on to the kind of three main points I want to talk about. We've sort of heard about what it is and what it looks like. I want to talk about stability, dependencies, and then also something I'm calling modernity, which is, sound, sounds way more flash than what, what I'm going to talk about. Um, ignore the GIF for a second. Um, I'm saying that sta stability is something that we should care about as our users. We've heard about reproducibility all day long. Um, Base R has been knocking about for decades now. Like version one was about 2000, I think. Uh, and code that you might have written then some of us might not be old enough looking around the room. Um, we'll still run today, hopefully. Um, and then vice versa, stuff that you write today probably will have a good chance of running into the future if it's written in base R. Um, what's this GIF all about? Uh, well, I'm contending that R is actually like a horseshoe crab, unchanged for eons, cryptically beautiful. Um, and also, I'm saying that pretty much all of us in this room are Millhouse. We're Millhouse, aren't we? We are Millhouse. Uh, look deep inside yourself. Um, the second point, stability. Um, again, we've talked about dependencies and other things today. Uh, this is a classic stolen XKCD, which I have slightly adapted. Let's imagine this is your project with all its dependencies, all these packages piling up and piling up, and maybe one day one of those functions changes and everything comes falling down. Good old base is always there for you. And in this case, base is the base of this tower, which I think is a really clever pun. Moving quickly on. Um, <laughs> modernity. Um, some of you may recognize the extremely, um, dare I say, sexy, old R logo here, morphing beautifully into the flat, modern design that we now have. This is symbolizing what I'm calling the modern bass aesthetic. And I encourage everyone to use this phrase everywhere you can to make it seem like you're really cool as a bass user like me. Uh, what this means is that uh, basically, with all that stability, you might think, OK, well, R never changes. Like, it's, it's unyielding. It's unrelenting. But actually, there have been a number of changes from R version 4, which make R into much more of a kind of, yeah, modern language um, and use a whole bunch of new idioms which have been brought about by the popularity of things like um, Tidyverse and 
stole some things from Python as well. And what does that look like? Well, I'm going to start with the string literals thing. Python users are laughing at R users because they have their F strings. Well, we now have something similar for, for R. Windows paths, file paths, are rubbish because you have to escape a backslash, or you have to write backslash, backslash. And in fact, my syntax highlighter has got really confused, and it thinks backslash n is a new line. Uh, so this does away with that problem. Um, and what we can do is we can take those as raw strings um, and interpret them exactly as they're written as those strings. We don't have to do any of this escaping stuff. Now I'll talk about pipes and lambdas. We'll, OK, I'll start with a regular expression here, which is um, inside another of these string literals. This is going to look for uh, a date, 2000 and something. And what I want to do is I want to find the file path that has the string 2023 inside it. Um, so what we can do is with new R, and the modern base aesthetic, don't forget that phrase, um, we're going to pipe from left to right. You may have seen pipes before. There's construction in Tidyverse that's made of three characters. Ha, this is made of two. Uh, so we can pipe that into Greg Expra, which is really unwieldily named, um, into the first element there, same as a, a normal pipe, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, and if we want to pipe into something other than the first element, we can use this underscore character, underscore, nice fat wide thing that you can see, right? Nice placeholder, not a dot, rubbish. Um, and then we can also pipe that into our classic S apply that we saw earlier. And we can use this backslash notation. Instead of having to type out the full word function, we can just use a backslash now. There we go, false, false, true, fantastic stuff. Looks like the type of code you might write every day. Maybe you write it in tidyverse or something else. Well, you can do that in base R now too, fantastic. Oh. Bonus, there's a fourth thing I wanted to tell you about, um, which is pretty self-indulgent, actually. But uh, BaseR can also do some really odd things. So there's a, a function called locator, which allows you to click on a plot and be returned its coordinates interactively. So I use that on this package, Pixel Tricks, which basically has created a little pixel art editor. <laughs> yep. Uh, there's also the ability to use a read line function in BaseR, which is an interactive way of having people input into the console a response that you can then use for something else. Like a video game, yes. R is uh, for video games. Um, we've known this from the start. It was originally intention for this. Uh, and there you go. There's a little character being chased, if you squint. Um, and then finally, um, there's uh, in R version 4 again, there's something called R user dir. This is a function that allows you to store data or, or cache data uh, for a given package. This is a package I've made from that called Tamargo, which stores a cyber pet uh, on your computer and allows you to access it from your R console. This is Kevin. Kevin has been a bit messy, I'm afraid. Um, but we can use the clean function to clean him up. And then when we restart our session in a few days' time, he will have aged, um, and he will die. Um, so. An odd talk. Um, <laughs> what I'm basically saying is think about base R wherever you can. You don't just have to attach packages all the time. Stability, dependency, modernity, oddity, what's in the QR code, ask Tom. Um, if you want to get the slides, there's a link there. Uh, and you can also bother me at various places if you want to complain or if you really hate base R and you want to tell me about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Again, I'm afraid there's no time for questions. Could I just um, ask our presenters all if you wouldn't mind uh, nipping onto the Slack channel? There's a few questions appearing. It'd be fantastic if you could um, answer those on there. So uh, sticking with people with strong rap credentials, um, I'll introduce Sam. Hello. Awesome. So Almost as interesting as base R, I'm going to talk to you about flowcharts, an easy trick to better, more easily understood code and data pipelines. So yeah, I'm Sam Hollings, a principal data scientist from Manchester, England. And uh, cool, this works. So yeah, I'm part of the data science team, NHS E, and uh, we do loads of stuff, natural language processing, data visualization, obviously RAP, data linkage, various sorts of analysis, machine learning. But today, I'm going to talk to you about flowcharts. <laughs> so, I'm sure you're saying, my code is great already. I bet you've got wonderfully nicely laid out readmes that explain what all the files are doing in your repo. You've probably got a really nice, clear main entry point for your things, in the case of Python and main.py, that you know, is super obvious and roughly lays out what the program's going to do. You might even have really nicely commented functions that are really easy to read, and it's all super clear and obvious. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just you know, a lot harder to interpret, and yeah, you know, let's not worry about that. <laughs> However, are we really that transparent, even considering all this stuff, like publishing your codes, you know, publishing your code, having um, 
a great readme, having doc strings, all the rest of it, it's a great first step. Um, but can our stakeholders and you know, other analysts, your colleagues, really understand like, easily what you've made just from that? How transparent are we really? And the reason why I bring this up is because there's a growing call for transparency with things like the Goldacre Review, the Government Wrap Strategy, and there's just a public desire to know what's done with their data. So how to make your code easier to understand? Well, flowcharts. So a picture paints a thousand words, and usually when we code and documents, they're very linear things. You know, you start at the top, you read down, then you read the next document, and it goes, you know, goes on and on. It's a long linear thing. But really, processes aren't linear at all. They are like this. You know, they they have branching parts. They uh, branch off, they go in circles, they reference each other, the same things used multiple times. And this horrible squiggle I put on there is sort of describing how the journey is definitely not linear. And uh, a picture, a diagram, is able to describe that in the more intuitive way that we think and understand it. Uh, yeah, so coding is linear, processes often are not. And to sort of to, to sort of elaborate on this, um, so here's some code that I got, you know, as we all do these days, I got ChatGPT to write, and um, it's quite nice code, and I think any, uh, if you were close enough to read it, I think any person that knows a bit of Python, or even R, could tell what this is doing, really. But I challenge anybody to not find this faster to interpret. Like, uh, so, you know, this code uh, cleans the data, calculates the average salary, returns the value. And how does it clean the data, I might, you might ask? Well, it does these things here. Um, and the reason why this is great is because it, it makes a complex process easier to understand in a way that anybody can now know that that's what that does. It makes it easier to suggest improvements. So maybe, you know, maybe we've missed something out. There's an essential step before the output is created, we haven't suppressed the values or something like that. And it's a map. So people, if, I, I mean, I'm sure we've all been there when you've had a really complex code base and it's so easy to get lost, you know? Maps stop you from getting lost. And if you are lost, they help you find the way forwards. Like, and yeah. Obviously I've used the word flow chart a lot, but what is a flow chart? So there's actually, you know, many different ways of making flow charts. I don't think it's that necessary to sort of follow the perfect guidebook of making flowcharts. I think as long as you are relatively consistent, it's fine. But some basic intro to it, you've got you know, symbols for beginning and end, symbols for processes, symbols for sort of predefined process, which I guess are similar to like a function, a packaged up process that has got a name, um, manual processes that we probably want to get rid of and replace, decision points, documents, data, there's loads of, of symbols. And we made a guide on process mapping that you can go check out. Um, and as they often do, X XKCD has made a load of comics on flowcharts. So this one, for example, a guide to understanding flowcharts in flowchart form. So start, do you understand flowcharts? No. Okay, you see the line labeled yes, yes. You see the ones labeled no, yes, good. Okay, cool. Like. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's running out of batteries. Um, but how do we go about mapping out the code? Okay, I've sold you on flowcharts, hopefully. But how do you actually go about making one? So you probably already have got, got the first step. You have some process document. So you have a list of steps, or you've got your code. Both are perfect. Just go through it and just start writing what each thing does. Like, and I guess initially, you might make it quite long and linear. But you, you might also choose to branch out, depending on it. but it doesn't matter. Like, just go through it and start describing it. So in this instance, you know, load the document into a pandas data frame, write the data frame into SQL table, run the cleaning rules SQL script, and so forth. And the next step's really crucial, which is to simplify it. So often, process documents make the mistake of being too granular. Uh, open this menu, click this function, type this thing into this box, press OK. Like, it's too much information. What we want is 
load the thing into the thing. Like, so pull out, abstract it a bit. So here, rather than, you know, A, B, C, just load the data into the table. Like, and then apply the cleaning rules. Like, that's enough. Um, and this is a really key part in basically saying what you intend rather than what's actually done. And that's what allows the average person to actually tell what's actually happened. And then next, we undo all that stuff that I just said, and we describe the complexity again. So you've got your general flow chart, and then if someone wants to find out more how the data was loaded into the table, they can look into the, the sort of subflow chart of load the data to the table. Okay, so it's loaded into Pandas data frame. Pandas data frame is written to SQL. So why, why, why is this really great? Well, process maps, they actually really help you organize your code. So it's something that you're probably gonna have to do anyway. So for example, if you're ever confused about how to split your Python or R files up and how to lay out your Git repo, make a flowchart, it's what you're gonna have to do mentally anyway. So for example, here we've got a process, load the data into a SQL server, do some analysis, make some output. You'll probably make a Git repo, something like this, where you've got some main top level entry point file, and then you might have a, a source folder with some folder or file named load data, analyze, make output. It's the same as the flowchart. Those sections are the high level parts of your process, or should be, maybe. And then if someone wants to navigate your code base, the flowchart acts as a map for it. And then, you know, those files, the content of those files is informed by the flowchart or vice versa. So here, the main thing might just have do step one, do step two, do step three. In this case, load the data, analyze, make output. And if someone wants to find out how the data was loaded, the load data thing will describe how the data was loaded, which is basically that, you know, describe the complexity section from the previous slide. <laughs> but the really, another great thing about process mapping is it really helps you think across pipelines, because often the complexity of your processes can, can stop you from seeing, it's like you can't see the wood for the trees, basically. Whereas when you simplify everything down, when you start to look across your pieces of work, you'll see the, the duplication. So here we've got analytical process one, Two and three. Um, so yeah, you map out the process as a team, great. So we know the inputs, process outputs, we get the data, clean it up, blah, blah, blah. But we see that, you know, there's a bunch of stuff here that's repeated multiple times. Um, in this case, you know, I've highlighted here the combined with the other assets. But basically, you know, you might have the same or similar code running many times um, and steps being run many times getting the same output. And so, Thanks to the, the flow charts that we made of these, obviously in this instance, the flow charts were very similar, but in other instances it might not be. But basically we could decide that, um, yeah, to just combine this and basically re-engineer it, like, you know, have common functions for those things that can be common. Almost done, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, the final point is they're a great way to start wrap because even people that can't program can help make a flow chart. They can help say, I don't understand this. They can get involved and feel a part of it and contribute and then continue to learn. And uh, yeah, if you need to know more, get in contact or you know, have a look at our guide. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sam. We're running spot on time, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna move us on if that's okay. Cool. Uh, welcome Ian Dillingham. Hello everyone. Uh, I am Ian. I'm from the Bennett Institute of Applied Data Science at Oxford University. In my day job, I work on the Open Safely platform, um, a pipeline for doing safe and secure research on um, patient level data. But today I'm going to talk to you for 10 minutes about testing, and specifically about property based testing. Now, I look around the room and see a sea of smiling faces. I think these are all professional data scientists. These are all professional software developers, professional analysts and researchers. Of course, we're very conscientious. When we write our code, we don't just write it, splat it into GitHub and forget about it. We want to know that it works. Hopefully, someone's smiling down the front when I said splat it into GitHub. Hopefully, we don't do all that. We want to be assured that it's doing its job. We want to be assured that what we think it's going to do is actually what it does. 
And by convention, I suppose, what we'd reach for is what's called a unit test. We would write a small piece of code, the code we want to test, I suppose, the code, that wants to, the, the code that's going to do the thing we want it to do, and then we write another small piece of code to check that it works, to exercise that piece of code. Here, here, here is a small piece of code. It's written in Python. It's, uh, it's a function. It's called round to nearest 10. You pass it an array of numbers, a NumPy array, and that function uses another NumPy function to round the numbers in the first array to the nearest 10. We don't need to worry about the details. Maybe we've wrapped all this up into our own function because we want something that's, that's named a bit more um, expressively. Maybe it stops us making a mistake further along. How are we going to test this piece of code then? Well, we're going to write a unit test, and this is a unit test for that piece of code. By convention, I suppose, or by good practice, or just to make our lives easier, we can split unit tests up into arrange, act, and assert steps. So in the arrange step at the top, we're getting together the data we want to write to, or to exercise our code. So we're, we're creating a new array called my array. It has three numbers, 9, 10, and 11. So we've got everything tidy at the top of our unit test. In the act step, we're going we're gonna to exercise our code under test. And our code under test was that round to nearest 10 function. So we're going to pass it the array in our unit test. So my rounded array is hopefully going to be three rounded numbers. And we're going to check for that in the assert step at the bottom. We're going to use some more NumPy magic to check that the rounded array, or the one we think is rounded, actually matches some hard-coded values. So we stuffed in the numbers 9, 10, and 11, and we expect to get the numbers 10, 10, and 10, because 9, 10, and 11, each rounded to the nearest 10, gives 10. There's a lot of hard-coding stuff going on there. Not much creativity. I wrote this on the train this morning, but you, you get where I'm coming from. We, we need to hard code stuff and we need some creativity. We need to think about what we're going to test and try and catch as many of those things in advance. And that, I think, kind of captures the, the problem or the limitation of unit tests. The scenarios we generate for them, they're often a lot neater, they're often a lot tidier, and they're often a lot more predictable than the real world. I don't know about you, but I've come here, I'm wearing a, a, a gray jumper, I'm wearing a white shirt, I'm wearing blue jeans. I am not Mr. Creative. My, my partner criticized me this morning when I walked out the door. I am definitely not going to be write, writing creative unit tests. They are going to be nine, uh, what was it, nine, 10, and 11 rounds to 10, 10, and 10. I'm going to be very tempted to say, that's it, it works, let's get on with life. But I shouldn't, and we don't in Open Safely. What we use are property-based tests, and these are super exciting. If you take one thing away from this, it's remember property-based tests and Google it. What are property-based tests? Well, they are less neat, and they are less tidy, and they are definitely much more unpredictable than unit tests. They're also called generative tests. That's another thing to Google if property doesn't work. They fire tens, hundreds, or even thousands of disparate scenarios using a standard test at your code. So rather than hard coding the data we stuff in and the data we get out, what we have to think in terms of is generating input data that matches some kind of specification. We'll see an example in a minute. And we'll, we'll check that the, the results we get from chucking it into our code under test is consistent with some guarantees. We're not going to hard code the numbers, their expected values. We're going to think in terms of what are the invariants, what are the guarantees we expect those, those results to look like. So they're kind of a little bit more interesting. They're certainly a little more intellectually interesting. Uh, what's next? I think it's the code. That's it. Back to the code we're going to test. Remember, we chuck an array in at the top. We round it to the nearest 10 in the function, uh, and then we fire it back again. I think that was for my benefit because I was on the train this morning. Property-based test. What does it look like? Well, we're going to use a Python library called Hypothesis. I'll link to some R libraries or an R library later. And Hypothesis takes care of the arrange step for us. You see the three lines at the top, one, two, and three, we use something called a strategy that says to Hypothesis, please give us a NumPy array of floating point numbers. Any, any floating point numbers you like, but please make sure it has a minimum size of one element. And that's what it gives us. It's responsible for providing us with up to 2,000 or a configurable number of input arrays. They come into our test function as my array, so it takes care of that act step, as I said. Uh, takes care of that arrange step, as I said. The act step is unchanged. That's where we pass that array into our function we wish to test. No problem there. I mentioned the guarantees. That's what happens in the assert step. 
So often this is quite creative or the part of property-based testing where you really have to rack your brains. So I was thinking, well, how do you round a number to the nearest, how do you check that your function rounds a number to the nearest 10 without actually just repeating the function in your test? You really have to kind of separate the black box of your code and think of other ways that you would test the, uh, the, the or guarantee the uh, outputs, the invariance of the outputs. Here, I thought, well, if, if a number is rounded to the nearest 10, then if you divide it by 10, it shouldn't have anything left over. So no, no matter how big or how small that number, if there's a remainder, clearly something's gone wrong. So although, I mean, we could argue that it doesn't test that it rounds the number to the nearest 10, it certainly rounds a number to 10. So that's a good enough guarantee to get started. And that's what I've encoded at the bottom. The little percentage sign is the modulo operator. It just says, tell me the remainder. If the remainder isn't zero, this will return uh, false, I think, or it will fail the test. I might have got my trues and falses mixed up there. Never mind. We're not talking about Boolean logic. Come on, clicker. OK, that test failed. The first unit test passed because I'm not terribly creative, but my property-based test failed. Why did it fail? What did I learn from this process? This is a real advantage of property-based testing. They, they are no longer rote writing unit tests. You have to think. I learned I hadn't handled empty arrays, but of course I had because I fixed the test later. Let's scratch that one off. I hadn't handled some specific NumPy data types. Fine, maybe users would chuck that at my code. It's good to know, but I'm not going to stress too much about that. What I did learn is that um, rounding is imperfect. There is such a thing as floating point error. Of course, I knew that. I'm a, you know, a so-called professional software engineer, but I hadn't appreciated that it would apply to my rounding function. And I uncovered all sorts of imperfections in rounding. Now, I had to make a decision. In the context of use from which this example was drawn, that really mattered. So I had to switch out my NumPy implementation, nice vectorized maths. No, we can't do that. I had to use a nice um, you know, kind of core bit of Python to get over that. No matter. I discovered it, and that's what was important. Importantly, for my nine lines of unit test switched out to nine lines of property-based test, it's as if I'd written, well, I've written 2,000 tests using the same number of lines of code. I guess I've written 1,999 tests because I started out writing one. What's next? What's next? You, uh, you can learn more. As I said, Python has the hypothesis library, hypothesis.works. R, well, R has all the best names to start with, so it has a library called Hedgehog. I don't know why it's called Hedgehog, but it looks really interesting. I don't really write much R. I know our researchers do. Go check that one out. And if you're really super keen on learning the fundamentals of property-based or generative testing, then you can wind all the way back to Haskell. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing analysis in Haskell, but the paper's quite interesting, and it lays out the foundational work. Thank you all so much for your time. You can find out more about Open Safely, about where I work at the website at the top, Bennett Ox Ak Ak. And if you want to get in touch with me, it's ian.dillingham at phc.ox Ak Ak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That's great. You got Tom all excited there mentioning Haskell. Um, just uh, one quick question, if I could. Um, well, it's two that are related. Do the tests take a long time to run, and how do you keep them at a reasonable runtime? Yeah, so that's a really good question. For something like this, no, it's, it's like milliseconds because it's a toy example. We have property-based tests on, our, on Urkel, our um, electronic health records query language, which we're developing at the moment, that they run overnight. We've stuck them in a GitHub action, and they'll take you know, six, eight hours to run. But they are running tens of thousands of tests over an enormous code base. But there are options for improving that runtime. We've talked about parallelism and that kind of thing before. So it's as long or as short as you wish. But you are getting 2,000 tests per test. It's a good deal. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just welcome our final plenary speaker for the day, Ross Kennedy. Hello, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm aware you're, you've had a couple of days of lots and lots of people talking at you, so I'll kind of try and keep it quite brief. Um, and also, I'm a slight imposter in this room. I have never in any way worked in the health industry. Um, I've worked across toys and prisons and courts and all that sort of stuff. Not really in this sort of health business, but... Anyway, in the sort of, in the guise of cross-government collaboration and the fact we have all of, we have lots of problems that are the same across uh, lots of the organizations we uh, work in, I'm here to talk about Splink. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone's heard of um, Splink before. This is a, uh, much to Matt Dre's dissatisfaction, both a package and in Python. God forbid. <laughs> Um, so this is a package we've built in the Ministry of Justice um, to link together data. So 
I think we'll start off with an example of the sort of thing we're trying to do. Uh, so our business problem is we have two records, like all of our administrative data sets across anywhere. It could be NHS, could be DHSC, could be MOJ, could be sort of two prisoners uh, in the type of work that I do. And we need to figure out, are these two people the same person? So we have two records here. Apologies, I'm aware that it's quite far away and you might not be able to see it, but I'll talk through it. So we have two records with first name and surname are the same. So we have Lucas Smith and Lucas Smith, which is like, okay, yeah, these could be the same people, all good. Looking into date of birth and city, date of birth going from, it's a little bit different, but sort of 1984, 1983, could be some sort of transposition error. Um, so yeah, could be the same person. Obviously city's different, one of them is based in London, one is in Manchester. Obviously, trying to consider these two types of data is slightly different. Date of birth is a fairly static thing. Most people keep the same one, um, whereas people move between cities. So someone could quite feasibly, grown up in London, move to Manchester, all that sort of stuff. And other types of information you can have, uh, say like email addresses. Here, emails matching is uh, generally, if you think through it, quite a strong predictor. Email addresses are fairly unique for people. Um, people, yes, they tend to potentially like move, uh, have multiple email addresses, but if you have people matching on exactly the same email address, that's a pretty good indicator that they're the same person. So yeah, this is the type of problem we're trying to solve. Um, so there's not only this, we've got two records in the same data set, which is obviously very nice. Everyone has the same kind of data structures. Uh, we potentially have two tables with, again, this red table down at the bottom, with a Lucas Smith, a date of birth, uh, and not a city, but a postcode. And really, the problem we're trying to solve is asking ourselves initially, sort of as analysts, as sort of cognizant human beings, like, are these people the same? Not necessarily easy to tell, but then it's like, how do we take the next step to get a computer to make that decision for us so we can do it at scale? So. Say within the realms of the Ministry of Justice, we've got um, lots of databases with up to like tens of millions of records. Uh, on the right hand side here, you have sort of uh, a kind of records in a number of our biggest sort of administrative data sets. The big one sort of at about 40 million rows is our um, civil courts um, databases. So anytime anyone tries to sue someone else, obviously that happens quite often. Um, so yeah, when we've got these tens of millions of records, no single unique identifier across those. Um, and we essentially want to be able to see who is who across all of these different courts. Say, even within civil courts, we want to identify who's coming back and sort of being involved and has many sort of points of contact with the system within that one court and then across those as well. So we want to have a solution that allows us to do that uh, across a variety of data sets so it's flexible enough and then each of these data sets need deduplicating and then linking across those. So it's not necessarily trivial when you have two records. If people, one person, if person A is the same as person B, if our two Lucas Smiths is the same person, one of the really, really big problems with data linkage is scalability. Because say you have a data set of, well, basically the problem grows quadratically, it squares. If you've got 10 rows of uh, people in your data set, you essentially have to do 100 different pairwise comparisons, which is fine when you're dealing with 10 people, but everyone here is generally working with millions and millions of records. So if you have one million, um, a database of one million records, you're potentially doing a trillion comparisons to uh, assess whether these people are the same, which yes, computation is getting cheaper and cheaper over time, but that's just not practical. Um, so on the right hand side here, we have an example of, I think it was four or five years ago, um, some research papers on the best uh, open source uh, packages for doing data linkage. So on the X axis, we have the, as the data sets growing up to about 300,000 records on the very right hand side. On the uh, Y axis, we have the time elapsed and this blue line here showing the, the best option available at the time. So something about 300,000 records is taking nearly 500 minutes. So into like multiple hours of computation to be able to deduplicate. And let's face it, no one has time to do that. Um, 
when we're working at the scale of government uh, applications, that just doesn't work for us. Um, as part of sort of data linkage generally, you will apply this method called blocking, which is applying a few like really simplistic rules um, to try and narrow down that search space of pairwise comparisons that you're going to do. Um, but even then, you're still left with sort of millions, tens of millions of comparisons to deal with. So this is a reflection of the open source space. If you, uh, that sort of five years ago when we started looking at this problem, um, really an MOJ. So we decided to create something ourselves. We know across lots of government organizations, um, hundreds of thousands of pounds, if not millions of pounds are spent getting um, external contractors uh, in or consultancies to provide this sort of data linkage solution. And I don't know about you guys, I'm quite a big advocate for open source. I'd rather that not happen. Um, let's pump public money into a general solution that lots of different people, even within my own organization, we can all use it, but we open sourced it. We want everyone to be able to use it. So it runs much faster and is more accurate than those other free tools we were talking about. Works at a greater scale, so getting into hundreds of millions of records. Uh, um, the biggest record, the biggest linkage we know of to date was in the private sector in the US, where there was a, a linkage of uh, databases of 750 million records. Um, we wanted to have a transparent and explainable methodology. Again, something in the um, commercial offerings didn't, uh, there, there was lots of black box solutions. We are in government in a position where if we sort of say person A is the same as person B and that has negative onward implications, we have to be accountable to that. We need to be able to go back and say, this is exactly why these people were linked together. If it's wrong, fine, Not, no system's perfect, but at least we can see why and improve for next time. Uh, we include sort of formal model specs that can be shared between teams and between departments. Every definition of a Splink model can be spat out into a simple JSON object and passed around and be like, okay, this is exactly the same model you, we can recreate. Not only, um, so yeah, not only is the code for running Splink completely open source, anyone can use it, but also the model specs you can just recreate in any environment. And we are also compatible with a, lot, um, a number of different analytical environments. Obviously, everyone has different infrastructure across lots of places in government, so we wanted to cater to that as well. So I've talked a little about Splink and why we think it's good, or I think it's good, all that sort of stuff, but what actually is it? Uh, at its core, Splink is simply an SQL generation engine. So it generates a load of SQL that emulates this Bluggy Sunter um, Bayesian model that I'll talk a little bit about in a second. And yeah, spits out that SQL so you can throw that at whatever back end you want, um, whether it's something just running in Python like DuckDB, we can do everything in memory just in a notebook, or you want to like really scale up and you uh, throw it into the likes of Spark, or we've done a collaboration uh, earlier this year with Databricks, if anyone works with that. Um, so Splink is now Databricks compatible. Um, so you can run on this sort of big tooling like that, as well as uh, Amazon Athena and Postgres. So yeah, in terms of this Fliggy Center model, what, what are we trying to sort of estimate here within a model? What is this, what does this model, uh, what's it made up of? Essentially, it's kind of like, like any other like machine learning or, or um, analogous type model. We're trying to estimate a few parameters and then we'll spit out some results. The main things we're trying to estimate are called M and U parameters, which is essentially um, say the probability of a given observation if um, two records are a match. For example, um, in our example up at the top, what's the probability that the first name matches the, property, the probability that we have Lucas and Lucas if those records are a match? And then conversely, our U probabilities, what's the probability if we have um, Lucas and Lucas, we have that first name matching when um, those records are not a match. And then what we do is we take the relative size of those, and essentially that gives us the amount of uh, additional evidence that having a match on first name gives to those uh, two records relating to the same person. But yeah, I'm no master of Bayesian statistics, but we'll move on to something that's slightly more intuitive. Cool. 
So on the left-hand side here, we have um, what we call our match width chart. This is essentially this um, single set of bar charts defines an entire Splink model in terms, in terms of all of the evidence you would have for matches. So um, you see this arrow pointing to this bar, um, green bar at about uh, a match weight of six. This sort of match weight is the log of our Bayes factor that we were talking about before, is essentially the amount of evidence that's provided by um, our first name matching. So we have um, across our different um, features, across sort of first name, surname, date of birth, email, city, each of those has a different M and U probability, which then converts into a different, uh, uh, an individual match weight for each type of, um, sorry, for each, um, for each feature having some sort of match. And then we use that, the accumulation of those to decide whether two records do indeed refer to the same person. Um, and we also, we can be sort of pretty flexible with that. We can either say, okay, is it an exact match on a first name or is it not? Or we can see here just in this first name, we have a third bar in the middle uh, where we can input some sort of fuzzy matching logic. We have a Levenstein there, which is just some sort of um, switches of characters. And Splink is fully configurable with uh, half a dozen different fuzzy matching options within, um, built in natively. Um, basically, depending on whatever type of data you're working with, you can generally find something uh, to fuzzy match, whether that's purely string matching like Levenstein's or Jarrow Winkler's. You can do sort of date differences for um, dates and various other bits and bobs. So that was a definition of our entire model. Let's go back to our real world, world example of two pairwise records. So on the bottom here, we have our Lucas and Lucas again. And this waterfall, uh, this is called our, what we call the waterfall chart, shows the incremental um, evidence for two records being a match, um, which is essentially an application of the match weights charts we just showed before. So if I jump across to this side, we have a uh, basically our prior probability that two records are a match, essentially the y-intercept of a standard regression. And for e each of these bars, here is representing some of the features and the evidence um, that is provided by those. So we go across sequentially, we have first name, we know we have Lucas and Lucas, so yeah, that's quite a big increase in um, probability that they're the same. We have surname is also quite a big one. Uh, date of birth didn't match, so it's slightly negative. City didn't match, again, slightly negative. And then email, we said, um, is sort of intuitively quite a strong predictor because people um, don't tend to share email addresses. So that's sort of quite a lot of positive evidence. One thing I think is worth pointing out uh, at this point, we have beside our sort of first name and surname, we have these sort of TF underscore adjustments. So that's um, what we call term frequency adjustments. So basically looking across all of the possible names that people can have, how common are they? And because that obviously has a massive impact on how, uh, how much um, that proves that these two people could be a match. So for example, taking Lucas uh, within our, this is generated from within the data sets you provided. Um, Lucas is quite an uncommon first name. So a match on Lucas adds more evidence for these two, these two records referring to the same person. So we've got an extra green bar going up. Conversely, surnames, obviously in the UK, Smith is a fairly common surname. Um, so yes, it's a match, but we sort of counterbalance that weight because Smith is such a, uh, such a common surname. It doesn't give us as much evidence that these two people are the same person. So on the very right hand side, we have our final match score. Uh, it says sort of match weight of 13 point something, which is kind of on the left hand axis, but that also correlates to, uh, can be converted into a probability, which is reflected on the very right hand side. At its um, pretty much what's well, 99.999 whatever percent based on our model. Uh, but that sort of tra uh, tracks with what we would have expected uh, yeah. just look eyeballing those two records. So in terms of, yeah, we in Splink think having sort of a visual output for explaining things is really important, really useful, but just to give a sort of an idea of if you were working with Splink, the type of output you would get. 
everything that's come in those charts um, comes from this kind of base table that we generate. Um, so you have sort of your match weights. Each of these records here is a pairwise comparison. So for uh, record A and record B, what is the match weight between them? What's the uh, resulting M probability? Uh, what are the first names, surnames, blah, 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 all your evidence there. So um, if you're actually working with that in, say, a production system and wanted to be able to cluster certain records together to resolve your, um, say, you're working with NHS numbers and you want to be able to say that these two NHS numbers actually resolve onto the same person, that's where you'll start. That's where you'll start making those decisions. Um, I'm not 100% sure how much time I've spoken for, but I think we'll probably call it a day there. If there I don't know if there are any questions, but thank you very much for listening to me waffle on. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, you've generated quite a bit of interest in the Slack channel and there's a few questions. Yeah, yeah. So sure. I'll pick a few of them. Apologies if it's not very um, systematic. Um, would something like a, a consistent national ID number or identifier help with this sort of process? Oh yeah, if we had that, we wouldn't have had to bother with this. This is like, this, this is entirely because if we had some sort of national ID numbers, that's what we're trying to recreate. It's we're trying to recreate um, proper unique identifiers. I guess in the health space, NHS numbers, pretty good compared to lots of IDs across government. And e But even if we had that, there would be the decades of history without having those like ID numbers that you would have to go and sort of retrofit um, going forward. Uh, so does uh, Splink work on any type of record, not just records of people's information? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, maybe I should have said that. Um, yeah, Splink is fully configurable. Whatever type of data you want to throw at it, uh, work away. We have some examples, say, in our documentation about um, financial transactions. I think it was Barclays in India were wanting to sort of deduplicate data coming from one system to another when there was um, um, some like, like charges and currency conversions, so things didn't necessarily match up, so having some sort of fuzzy matching, they kind of did um, using Splink. Also know of the National Air Traffic Control Service, NATS, have started using Splink to deduplicate planes, because apparently planes don't have a unique ID, which I find utterly terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not the only one. Um, uh, just two more questions, um, and then I think we're probably at time. Um, is there anything that could be done to consider near misses of date of birth? Um, so I guess that, again, kind of comes down to the kind of fuzzy matching capability I was talking about. So within Splink, yeah, you, um, we tend to do a simple like Levenstein, so a simple like character swap for um, human error, essentially human transcription errors uh, to as one of our levels and then also do some sort of date difference because um, say we're talking in the prison population to figure out if two prisoners are the same person, it's, yeah, you can, if they have an exact match, that's obviously great, but obviously saying, even saying like they're within 10 years of each other, that like say a prison officer being like, could eyeball them and is like, hold on, you're like 40 years different. <laughs> they're obviously not, obviously not the same person. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of flex you can build in. Okay, thanks. Uh, and last question. Um, does Splink assume that there is always a record to match on, or can it account for missing records in data? Um, I don't think it necessarily assumes that there's going to be a record to match to. It simply just takes two candidate pairs and gives you like, a probability spat out that they are the same. If there's nothing that hits whatever sort of threshold that you want uh, to use um, for linkage, it'll return nothing and you kind of assume that's just one individual record. Fantastic, okay. thank you so much. Great, thanks. And let's say thanks uh, once again to all of our speakers this afternoon uh, and I'll hand over to Mr. Beebe. Thanks. Um, yes, hello everyone. Um, so I've got a very generous 20 minute slot. I'm not gonna use the whole 20 minute slot, you'd be pleased to hear. There is a lot of cake on the tables though. So if you wanna use some of this 20 minutes to eat the cake, then that would be uh, a good thing to do. Um, so I'm just gonna just offer a few closing thoughts. As I say, I won't go on too long about it. Um, the first thing that I wanna say, I probably already said this 
lots of times. I apologize if you heard me say it before. Um, I, I'm just, I don't know, I haven't checked properly. I'm pretty sure this is the biggest NHSR conference ever. If you think this isn't the biggest NHSR conference ever, put your hand up. Right, motion carries. Um, and that's really awesome because, of course, it's really awesome, but also um, because of Hacker. So when, when the Health and Care Analytics Conference in July, um, I think a lot of people thought we didn't really need an NHSR conference anymore, and I didn't think that at all. Um, I thought they could, uh, you know, feed off each other, be friends, be complementary, whatever, whatever the word is. Um, and I think we've, we've certainly proved that today. So that's really exciting. Um, the Young Conference has been absolutely amazing. Um, whenever you do anything like that, you don't really know what's going to happen. We didn't know whether we were going to empty this room and then feel bad. We didn't know whether the Oncom was going to be empty and feel bad. There were, it felt like everything that could happen would be bad. Um, but actually, it was really, really, really amazing. At, at one point, there was three unconferences going on at the same time just because they just wouldn't stop having an unconference um, because they were just really into what they were doing. Um, but it's been really lively and busy in here and everything. There's been loads of questions. Um, yeah, so it's just been, it's been really phenomenal. Um, there's loads of new people as well. Um, I've met some new people while I've been here, which is really cool. Um, and um, uh, there is, I'm gonna, sorry, I'll, I'll come to that later. Um, right, so just, I wanted to mention something that Mohammed put in the Slack. Mohammed's not here anymore. He was here a little bit earlier on today. Um, so Mohammed has um, given us a call to action on the Slack. I can't remember what channel it's in, but it's somewhere in there. Um, he's basically asking you all to do something for the community, uh, which I think is a really great idea. NHSR community has given a lot to me and I think has given a lot to some of the people in this room. Some of you might be thinking, I don't care about NHSR community, that's totally fine. But if NHSR community has given something to you, then it can be just a tweet that says we're great, or it can be very small, uh, or it can be massive. It could be like a repo or, you know, or a blog post, which is medium size, whatever. Um, I think, um, yes, if you do feel that way, then, then, uh, then please um, do 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 that. Um, I've crowdsourced the rest of my talk in a truly open source fashion. Uh, Tom was saying to me, like, you're not going to have anything to say later, are you, Chris? In, in an attempt to kind of um, psych me out. Um, and then, helpfully, um, him and uh, Ewan gave me some ideas about what I was going to say, so I've stolen the rest of it. Uh, it's MIT licensed. Um, so I'm nicking Pavel's idea. I think Pavel's gone as well, actually, now. I think he's gone to catch a train. Um, his three, three stars and a wish... Um, I think that's really good. So I'm going to give you my three stars and a wish now. It's supposed to be, I think I used to go to like academic conferences years ago when I was doing my PhD. And at the end of those conferences, someone very sort of serious and austere would stand up and give really serious points about the direction of travel. And I feel this weird thing that I'm going to have to do that, but I'm not going to, because I just don't want to. So I'm just going to say what I want. Um, I thought the scaling on conference was really um, well attended and really excited. Uh, excited? Exciting. Um, I think that's something that we've talked about on and off for such a long time, and I think there's been a lot of false starts with, oh, we're going to have all this amazing data science in the public, and it's going to be, there's been a lot of hype and a lot of hope, and it hasn't always come to fruition, but we, I really think we're building and building and building to that, and I think we should definitely hold on to that idea. I get a little bit cynical occasionally, to be honest. Uh, this isn't inspiring at all, is it? Um, but yes, I think we should hold on to that dream, and I think we can, and... Um, I think there were a lot of people in that room with a decent amount of ability, actually, to make it happen, even. So it's great that they're in that conversation. So that's my first star. Um, my next star is just all the random talks we had. Running a single track, running a conference is really hard. Um, not for me, I'm not complaining, but I mean everyone else. Um, and a single track conference is hard because, like at the other conference uh, earlier in the year, there were loads of people that dropped out, but it didn't matter because there was loads of tracks. Each side, well, it doesn't matter. They just time went for coffee early. But we try. I've tried to, and people have said to me several times uh, in the last couple of days, just don't worry about it, Chris. Just we won't have anything there. But I want to respect your time. That's why I've tried to put these things on. And some of them, you might think, well, it didn't respect my time. It was rubbish. Um, but we're making a sincere effort to respect your time, to respect the taxpayer's money that pays for your time, and to respect your manager saying, yes, you can go to the NHSR conference, and there's not a bit where you just shuffle around for 10 minutes because someone's dropped out. Um, so we've had one talk, I think, that they had three days' notice for. They had one talk that they had, like, three hours' notice for, and they had one talk that was just basically just made up on the spot um, with varying results. Um, but that's very NHSR. It's very sort of warts and all you know, have a go. I think that's, that's part of the spirit of it. So I love that the conference kind of 
It's, um, what's that? There's a really clever word for this, isn't there? You know when something, art imitating life type thing, I can't think what it is. It's one of them anyway. Um, so that's the second star. Um, and the last one is um, just, I met someone, uh, I think, yes, yesterday, and they've just joined the NHS. They've been working in the NHS for like three years. I think they've got, yeah, they've gone as well, actually. Um, so I could just make you the whole story up, but no, it's true. Um, and they've joined partly because of the conference. So I met them at Earl last year. We had a nice chat, and then they came to this conference last year, and we had a nice chat here, and they were very impressed. And now, partly because of the conference, they've joined the NHS. So the NHSR conference has like, grabbed someone who's really interested and talented in what we're doing and pulled them in. And that's, you know, I think that that's worth quite a lot just on its own, isn't it? So um, I think this conference is really, really, really valuable. Um, and I think that's a really good example. So that's my third star. Um, and my wish is... Um, so I've closed the NHSR conference quite a few times now, I think, and I do love it. Um, and I'm going to say the quiet part out loud because I just can't help it for some reason. It's one of my um, character flaws. I just, um, I will just, if you ask my opinion, you know when people ring you up and do a market survey, I love that. I love being asked my opinion. And I'm like, yeah, great. I want to talk about broadband, you know, because I'm just like that. I like to give my opinion. Um, so I love closing the NHSR conference. It's great. And I will do it forever if I'm allowed to. Um, but my big wish is that I do not close the NHSR conference next year. I want to actually say, I feel like I've said way too much at this conference, actually. And that's my big wish. And that's not anybody's fault except mine. Uh, and it's partly related to what I was saying yesterday. I really want to, like, really throw the net out wide and grab people in. Because, of course, I've gone in, I'm in the tent now. Years ago, when I joined NHSR, I would come to NHSR as an outsider and say, no, this is what I think, this is what NHSR is. Oh, what about that? You know, I would, I would be, like, picking holes in it and, and arguing but I'm sort of inside the tent now, so I don't feel like I can really do that role. So I want to develop somebody in the community who'll tell us that we've done it all wrong and say, oh, you should be doing this, what are you doing? And then and, um, that'll be the person to close the conference. It's like, a, like, a, like an annoying, this is not selling the role, is it? But you know, like someone who, can, who's someone who, will, who will tell us to, you know, the way forward. Um, so that's my wish. Um, that's the... That's the sort of boringy um, kind of uh, conference summary bit done. So now all that remains to do is to thank everybody that's been involved. Um, so as I say, I mean, honestly, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's gone really, really, really well. It's very, very, very smooth. Um, the talks have been amazing. The Slack, I honestly just can't cope up. I've actually, to be honest, given up trying to keep up with the Slack. I think I'm just going to read it when I get home. Um, so it's been a really amazing conference. Um, so I want to thank everyone who spoke. Um, I want to thank, obviously, all the people who came. I don't really want to name too many people because then I feel like I have to name everybody, but I'm going to name Pavel and Mary because um, I think, Pavel, well, yeah, Mary's still here, but Pavel's gone, unfortunately, because the encore was really great. And they didn't have to do that, and it was totally, they were stepping completely into the unknown. We had no idea what was going to happen. It could have been a horrible disaster. And it kind of felt like it was going to be a horrible disaster when we got here and found that you had to, like, go into the bowels of hell and then go up here. And, um, but actually, everyone really... The thing is, everybody really wants to make it work. I think that's the thing about NHSR conference, is when you go to some conferences, everyone's standing around with the arm phone going, oh, the coffee's cold. You know, like, they don't... But here, people are... We're trying to have a good conference together, aren't we? Because we are a community. And I've said this so many times that even I'm bored of hearing it. I want you to come and tell me it. But we are. We're all trying to have a good conference that we have. Um, so that's really awesome. Um, I want to thank all the AV people because the AV has been absolutely spot on as it is every single year. Yes, let's have a round of applause for the AV people. Good point. <laughs> See, now it makes me feel bad I didn't get a round of applause for Paolo and Mary. It's just so, I can't navigate this. It's re I'm no, with no slides either, it's really difficult. Anyway, everyone's amazing. Um, so that's that. I am going to thank all the kind of people, all the helping people, the people in my data science team. I've got some sort of honorary members of the data science team that I'm trying to kind of hook in and they've helped as well. Um, once you're in, you can never leave. That's, my, that's, my, that's the tagline on the, over the door. Um, so I want to thank them. Basically, all I've done for the last two days is just wander around in a bit of a stage of confusion, occasionally get on the stage and then just lose my bits of paper. So the NHS, so not only have they done all the stuff that makes the conference work, which is obviously really important, but they've also kept me alive and made me know like what time it is and what's going next. So, I mean, that's really awesome that they could do both at the same time. Um, after saying that, I wasn't going to name anybody, except I already did name two people. I'm going to name one more person, which is make, make of that what you will. I think I'm like, she might get angry if I name her, though. I shouldn't really like the spotlight. Anyway, I'm just going to say her name, but I'm not going to point at her or make a stand up or anything like that. Her name is Kaylee. Many of you have communicated with her on email. She has worked absolutely 
tirelessly for months on this, and if she hadn't done really more than she was supposed to, none of you would be sitting here. So I definitely want a big round of applause for Kayla, please. And just on the subject of Kelly, I do want to say one other thing, actually, which is that I think the thing that's really amazing about what's gone on here is that Kaylee is part of the community. So she's not a data scientist. She doesn't know how to write R. She doesn't know. But she, but she is. Um, I mean, she hasn't even been with us that long. But um, I think it says something really special about our community. And I think it says something really special about Kaylee that we have um, totally uh, accepted her as one of our own, as, a, as an honorary kind of, uh, as a data scientist. That's really, really awesome. Um, so I wanted to mention that. I have bought you a wonderful present, Kaylee. I bought it quite a long time ago in a very thoughtful way, and then I forgot it, so it's not here, but I wouldn't get you on the stage to give it to you anyway, because you get angry, because you don't want to be on the stage, but I have got you something nice, and I will uh, give that to you in due course. Um, and the last thing I want to do is, of course, I want to thank the other thing that is necessary for this conference to happen, which is all our amazing sponsors, which I'm pretty sure are behind me. Yes, there they are. Um, so the Health Foundation, the Health Foundation, without the Health Foundation, NHS would not exist at all. So the Health Foundation, I mean, I love them anyway, but they, uh, they are really, really key part of uh, NHSR. So I want to thank the Health Foundation. I also want to thank um, Jumping Rivers, an operational research society. I think then, yeah, they're not here. Uh, they've been here all day. Um, and also, I want to thank NHS England. So they've all given us some support there. Um, and I think that is all my thanks. I don't think I've forgotten to write anyone down. No, that's it. So I shall leave it there. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm not going to recap the whole thing because it get boring. We are thinking very seriously about how to run this conference, where, how, for whom, who, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but we will be back with something awesome that data scientists want to come to next year, and somebody else is going to stand at the front and tell you how great it is. So I'll see you all next year. Thank you. <clears throat>